Hey friends, we're launching Visual Studio 2019 today and we wanted to try something different. Sure, there's going to be demos and code and lots of fun, but I think it's easy in today's internet to forget about people. And I drove up from Portland for this event to show you that there's hundreds of folks here in Washington and working remotely who are excited about making software for and with you. So I thought, why don't we talk to them? But first, a few notes about what's happening today. We're going to have live stream sessions after the keynote. There's a virtual attendee party on Twitch and there's on-demand sessions that are actually available right now. I also want you to go to Twitch because there's going to be all-day interactions with the program managers and the programmers that built Visual Studio 2019. Remember that Visual Studio 2019 and VS 2019 for Mac is now available for download at visualstudio.com. Now, if you're using Visual Studio today, you're probably using one of the many extensions available. Our amazing extension partners have already updated over a thousand extensions to be compatible with 2019, and you can get those in the marketplace. We're also releasing Visual Studio Live Share today, which is integrated with Visual Studio 2019 and can also be used in Visual Studio Code. We're going to chat about Live Share a little bit later. Also, DevOps is an important part of the developer lifecycle, and Azure DevOps Server 2019 is generally available as of March 5th. We're going to cover Azure DevOps and GitHub in more detail, both in this keynote and during the live stream after. Now, let's go and find some of the people that made all this possible. And I also want you to keep an eye out for some of the little gems and Easter eggs that we've hidden in this video. And let us know online using the hashtag VS2019 if you find them. Hey, friends. Hey, Scott. How are Welcome. you? Welcome. Uh, this is a great room, but it's a beautiful day outside. So if you don't mind, we could have our meeting on the deck. Sure. Right. Why not? Yeah. Get some chairs. Yeah, grab some chairs. Oh. Good. I'm glad we got such good weather. Yeah, it is gorgeous. It's better to be outside than to be in a, a conference room, even a nice conference room like the Treehouse. For sure. So, Julia, you're in charge of all of DevDiv, but have, you've worked here for a while. You've had basically every job in the developer division, haven't you? I sure did. And we've got a little gift for you here. Did the you? <laughs> worst name Microsoft product ever. <laughs> did, you, did you work on this? I sure did. It's very useful. Yeah? Visual Basic for the web. Really? It says you can make dynamic applications. It's quite nice. It is. <laughs> Are we still using some of your code? I think it is in there, indeed. <laughs> That's awesome. It's we're on also Visual <laughs> Studio, right? Because we're now doing Visual Studio 2019. That's 22 years ago. That's right. And uh, that's the first version of Visual Studio ever. So in uh, two years ago, we celebrate 20 years of Visual Studio. That's fantastic. Um, and it's kind of, uh, I have uh, something to do with every single version of Visual Studio. Yeah. So um, if you ever had any problem with it, I have something to be blamed for. <laughs> <laughs> I also heard that it was important that everyone be able to develop. There was a huge push for accessibility. You want to make sure that it works for everyone, no matter what language that they speak. Having everyone to be able to be a developer was a priority as well. So we're looking at how we can make developers more productive. We're looking at developers sitting in every corner of the world mm. and their feedback. We also have 23% of our team located outside of Redmond. So yeah. that's another very important source of information. There's a huge amount of people that are remote, myself included. I would have guessed it was single digits, but it's over almost 25% of that's people right. who are remote. And now we get to use cool things like live share to go and collaborate. Now, Amanda, you own you hear the term, yeah, I always find own. that's a funny term. Why do we say that at Microsoft? You own know. Visual Studio I don't know. Tooling. It's always been that way, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. <laughs> yeah. So you, I, own, I, yeah. you own that, right? <laughs> yeah, I work on Visual Studio. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're, so, you're so modest. Uh, I work on Visual Studio. Yeah. But you, you, you own that. So when that means ownership, that means the shipping, the getting it out the door, the making sure that it's focused on the right things, that it's yeah, doing the right thing. Yeah, I mean, basically my job is to make sure that we ship the right product at the right time. But I, I am told from people who know both of you that, that you, still, you still somehow find time to code. There's times when you say, hey, this code doesn't do the way thing I want it to do. And I've also heard people say when talking about you, Julia, that uh, 
um, why did, how did she know that? And someone says, oh, well, she had your job before you. <laughs> you're like, well, Julie was the engineering manager for that, or she was responsible for this. Like, you both had basically every job as you've worked up to the places that, you, that you're at. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've been in the developer division at Microsoft since 2001. Yeah. So uh, almost 18 years, I guess, and I've worked on pretty much every every product at Microsoft, but from the developer lens. So, mm. you know, I've worked on Xbox at some point, and SQL, and Azure, and Office, pretty much everything. And to your point earlier around, do I actually still get to code? Yes, I actually do. <laughs> um, it doesn't happen as often as I like it to, um, but, but pretty much everybody on my team, and we're the, the PM team, so the, mm -hmm. the product manager team, everybody on my team codes. And we have to, because our customers are developers. And so for us to actually evaluate the product, we have to do it. It's surprising to see how many people are writing documentation. Uh, someone was telling me that they saw some check-ins from Scott Guthrie, that he may have been up late at night doing some <laughs> documentation check-in. We yeah. have to build a system to make it really easy. So one of the things we did is that we rebuilt a documentation engineering system mm -hmm. to be based on GitHub. And so, and then, and then there's repos out there for every single language that we support, and people can just do a pull request if they find any issues mm -hmm. with our documentation. And we really encourage everyone to you know, work and help improve the documentation that our customer actually in the end read. That's interesting that you bring that up because there's a series of systems that are making all the loops. We talk about the developer inner loop and yep. the outer loop. Mm -hmm. All these loops are being tightened up whether it be how we make software, how quickly we ship software, the quality mm -hmm. bars, all mm -hmm. of the things. Everything's continuous integration deployment. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I think that the way we think about it is that even though people think about Visual Studio as a client software, you know, uh, that installs on your machine. But internally, we really treat it very much as a service. Hmm. We're continuously improving it. We're continuously looking at the you know, feedback customers give us in every way that they do. Uh, and then our goal is to make the product better and better, you know, every day. That's pretty cool. And I've been using, but in the past, you know, I, I would use like Skype or Teams, and I would send a screenshot, like a moving picture of my Visual Studio, but uh, that was really inefficient, especially when I was tethering my phone or I was overseas, I was really having a challenge. Uh, I never would have seen live share coming though. Like I didn't know I needed it, but then I needed it. Yeah, yeah, actually, so we did a lot of interviews over probably two or three different years of particularly focusing on development teams that are focused on time to market as their top concern when they choose their tools and their processes. And what we found was that a lot of teams were really struggling with collaboration. Hmm. And they were especially struggling with collaboration with, with remote employees. And you know their, their definition of who was a remote employee was actually pretty uh, uh, static. You know, it was even to the point that some people didn't want to hire any more engineers on their team, even though they had business demand, mm. because dealing with somebody who actually was physically in a separate room, even if it was down the hall, was too much cost. It was clear that we had to do something that was pre-check-in time, because you know the check-in time is basically too late. Yeah. At that point, you you already have a pretty high cost to be able to get. Uh, review feedback and then you end up with iteration cycles where you have to kind of hand it off. It's as efficient as like email, yeah, yeah. right? Um, but but that's really where LiveShare came from. We mm -hmm. kind of figured out if we could actually enable collaboration um, ahead of the check-in and make it possible for you to collaborate in real time, mm -hmm. that that would, that would be a lot more productive. You know, we also have situations where people have different accessibility needs, and so they mm -hmm. might have different kinds of settings on their developer desktop, like mm -hmm. they use Narrator, or you know, they might use a high contrast mode, which might make it very, very uncomfortable for you to actually share my screen, yeah. right? Um, but with LiveShare, you can actually connect into my environment. You don't have to do anything to get your dev box to be set up other than have Visual Studio or VS Code on your machine. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see my environment. You could even execute commands in the terminal if I give you that access. Now, as you know, I'm a C Sharp fan. I'm all about C Sharp. I love C Sharp. But I'm noticing, then I think Microsoft is noticing, that hybrid solutions, multi-polyglot solutions mm -hmm. are the, the the word of the day. Not everyone is going to use just .NET. Visual Studio suddenly supports basically everything. Was that a, was that a conscious decision that it would support all of these languages? We want to be want to build the best tool to support any customer, no matter what kind of application or service they want to develop on any operating system. Mm -hmm. So that is a core pivot of what we're doing from a strategy perspective. Now you see us really follow that up with our investment in 
you know, Visual Studio Code, which is obviously open source and cross-platform. We made .NET open source and cross-platform. And that become a common theme yeah. in how we do everything. I, I, I had a moment where I was literally in Visual Studio on Windows in C++ doing remote debugging to Linux. Mm -hmm. And it just worked. It was a joy. And I was in the middle of doing it. And before I did, I'm doing remote debugging in Visual Studio That's on Linux. Right. And it's just working just great. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't feel like I was doing something I shouldn't have been. Yeah, I mean that was uh, if I if I think back to 2001 when I came to Microsoft for the first time and used Visual Studio for the first time because the first version was out then mm -hmm. uh, in the .NET era, and uh, you know I had come from an Emacs Unix background in college, I had. I experienced IntelliSense for the first time. It's this magical thing, yeah. right? And your productivity uh, from you know kind of an Emacs environment into a Visual Studio environment where you have this assisted development experience is pretty dramatic. Um, so I still remember that moment. But but you know now thinking back on where Visual Studio was in that era and where it is today, it's. We, we continue to create more and more of those magical moments. I, I met, I was meeting with some kids at a college recently and they told me that their professor was forcing them to use Notepad without IntelliSense because they thought IntelliSense would rot your brain. Right. And I didn't have the heart to tell them that IntelliCode was going to completely change the way that they wrote software. Now we've got AI assisted IntelliSense that's mm -hmm. coming, IntelliCode that people can see with Visual Studio 2019. I'm assuming, though, that that's just the beginning of what we could do with AI from a programming yeah, perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, AI could really impact the entire software development life cycle, um, from everything to, you know, obviously completing your 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 statements, mm -hmm. right? And we will get to the point where we can not just complete, you know, what is the next IntelliSense thing completion that you're going to pick, but actually the entire parameter. I mean, the entire line of code that you're writing, or even potentially an entire code snippet. Wow. Um, but not just that. Finding code defects, for example, you know we've found classes of issues that AI can uncover that your your classic static analysis uh, really could never discover before. Mm -hmm. um, but we will then be able to take it further into you know things like testing or um, encouraging you to follow certain practices in terms of you know who you seek code reviews from. So this is really just the beginning. Right. That's exciting. So yeah. this is just the beginning of AI and what it could mean for a Visual Studio developer. Yeah, and I think the goal, just like with IntelliSense, is you know we should really be focused on making sure that every keystroke that you write is more efficient, right? Mm. We really want to make sure that you're writing the code that only you can write, right? And so if there's anything that we can we can automate in the system that will actually allow you to become more productive and more expressive, mm. then that's the kinds of things that we. Right. So on. you add value where you can add value, and the boring parts. Yeah, I mean, it's bit. really, we add value where the machine can add value, right? Mm. And so if the machine in the cloud can add value and make you more productive as a developer, then that, that seems like goodness. You can actually write more code for your business. How did you decide what is going to be in Visual Studio 2019? Like, what are the principles and the priorities and the scope of this is this release and this is that release? Well, for VS 2019, we really plan on four core themes. The first one is performance. Making sure our product is faster and faster with each release is very important to us, to our customers. Mm -hmm. The second one is a look at big industry trend. How do we make sure customers are developing cloud native applications in containers in easy way? Mm -hmm. That kind of common theme. The third thing we'll look on is really helping with a team collaboration and identifying issues as early as possible. And the fourth one we really look at are a bunch of delighter features across the product where people find value with the upgrade. Mm. But how do you know what she's saying is correct and the customers really <laughs> want that? Well, I mean, for every single one of these areas, mm -hmm. we actually go through an iterative process where we identify who are the potential customers for that particular feature set, mm -hmm. and we we bring them into labs or do call downs with them and interview mm -hmm. them. Um, and those lab those lab studies are where people can actually play with early prototypes of the product in an environment where we can actually watch how successful they are with the product. So I would definitely encourage you to go check out the UX lab. So I can go find real customers working on future versions of Visual Studio in a lab. So yes. I've had experiences with companies like Microsoft or maybe Microsoft in the in the long distance past where Microsoft was there to like validate assumptions and push 
agendas. Yeah. But you didn't even start with that. You were immediately like, let's go and meet a customer and let them lead the discussion. Yeah, I like to use the term customer-led inquiry because um, it's the idea that that we don't know when we first start that conversation where it's going to lead to, mm. right? And so we should be open to the idea that it'll lead to some places that we didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And if we can uncover a more urgent problem that the customer has that we could address, then that's much more valuable than getting validation that the idea that we thought uh, was, was the biggest problem to solve uh, is actually what we need to go solve. When we're bringing new people in, though, I've noticed that in the past it has taken like months and months to ramp people up. You can't really just hire someone and have them sit around for six months. You really want to onboard them. Like, how, how are you bring people onto the team in an organized fashion and get them both into the culture and into the tooling as quickly as possible? Yeah, I mean, actually, one of the things that we've instituted in the last couple of years is this notion of a dev div boot camp. So if you're a new employee, either you know you're on another team and you join our team, or if you're brand new to Microsoft entirely, then you'll spend basically two weeks uh, getting kind of a boot camp <laughs> into what it's like to work in DevDiv. How do you develop a sense of shared culture at, in DevDiv so that everyone is all feeling the same about the product and feeling the same about each other? Well, for culture, one of the key things we learned is that we really need to have shared goals, shared languages, and make sure we're changing our actions to actually embrace the new culture values. So for us, customer obsession is a core key value that we're embracing. So we're looking at how we're developing our product in a different way to really embrace that particular value. It seems like there's been a real focus on, on data. I've seen more dashboards, there's TVs, and, and everywhere I turn, there's a dashboard showing the build and the burn down chart, all these kind of things. Are, are you really pushing to be data driven in your decisions? Absolutely, not only from a developer internal engineering process perspective, but most, more importantly, we want to look at data that our customer are giving us, their particular feedbacks, you know, our crash rate, reliability in the wild, not only in the engineering internal environment. Those are critical data points to help us understand what is the customer experience with our product while they're using it every day. Mm -hmm. And I was told that every release has to be better than the last release. Absolutely. That's like an important goal. That's a very important metric that we track every day. And then we have weekly meetings that we actually look at this metric in terms of is customers you know, success in acquiring a product, installing a product, updating a product better today than last week. Is customers you know, experience with reliability and crashes and performance better you know, this week than last week? And then how are we responding to the customer feedback they have provided? Well, that's super cool. Uh, but now I want to know who to go and visit. Who should I talk to first about Visual Studio? Well, I mean, in some ways, you could really go to Building 18 and just talk to anybody who's there, and yeah. they could talk about what's going on with Visual Studio. Um, but I'd also suggest that you go to the UX lab as well and see kind of what we're studying today. OK, cool. I'm going to yeah. go wander around Building 18. I'll check out the UX lab, and I'll try to find some uh, more cool people that are working on Visual Studio 19. Awesome. Thanks for talking to me. Thank you, Scott. Have fun Building 18. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. It was fun. Hey, Scott, want to play? I don't really play Smash that much. Competitively. Oh, Ready hey, for Visual everybody. Studio 2019. Dude, it's going to be great. Ooh, it's going to be awesome. Pie. Hey, Scott. Ooh, I want to see a raspberry pie. Well, we've got Hi, one right everybody. here. Awesome. Right. Talk about Visual Studio 2019. Let's do it. Yay! Yeah. Yay! I'm very happy to be here. I just came over from the treehouse. I saw Amanda and I saw Julia, and she said that you all are the folks to talk to to show me some of the cool stuff in Visual Studio. Why don't we start with you, Pratik? Awesome. So I, I remember when I started up Visual Studio 2019, I was surprised how fast it started. It went right to the start window. Yeah, so this is it's a small modal UI, and it starts really fast, faster than actual the whole Visual Studio IDE starts. And um, what happens is when it loads, it also asynchronously loads your most recently used projects. So this is the same recently used projects list that you had in VS 2017. So all of your pinned items, your solutions, folders, remote repositories, all show up in this recently projects list for you to access really fast with a single click and then get to your code really fast too. 
So the whole point is to get me to my code as fast as possible, and I've mm -hmm. got it, I've pinned the ones that matter the most to me. Mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. And That's the cool. thing that I find the most cool, though, is I click on clone or check out code, so I double click, click on clone, paste, Enter and then I've just brought something down from GitHub or wherever. Right, right. If you have the URL, that's awesome. You can just paste in your URL and then hit Enter and then it clones the code. If you don't, if you don't remember the URL or you don't want to go to the web to get it, you could also sign into your GitHub or Azure repos accounts, mm -hmm. and then you can see a list of all the repos that you or your organization has, and then that you can just search for or click on and then clone it down as well without the URL. Very cool. So autocomplete for my repos in the cloud, and then boom, I'm there. Yep. Awesome. Exactly. So when I create a new project, this is new. Like this is like a tagged new version of file new project. Right. Yeah. We totally revamped the uh, create new project process. Instead of a single window that has a tree view, um, that w has been a little overwhelming to some of our um, users, mm -hmm. we decided to simplify it and make it a search-based view. Um, so you can really easily and quickly search for the types of templates that you're looking for. And you can, if you don't remember exactly what you're searching for, um, you can use the filters. So there's language, platform, and project type drop down and you can filter by them and get a smaller list and like narrow it down there and then you search maybe to even filter in further. So, um, click on the template that you want, that's one decision, then we move you to the next decision which is configuring your project. And that um, you enter in your name, location, and then you hit go and you have your project created. I love that when I was scrolling around in the window here and looking for what I wanted, it got the impression that maybe I wasn't finding what I wanted and tried to offer, like, are you finding what you need? Are you, uh -huh. are, are you, are you able to get what you want here? It's a much much smarter window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we were. That was what we were trying to do. One of the things that I was impressed with was how many choices there are when you pull down platform mm -hmm. or when you pull down project type. Mm -hmm. It's just so weird to be in Visual Studio 2019 and see Linux and Android and TVOS. Da, 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 mm -hmm. da, da. All yeah. these things are tagged. Yeah, and Visual Studio has all of those things to offer. So even if you haven't installed them and you haven't used them, say you're a C++ developer and you're doing C++ and you don't know, and that Visual Studio does Python development as well, but this this thing offers it to you. This tool offers. Um, um, support for Python as well, and you can quickly say, oh wait, I don't have any templates for Python, let me install them, and then it installs it for you, takes you to the installer, installs them, and then you get Python templates as well, and you can get started with Python. Very cool, so I see all the things that I could potentially build, and mm -hmm. if I don't have that workload, mm -hmm. it'll go and get it for me. Exactly, yeah. That's hot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> On the left-hand side here, what does it say, recent project templates? What's going on there? Yeah, so um, whenever you create a project, it is a long list of templates. And so whenever you create a project, um, the templates that you use most often and most frequently stay on the left side. So if you want to quickly access, like, hey, I always create console apps, I always create class libraries, you can easily go to the left and just click on a template from there and get started with that instead of going through the main list. That's cool. There's a nice symmetry between the new start window and the new create new project window because on that left-hand side, it's the stuff I do regularly. Regular, your recent stuff's on the left, yep. Yeah, and that was the start window in Visual Studio 2019. That's very cool. So I love the start window in Visual Studio 2019 as well. I love how easy it is to get started with a new Git repository from either Azure repos or from GitHub. I can uh, I can just get started. I can pull down a repository without you know starting up Visual Studio. I can do it right from the beginning. And these URLs are like just kind of baked into my muscle memory, so I just type them out. But yeah, I can browse them as well. It's really interesting how Git is getting baked into our lives and into our workflows and into the product right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I can stay in Visual Studio 2019 and manage my pull requests. Um, and Julia mentioned actually at the Treehouse that she wants to bake quality in and they want to catch things you know, before the commit. But then once the commit has happened, they want to make sure the quality gets through the entire process. Oh, absolutely. I think that's critical. So you know, um, I can, of course, you know, write some code and run some tests inside VS 2019. But I also want to catch that as soon as somebody opens a pull request. So if I have a project on GitHub, mm -hmm. like an open source project, and I want to take contributions, I want to make sure that their code is good. I want to make sure it builds, and I want to make sure the tests pass. So I want continuous integration for my GitHub projects, for my Azure repos projects. And I use Azure Pipelines for that. So Azure Pipelines has uh, .NET Core 3 ready to go. We've got hosted build agents in the cloud. So we've got Mac, we've got Windows, and we've got Linux. All of them are running the new .NET Core 3, the latest preview. Uh, and it's ready to go. So I can actually do my continuous integration right there. So we talked about how a Git is getting incorporated into our lives and also being remote and remote collaboration is incorporated into our lives. You're actually uh, remotely collaborating with John right now. John? 
Yeah, I'm working with my colleague Jonathan, and he's actually working from home right now, and we're actually trying to work on Teams, and he's trying to do a screen sharing with me to be able to work on his Node app. Mm -hmm. And instead of it being lockstep, trying to negotiate control one person driving or not, with LiveShare, we're able to independently collaborate while we're working at our own pace. So rather than pushing 4K pixels with Teams from a remote location, mm -hmm. you're actually remoting the, the context of the entire application? Yeah, so it's a simple link, and with that, I can hop into his project, and I get the full context of that. So I can see on the side, I can see all the files and folders that he's working with. A terminal actually reopens with all the commands that he was running before this, so I get full context into that. And finally, I am able to see the, the file that he's working in, and we can see the highlights and cursors as we're going around. Now, when I was peeking over here and seeing what he was doing before, it looked like he was in VS Code on a Mac, but suddenly now I'm seeing the same node code in Visual Studio 2019 on Windows. Yeah, so I'm working in Windows on Visual Studio 2019, and I don't even have the Node workload or Node.js actually installed on my computer, but it's all working on my side because it's all being forwarded from his machine. And I'm noticing his cursor and his name are appearing. He's selecting code right here and showing you what to be looking at. So yeah, so with his highlights, he's able to give me some context on the issue that he's looking into. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. So what about debugging, though? Um, yeah, so actually I'm able to set down breakpoints, and those breakpoints are synced to Jonathan's machine. I can even hit F5, and my debugger starts, and it attaches to the running app on his machine. Okay, but when you hit F5 and it runs on his machine, do you still have to do a screen share to see what's going on? So with LiveShare, the server for the front end is actually shared with me, so I can pull that up in my browser to be able to see it on my side as well. So your localhost 5000 is his localhost 5000? Exactly. And then you can click around the website in order to hit the breakpoint. Yeah, and we can even negotiate control for debugging, stepping over, stepping into methods between the two of us. I'm impressed. That is very cool. OK, last question. Mm -hmm. What about IntelliSense? So yeah, so you're actually able to get all the IntelliSense completions forwarded from Jonathan's machine to mine. With this being a Node app, if I start typing, I can hit dot, and I get a full completion list of all the things that work for this app. So everything from his machine watches, and all the context that is the app is being sent over to you? Yeah, so I'm able to get that full context on my side and work at my own pace. Interesting. Is, would even your feature be forwarded? I, I do believe it would. So IntelliCode works on LiveShare, and you've got IntelliCode running on your machine right here. Yep. What's this demo that you've got? Yeah, so first I'm just going to show you sort of our, our base case, as we call it. So for years, we heard from our users, IntelliSense is wonderful. I love it. It helps me so much. But you have to be able to do better than alphabetically. Like, we're, we're all computer scientists. We're smart, right? We can make it better. So what we did is we took the wisdom of the community, and what I mean by that is we took you know, hundreds of open source repositories on GitHub, we scanned through them to try and find the most popular practices for you know, APIs, for strings, for asserts, and now when you use any of those within Visual Studio, you know, if I do some sort of string variable dot, it will give me this list of recommended suggestions. So are you saying that you taught Visual Studio what I'm most likely to type based on what thousands and thousands of programmers that are better than I have already typed? Yes, that's exactly what we did. So we took, as, you know, as I said, our, our tagline, wisdom of the community. We took that whole community input and sort of infused IntelliSense with it so that you can get better recommendations. So now at the top of your IntelliSense list, you get these starred recommendations that are most likely what you want. OK, so that's amazing that you brought me like the wisdom of the ancients uh, mm -hmm. uh, up from the, all these open source projects. But my project isn't open source. I really want like my own custom model that's for me and my team but that's not for you. Yeah, no, so we've actually just built that feature, so you can do that now. All you have to do is open the solution that you want a custom model for, head to the IntelliCode page, click Train on My Code, and we create a custom model just for you. It's private to you and whoever you choose to share it with. So if you think your team would benefit from these custom IntelliCode recommendations, you can also share your wisdom with them. Oh, okay, and then you kind of union them, so I get both the public wisdom and then the wisdom of my own team? Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then those stars are, are going to keep me from having to scroll and, and go down into the Zs and the oh, Ys. Oh, yes. The... Yes. Okay. And what's really cool is that it changes depending on your context, right? So if you're just in the body of a method versus if you're in an if statement versus in a for or an else, you could get different recommendations at each point there. So ideally, 
you just have to tab enter, tab mm -hmm. enter, tab enter is what we always. Are you trying to say that programming for me is just yeah, it's just going to be enter, two enter. Yeah. two things, yeah. That's cool. And what language is going to do this with? So right yeah. now in Visual Studio 2019, you can use IntelliCode for C Sharp, XAML, and C++. Mm. And in Visual Studio Code, you have it for TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, and Java. Well, now you're just showing off. <laughs> She brought a Raspberry Pi, which I think is amazing. Thank you very much. Of course. Uh, is this machine talking to the Raspberry Pi? It is. So our Windows 10 application that we've built in Visual Studio 2019 has actually, you know what, let me deploy it. So I will go ahead and deploy our Windows 10 app. And now it is successfully mm. on our Raspberry Pi because I've installed Windows 10 on it. Isn't mm. that cool? That's overachieving. Very yeah. nicely done. So this application will tell us if Visual Studio is ready to launch. In fact, it says, is it time to launch? Do you want to try it? Let's find out. Touch screen. Is it time to launch? It, it is, time is. To launch. It's yeah. Very, very cool. I hope everyone tries it out. That's just fantastic. Well, thank you so much for showing me this. I'm going to go find a soda pop if I can get you anything. I'm yeah. good. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and then we'll go find some more PM to talk about Visual Studio 2019. Cool. Awesome. Have See you yeah. All right. See y'all. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, now we can relax. Uh. <laughs> 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 Wasn't that cool? I know you're going to see a lot more of these features later on. I just love talking to all these passionate people behind the features and hearing about why we build them. And you know what else I love here? Free soda. The free soda at Microsoft. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can download Visual Studio 2019 on PC and Mac right now. Visual Studio community users can head over to visualstudio.com. But if you're a Visual Studio professional or enterprise subscriber, there's even more goodness available to you through the my.visualstudio.com portal. Of course, you can download Visual Studio, but you'll also find Azure DevOps access. That's up to $150 in monthly Azure credits, technical and professional training subscriptions, and much more. Also, speaking of technical training, head over to launch.visualstudio.com to find links to all new Visual Studio 2019 technical training courses from both Pluralsight and LinkedIn Learning. Now let's head over to the UX lab that Amanda mentioned earlier to check out how we do customer research here in DevDiv. So I'm going over to the PM UX UI lab. I think it's in this building. Uh, I understand that they're actually doing some uh, studies right now, so I'm keeping my voice down because I don't want to interrupt anybody. Ah, okay, it's over here. We've got Dr. Rich. It looks like they're doing a study right now. Hi, Scott. Hi. We're How's so glad going? you could join us. How's it going? So what do we got going on yeah, here? Yeah, come on in. We're uh, This is our research lab. Okay. Uh, right now we have a uh, Python study happening, and this is our entire product team. So you're going to get uh, team members that are from engineering, PM, design, docs, and they're all actually watching the participant on the other side uh, interact with the product. Mm -hmm. So and this is real. Like these are real people. Like they, they're from. We, we flew them in, or where they come from? Yeah. So these are real people. So in Redmond, we have uh, we run studies every day in our lab. Every day. Uh, yeah. So we have over ten thousand customer connections a year. Wow. Um, and what you see right here is just one of many studies that we run. Um, so the entire product team joins us because. We, Basically, what they're doing is understanding how the customer is using our product, but it also they can see everything about the customer, right? Mm -hmm. So they can see uh, their facial expressions. They can see if they lean back in the chair, cross their arms, if they're smiling in delight. Mm -hmm. This actually fosters empathy with our product team and inspires them to take action to uh, to change the product if it doesn't fit our customers' needs. Well, wow. actually, I recognize this guy. I'm going to see if I can grab. Hey, Jeffrey. Do you got a second? Oh, hey, yeah. how are you? I haven't seen you, in, haven't a seen you in a while. So the, what, are you what are you guys testing here? So we're trying out some new designs for our Azure storage uh, SDK mm -hmm. client libraries. And we have a couple of different designs. We bring the people into the usability study, and we give them tasks to perform to try to download a blob. And uh, they try it with version 1. They try it with version 2. A couple minutes ago, you just missed it, but they high-fived each other because they were really successful in a short amount of time. Excellent. And that was, that was very reassuring for our team. That's <laughs> great. See and that. this is the whole team is watching this, and they're getting to see kind of in real time, did we get it right or not? Yes, exactly. And what we can do better and so on, yes. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Thanks too. for your patience. Yeah. 
All right, so we've got SDK, we've got Python, SCPS for Mac, we've got the Azure Developer Platform. Can we peek in one of these? Yeah, let's go ahead and take a, look, a look in Lab 1. So okay. this is the Visual, Visual Studio Code Python study, mm -hmm. and what you're seeing here is people with uh, or developers that have experience in Python but are using Visual Studio Code for mm -hmm. the first time with our Python extension. Can I open the door? Yeah, okay? absolutely. I don't want to, like, anger the beast. So what you're seeing here is that on the other side, our participants, they can't see us. It's a one-way mirror, so think law and order. <laughs> uh, so they can't see anyone on the product team, but the product team can see exactly what they're doing on the other side. And the beauty of these type of studies is that we can not only see every mouse click that they have on this screen, but we can see their uh, body language. So you're doing this every single day? Yes, we have over 10,000 customer engagements every single year. Um, many of them come in the form of surveys, one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews, or focus groups or site visits. Mm -hmm. So this is our culture room. Uh, let me grab Travis. He'll walk us through. Travis. Hey, so we're showing the culture room. Uh, so the culture room is a room that we walk teams through to help them understand about what we're trying to achieve. Uh, in, really becoming a customer obsessed org. You know, we know that Satya is walking us through every day trying to transform this company into being, uh, creating zero distance between us and the customer. So we spend a lot of time in this room thinking about how we can change our culture to better connect with our customers and really bring zero distance uh, between us and engaging with our customers. So we talk a lot about hacking our culture and we're spending a lot of time with our customers. It's so important that our developer community gives us feedback every single day in terms of uh, where we're headed with the product and what we're trying to do. It's so inspirational that there's so much more data driven, there's so much more customer obsessed. Uh, it's being baked in at every level. I was surprised that you were saying you're doing these UX uh, labs every single day. Right. I hope people that are watching this are learning that this is happening and right. these, these things are being thought about. Well, and the important thing to remember too is that to engage with us, you don't have to be in the UX lab. So we have developer community and there's so many ways to be in contact with us to give us feedback about the product, even within Visual Studio, for instance. Fantastic. So we need customers to understand that we're here, we're listening, and we're engaging, we're trying to make the product better based on what they're giving us. That's great. I'm going to go find some more PMs that are working on the product. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Travis. Yeah, my pleasure. Great. Dr. Rich, nice thank to meet you so you. much. Thank you. All right, let's go find some more PMs. Hey friends. Yeah. Hi. How's it going? Hi. I have just come from the UX lab. It's amazing. You gotta go check it out. But I hear that you have some fun demos for me. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's see them. You know, I was talking with Julia and Amanda about some of the things in Visual Studio 2019 that kind of like delight people. Just little features that just make you happy when you're debugging. And you work on some of those things, Leslie. Yeah, one of the cool things that we added for Visual Studio 2019 are data breakpoints, which if you're a C++ developer, then chances are you already know about this feature. But now C Sharp and .NET Core users can rejoice because Yay! yeah, it is now in our managed code lives. And uh, so basically, this is a feature that allows you to break when an object's value changes. So if you want to hone in on a specific value of an object and not just the whole scope of an object, this is the way to go. Cool, so you say, I want to know when that thing changes, no matter where it changes, and the breakpoint gets hit. Right. That's awesome. It's super cool. So like sometimes when you have like a really big application, you might have a big stateful object that's really, really deep, like a big dependency. Maybe if you're doing like a big game or something like that, and then you could use managed data breakpoints. Yeah, absolutely. Except the problem is if you have a large application like a game, sometimes mm. it can be near impossible to even debug it if you're using a previous iteration of Visual Studio. Mm. So teams across Microsoft, for instance, such as the Office team and the Edge team and um, Xbox, a couple of those teams, they've approached us like, hey, can you please let us actually debug our <laughs> really, really big apps that are usually written in C++ because right now, we're just getting constant out of memory errors. So now for 2019, we have made it, we've made symbols out of proc for C++ applications. So you're now able to debug those applications without constantly experiencing those memory errors. I think I recognize this game. Is this what yeah. I think it is? Yes, this is Gears of War. So that's obviously a really big game. And as you can see, it's being debugged in Visual Studio 2019. We've also, uh, just to compare it, we've 
tried to debug it in 2017, if you look in the task manager at the memory consumption being used, the amount of memory being consumed in 2019 is significantly lower than what it is in 2017. So nice. no sweat cool. there. You should be able to debug And also problem. they gave you the source code to Gears of War, yeah, which is yeah, so awesome. Yeah, they're so nice. <laughs> So if I've got an application that works great locally, but maybe it's got a cloud service and I put that up in the cloud, what if it doesn't work well in production? How do I debug that? Yeah, so normally in the past what you'd have to do is you know, either make a repro locally, which can be really tricky, or you'd have to try to garner what the issue is from a bunch of logs and you may not even get all the relevant information that you need. Mm -hmm. So uh, Visual Studio 2017 introduced snapshot debugging, which allows you to take a snapshot of your application and debug it while the code is still running in production without any impact on mm -hmm. the end user's experience. So what we've added for 2019 on top of that is time travel debugging, which basically allows you to step through your code as you're using the snapshot debugger. Seriously, so, like yeah. literally time travel debugging. I'm moving forward and backward in exactly. time. Exactly. Yep, so you can move forward, backward, frontwards. And you Inwards. get all the context about everything that's happening in your application. Yes, so yeah, you still get the full functionality of the VS debugger, so call stacks, um, watch window, locals window. Oh, uh, that's works. awesome. Yeah. Well, I've got my application into production, but if it's, if it's got a bug and I need to debug, I probably didn't pass my unit test. What happened, Kendra? Well, um, live unit testing can actually help you make sure that everything you push into the cloud has actually had a test run. So live unit testing can automatically rerun tests every time you make a code change. Seriously, like every time you save it? Yeah, so here I can make a quick code change and you can see the test is rerunning in the background as I'm typing. As you're typing. Yeah, and I can get feedback on the test result right in the editor. Okay, well, so that was my bad to push the bug into production. Next yeah, time. it's on you, for sure. Next time I will use live unit testing. So what app are you working on, Kendra? So this is actually a little Twitter sentiment analysis app that uh, we cooked up. So it gets all of the recent tweets on Visual Studio and runs them through Azure Cognitive Services to gauge sentiment. Mm. So here I have a little emoji, searching for emoji tests because emojis are super important. Well, I gotta ask. Yeah. How did you get the emojis to display like that in the editor? Because Visual Studio is awesome and recognizes <laughs> Unicode characters. <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, so the refactoring that I just triggered um, is all of our code fixes and refactorings you can access through Control Dot. And that was one of the new refactorings, one of many that mm. we added in Visual Studio 2019, wrapping parameters. Mm. So if you have super long parameters and it's difficult to see, some people prefer the code style of wrapping every new parameter on a new line. One of the things that they were mentioning was that in the old days, I used to have to remember all of these different um, hotkeys, but now they're like Control T, Control Dot, Control Q. What's like the, is there like a ultimate refactoring? Yeah, um, so control dot, when you're in the editor, okay. will open all of the refactorings available where your cursor is. So it's very contextually clever, I mm. guess. Um, control T is our main navigation shortcut for anything inside your code. And control Q is anything within your menus and Visual Studio and tools options, that kind of thing. So I just have to remember those three hotkeys and yeah. I have the power yeah. of Visual Studio. And we have little icons that you can open to, so a little screwdriver will appear or a light bulb if you got a suggestion. Very cool, and I'm now gonna put emojis in all of my code. Excellent. <laughs> One of the first things you'll notice as soon as you open Visual Studio 2019 is the new colorization. So methods, local parameters, all of your user members have new Roslyn syntax cl classifications, so they get new colors. So you can see for each is purple here, um, parameters are this dark blue. We tried to mimic the Visual Studio code color as much as possible because mm. those had already been super successful uh, in the community and uh, we got a lot of feedback that people loved them. That's cool. So you gave Visual Studio a little pop. So yes. it'll be the colors that I'm used to with just more context. Yeah. A refactoring we added to Visual Studio 2019 is for each to link. It is the latest one to join the for loop refactoring family. So we have uh, link to for each, we have for loop to for each, and converting back many of them, they're super fun to try out. It makes me feel smart because I maybe can't write the link from scratch, but I can <laughs> yeah. totally write the triply nested for loop and they go whoosh, and it turns into link. Yeah, and definitely. I'm like, yeah, I wrote that myself. Everyone's like, God, you can use link? Yeah, wow. I can. <laughs> so smart. <laughs> What if I'm getting started with a, a code base that's gonna be a little crusty and I'd like to just kind of get a jump start? I don't want to refactor like step by step. Yeah, um, a great way to apply all the refactorings you want to is code cleanup. So you've probably 
it's you configured all of the rules and tools options, what levels of refactoring, suggestions, warning, or errors you want this to be triggered on. You can export those to an editor config file that lives with your repository. All of your team members can have the same editor config file, and Code Cleanup will run the refactorings that you set in that. Very so, cool. yeah, it's a great way to clean up your code. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, All right. What do you have for me? Oh, my gosh. I have so much to show you today. I'm really excited. So, Kendra was talking about those code fixes and refactorings that we have on Visual Studio 2019 for Windows now. We've actually brought the C Sharp code editor from Windows over to Mac. So, Visual Studio 2019 for Mac has the same IntelliSense. Um, code refactoring, syntax highlighting that you get on Windows now. So you're literally sharing code between the two? We are, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So here we are in a Xamarin Forms project. So Scott, as you know, Xamarin is our .NET framework to run C Sharp code on iOS and Android and watches and TVs, all that great stuff. Mm -hmm. And this project is Xamarin Forms, so 100% of the front end is in XAML, and it runs on both mm -hmm. iOS and Android. So you're sharing the UI across all of this? Yep, we are, and it's great. Uh, and this is Tailwind Trader, so it's an app we demoed at Connect in the fall. And it's 100% Xamarin Forms, and it's using a new feature we have called Shell that does all your navigation for you. Seriously? Yeah. So coloring and changing the flyouts and the tabs is super easy, very easy to customize. That was Visual Studio 2019 for Mac, mm -hmm. so let me flip over to Windows here. Uh, I have some more great stuff to show you for Xamarin. Uh, first off, we have IntelliCode support for Xamarin Form XAML right out of the box. Nice. So you can go ahead and type out your controls and your attributes, and it just pops up with suggestions. It's really smart. We also have a property panel, so you can go in and change the colors of your controls, the layout, where they're positioned, the text, all that great stuff without actually having to write any XAML, which is very helpful. Nice. One of the things that kept me from using Xamarin before was I thought it was really uh, had a large install size, but that's way smaller in 2019. Right, we dropped the install size from 23 gigs to 7 gigs, which is fantastic. It makes it way quicker to get started. Mm. We also did a lot of work on Android build and deploy performance. So it was previously really slow, and it took a long time to spin up the emulator, and then you had to build your project, deploy your project, and that inner dev loop, we call it, was taking people a really long time. Yeah, I hear that the Android build times are way faster, and it's just a lot more fun. Yeah, the build times are faster, the deploy times are faster, uh, the emulator for Android now supports Hyper-V. We worked closely with the Hyper-V team on that. That's great. That means I can have Android on an emulator on Hyper-V with Docker, and I can have my microservice talking to my Xamarin app. Oh, yeah. You can have it all working, and it's so much faster and so much smoother and cleaner now, so it's a lot of fun. That's great. You've got a phone right here running Tailwind Traders? I do. I also have this pair of pliers. Mm -hmm. And using 100% Xamarin Forms and, and Xamarin, we can actually take a photo of this pair of pliers right here. Okay. And it will recommend to us what we can buy that looks like this using computer vision. So wow. it's hooked so it up identified to it and it's already talked to the back end. It already has. That and it fast. says, get this red multi tool plier right here. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, it's great. So that is using a back end that's written in, in Azure. Yeah, it's all in Azure. Yeah, and we have some great tools in Visual Studio to enable you to get started developing for Azure. So I can go and write a backend really quickly, starting with Visual Studio 2019. That is correct. So one of the easiest ways we have to get started is we have a lot of project templates built into Visual Studio for dedicated Azure types like Azure Functions. Uh, we also have ASP.NET Core, which is just a great general purpose backend that can be hosted in lots of places running in Azure. Then when you're developing as a user, we have all sorts of emulators to run things locally, so you don't even necessarily need a cloud connection when you're developing and targeting Azure, so you don't need to be running up your bill. If you want to use storage, databases, all those things are available to run locally, so you don't have to have a cloud-connected developer environment every day. I know you travel a lot, Scott. You can actually do it on the airplane. Yeah, I was really surprised how many things I was able to do developing for the cloud for Azure on my local machine with emulators for Cosmos DB, for storage, and all those kind of things making cloud applications on an airplane disconnected. Yeah, that is one of our goals. We hear from a lot of people that they, they like that tight loop of just being able to do everything locally without the cloud dependency you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, well, I've landed the plane, and I'm ready to go from offline to online. I'm going to put this up into Azure. Yeah, we've worked really hard to make that easy from Visual Studio. All you have to do is right-click the project, choose Publish, and you'll see a list of Azure targets available to run it. If you don't have an opinion yet, we recommend starting with Azure App Service as we think you'll find that the easiest place to get started. 
And after you've published your application, the core part of your code that's going to run, we make it really easy to create other dependencies that the application may need to function correctly, including SQL Server and Azure Storage directly from Visual Studio. And actually, once you've published it, even if you don't need it initially, one of the new things we've added in 2019 is we've made it easy to come back and add those at any point in the application's development lifecycle. So you're making that published dialog kind of re-entrant. I can go back in and say, I want a little SQL and I want a little storage, and add that to my existing publish? Absolutely, yeah. So if you decide that you need storage three months into development, you just add that to the app service environment directly from Visual Studio without the need to go to the portal or some other tool. That's cool. Wow. I love everything that you just showed me, except uh, my boss won't give me access to create anything new in Azure. Yeah, we hear that a lot. So one of the other things we offer in Visual Studio is the ability to choose existing resources. So as long as you have permissions to publish to the resource, you can, through Visual Studio, select an already created resource in Azure, and that same published summary tab will get populated just like you created everything yourself. In fact, we even are able to show you the SQL and storage dependencies. Fantastic, you've solved all my problems. This has been great. Absolutely. All right, well, I'm going to take off to my next thing. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, bye, guys. Bye. All right, bye-bye, everybody. That was so much fun for me. I hope you enjoyed getting to know some of the people who work on Visual Studio 2019 and taking a peek behind the scenes. As I mentioned at the start, there's a ton more content coming today with 11 live stream sessions starting right now at launch.visualstudio.com. Be sure to ask questions and let us know what you think either on Twitter at hashtag VS2019 or join us for live conversations on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Visual Studio. Whew, that was a lot. Good job, Scott. You added some value. Well, I hope we fix that in post. Cool, that's very cool. So who do you think I should go and see? <laughs> see, it's fake, isn't it? It sounds so weird, Sorry. It does sound weird, because okay. we don't know what you just said. Okay. But whatever no, it was, I'm gonna get straight it was face super this time, excited. I, I can actually do my continuous integration right there. That was so good. Yeah, I have it right here. Um, and it's, it's hooked up to the interwebs and running the back end. <laughs> High five on that. High five. <laughs> high five. <laughs> we can do high five. Watch your high five. Back. Try it again, is that okay? Hey, Kendra. Yeah, Kendra. Stop ruining the illusion that you're standing next to Scott. <laughs> so I was able to sign in directly to GitHub from the start window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, that's exactly right. And then I'm going to say something that I've. <laughs> 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 Hello and welcome live to the Channel 9 Studios. We are here for the Visual Studio 2019 launch. I am super excited. Let me show you what I've got and why I'm excited. This here, my friends, was the very first professional development program that I used. I think it was the first Visual Studio, so it's really exciting for me to be here. And I've also got some friends with me because we're going to talk a lot about a lot of stuff today. Uh, Jeff, are you over there in Studio C, my friend? Going there, Seth. Yeah, I'm over here in Studio C, getting ready for all kinds of interaction with our community throughout the day today. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about what you're going to do, and then we'll go over some of the stuff that we have for today. So there's a bunch of live watch parties going on right now, and I know you're watching us out there in places like Helsinki and Ireland and Arizona, and even there's a group of folks in Mumbai that are watching us right now. We're going to reach out. We're going to talk to some of those folks throughout the day today. And then a little bit later on, we've got a couple MVPs joining us back here in Studio C. And we're going to wrap things up with a post-event party live with a bunch of great guests right here. My understanding is that there might be prizes, or did I get that wrong? Oh, there might be. There might be a lot of prizes. Awesome. We've actually got 21 prizes that folks can win. 20, 21? I mean, 21. are you trying to go for like a super round number, 21? How did you come up with that? We, we did have a round number, but somebody else said, hey, here's a cool prize to give away also, so we made it 21. Awesome. All right, so let me go through some of the scheduling. We'll leave Jeff there so we can both, like, what happened to your beard, man? Um, I, I don't know. I, I've been told this is my color. What do you think? Is that good? Does that look good? Visual Studio Purple? 
I'm going to read the schedule now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you just saw an awesome keynote. I love that keynote because you get to see a little bit of the personality of the people that work here. We are people after all, and we are obsessed with doing the right thing by you. And so if you ever have feedback for us, we want that. Hopefully you saw some of that in the keynote. We are super passionate about making sure the developers are productive and that they use the greatest, latest and greatest tools. I've been using them for nigh almost 20 years. Man, I'm old. All right, so uh, what we've got coming yes. up next is we have Amanda Silver and Joseph Hill. They are only going to be taking your questions. I'm going to be getting them on this board. So use the hashtag VS2019 and we'll get it on here uh, and we'll ask questions. I have tons of questions for them, but I'm really all about the questions that you have. So make sure we get those in. We also have coming up Write Beautiful Code Faster with the amazing Kendra Haven. So you're not going to want to miss that. And in the middle of these things, as Jeff was telling you, we're going to try to get some people because there are over 70 live viewing parties across the world, 160 that are be going through May. And so there's a lot of people okay. that are going to be enjoying this, I hope. Uh, next, we have a Streamline Your Dream dev team with Allison and John. So you're going to want to make sure you stay with that. We're going to look at squashing bugs and improving code quality with Leslie Richardson. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm pretty excited about that. And then we have DevOps. Now, DevOps is something that I've started to get into. I wish I would have done that during these days, if you know what I mean. Uh, Jeff, how long have you been coding, bud? Oh, gosh, Seth. Um, I've been coding for mm, 20, 25 years also, you know? I started in VB6, right? That was a thing. He's older than me. Now, hey, hey, you can't tell. Well, can't, it's the I, beard. It gives it away, man. When no, you start coloring so your young. beard, everyone knows. Like, you're trying to hide the gray. Don't well, it's much. I'm trying to hide the Fortran 77 remnants that are <laughs> hanging around. Nice. So what is the, the most favorite thing, reminiscence you have about Visual Studio? Because I know you've been in Visual Studio almost your whole career, too. Oh, my gosh. You know, when I look at the stuff that's come out with Visual Studio 2019, I'm a huge fan of not just live share, but IntelliCode. Mm -hmm. The new IntelliCode features where it gives me a little star next to those features, those things that I might want to use in my code, properties, methods, events that are most common are, are a great way for me to learn an API that I might not be familiar with. I had somebody that I was working with over Visual Studio Live Share last week. Uh, they weren't familiar with some of the libraries we were working with, and because they saw those in, uh, IntelliCode charms popping up the star to hint at different features, they immediately knew how to make the most of the API we were using. Really, really great help for those folks. And that's really cool because I, th I thought I saw someone on Twitch. Yes, we're watching as you talk. I saw someone like, we need to do the thing where we hook up someone's head and we just write the code that they think. I think that's, I, I want to work on that. That's that's like not, that's IntelliCode and machine learning. Intel, we'll call it IntelliBrain. IntelliBrain. We, should we get that trademark, people? We should Intelli, no. They, Somebody get me that domain Someone name. gave me a side eye. <laughs> All right, so uh, next, uh, after talking DevOps, we're going to have an AI-infused break with me. I'm going to do a half hour of AI. It's going to be legit fantastic because I just actually learned a lot of stuff about Visual Studio and Python. So we're going to be doing a little bit of oh, that. Oh, Python's amazing. I know. I'm such a fan. I, like I said, I, I did Visual Studio for many years, and then I went to back to school because I had to get an education, and then I, I used Python there. Next, we're going to do Accelerate Your C++ Development, which is pretty powerful. I love C++. I just don't like cleaning up after myself. That's a programmer joke, Jeff. That, that's, that is. We, we like our, uh, our GC processes here in .NET. I'm just saying. Okay. Uh, after that, we have cross-platform mobile apps made easy using Xamarin, and then to the cloud with Visual Studio and Azure. Now, here's the thing. We're going to try to get these up as soon as possible. And so if you're going to be asking us when are they going up, we're going, like the gerbils are working as fast as they can in the back. We have put an extra large wheel and they're running as we speak. But of course, Seth, yes, folks sir. that are watching here on Twitch or if they're over on Mixer, you can hit that video on demand button up top oh. and rewind to earlier in the day if you want to go check something out that already happened. Oh, that way. He knows his stuff. I had to look at the monitor because like he's, he's over in this area, not in this area. Yeah, okay. physically I'm on that side. All right. Uh, Dan Roth is going to come and talk about building amazing web apps with .NET Core. And then finally, uh, two more sessions, a tour of Visual Studio for Mac with Michaela Hutchinson. I hear there's a lot of cool stuff. And we have Joseph here. If you want to ask him like hard questions, you can. 
Uh, and then amazing devs doing amazing things. That's with you, Jeff, right? Yeah. So we've got a couple of MVPs, a couple of Microsoft MVPs that'll be joining us, uh, Ginny Coy and Oren Novotny, and we're going to we're going to talk about some of the things that have been happening in the preview channel for Visual Studio 2019 that they've been watching and what's coming up. Some of the things they're seeing coming in the next preview channel for Visual Studio. Fantastic. Well, I think we've blathered enough. Let's go and give some time to some amazing people. We got about 60 seconds before we go to them, but what we want to do is please make sure to stay tuned for all of the cool Absolutely. stuff. There's a lot of stuff that you're going to learn. There's a lot of fun stuff that we're going to do after, and we want your comments. Above all, we want your questions. We will get them up here on the tag board. There's 24 already. I'll, I'll push this button and then we'll start to ask them. I'm going to be the Vanna White today of Visual Studio 2019. I'm very excited about that. And so without further ado, let me introduce two people. Well, let's have you introduce yourselves. We have Joseph and Amanda. Tell us who you are and what you do. We'll start with you, Amanda. Sure. I'm Amanda Silver. I'm the Director of Program Management for Visual Studio and VS Code. Fantastic. And I'm Joseph Hill. I'm Director of Program Management for Visual Studio for Mac and Xamarin. VIPs, as we like to call you, too. So why don't you give us like a small recap of the stuff that we talked about. Just a, a tiny one so that we can get the pump prime for people to ask questions. We'll start with you, Joseph. Um, well, yeah, so as I said, Visual Studio for Mac, right, uh, Xamarin. Pretty excited. I think uh, Visual Studio 2019 developers will be super excited about the improvements yeah. we've made to performance and stability for, for both Xamarin and Visual Studio for Mac. In Visual Studio, we've reduced the download size a lot. So as you're going through installing Visual Studio 2019 today and you're thinking, oh, can I put 25 gigs of mobile development tools on my, on my desktop, it's, uh, it's like one third that size now. So you should definitely opt into that. Fantastic. So did you just zip stuff up or what is it? Was there something yeah, that's right. We like somebody introduced us to this uh, this archiving tool <laughs> and uh, we're like, wow, this is great. Why aren't we using we this? We tarted DGZ yeah. it all up. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Amanda, what about for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think today is the big news of Visual Studio 2019 being being ready for everybody to take on. Um, so, you know, there's a kind of get first uh, start experience so that you can really get into the flow with your code that your other teammates are working on. Um, there's Visual Studio Live Share kind of in the Visual Studio 2019 uh, box out the gate. So basically, we have um, both collaboration at the check in time um, so that you can actually go and review uh, pull requests and things like that inside of Visual Studio, but also pre check in. So you can actually have a real-time uh, collaboration session with somebody else that you're working with. Um, the other things that are super exciting are you know, Visual Studio and Telecode we talked about, which basically is kind of the first steps towards allowing um, AI and machine learning to basically enhance your productivity as a developer. Um, but there's so many things that I can't even, I can't even name all of them, right? Um, we've improved the uh, UI a little bit uh, so that it just feels a lot cleaner, so you have uh, headspace to kind of focus on the code that you're writing. We've improved the search capability in Visual Studio 2019 so you can actually discover uh, new, new uh, features that you might not have been familiar with previously. One of my favorite features is actually that we've moved the C++ debugging out of process. And so that has been absolutely huge for people who are working on very large scale C++ applications, um, especially folks like uh, those that are working on AAA games because they, they used to have a situation where they would basically run into out of memory exceptions in the debugger after about like five, 10 minutes of, of coding. And then all of a sudden now they, they really don't run into those things anymore. They, ha they can have, you know, half hour, hour, you know, couple hour long debugging sessions. And, and that's pretty amazing because I saw there was actually debugging like a huge game and just like a game by itself is pretty big and now when you have all the debug symbols and you have to keep track of all, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing what you're able to do with that. Yeah, we have a lot of testimonials from folks who are building large scale C++ applications that it really is a game changer for them. Awesome, so let's get to the questions and then I'll intersperse with some of mine. We have here uh, my friend Toby Loba. What features do the Community Edition ship with? Uh, so actually our Community Edition is actually exactly the same as our Professional Edition. It just has different licensing restrictions on it. So any of the features that are in our Professional Edition are also available in the Community Edition. And obviously that's thousands and thousands and thousands of features. I can't, I can't name all of them. That's cool. So let's start a little bit with some of the streamlining that happened. You both mentioned there was some streamlining that happened with Visual Studio. Can you talk a little bit more in depth about that? I did notice myself, because I installed the RC last week, 
There was some snappiness to it. How did we make it a little bit faster? I know this happened in Visual Studio for Mac as well as uh, Visual Studio for Windows, yes. Yeah, so just to start with Visual Studio for Mac, um, we, uh, we've started to take code from Visual Studio over to Visual Studio for Mac. And uh, luckily, like our editor is where we've been putting a lot of the work. It's written in C Sharp. We, uh, Microsoft's, you know, already had uh, an editor written in C Sharp. So being able to bring it over to the Mac uh, results in like, we have like 95% of the code for our new editor coming from the Windows implementation. But it's also snappy because uh, we were able to move to a native Cocoa front end. And, um, and so we get like native scrolling and uh, better support for uh, right to left, rendering, word wrap. A lot, of, a lot of features we couldn't do in our previous editor we're able to do through um, building on a, on a native you know, rendering base with, with like, like you said, streamlining's where it's at, bringing over Visual Studio code and we're, we're eyeing the future, the roadmap, more features that we can bring over from Visual Studio and, and develop features in, in, um, in conjunction with Visual Studio. Uh, Amanda mentioned earlier, get to code. That's, uh, we're super excited about that because that's a feature we were able to bring to both IDEs at, uh, at the same time with launch today. What does get to code mean? Uh, so get to code is basically the idea that we want you to get into your coding environment and become uh, productive in the zone while you're, while you're programming as quickly as possible. Right. And so you know, Visual Studio originally was designed in an era when everything was installed on a, a bunch of disks that you would buy off of a shelf at some large you know, big box, uh, you know, digital store. Mm -hmm. And then you'd install all of it, including help and all of the templates and all of that kind of stuff. Um, nowadays, a lot of developers really start with either hosted repositories that are hosted in a private server or, you know, hosted in a public repository. And so if that's really where people are starting, we wanted to make sure that that is a really super productive experience inside of Visual Studio 2019. So if you open up Visual Studio 2019, you're going to see kind of a, um, streamlined start experience where uh, the options are start from an online repo, start from you know a, a template, a create new project, um, start from an open project or anything that you've opened recently, um, and so on. And so, uh, so you can really get into the zone of coding as quickly as possible. I, I, honestly, that's probably one of my favorite features where I start it up and it actually starts up. Now, I wanted to, you were going to talk, <laughs> no, because usually like it took a long time. Look, I'm being honest here. We're all friends here. But now it's like really snappy. I get to what do you want to work on? Yep. I think that's, that's really the goal is we wanted to make sure that everybody who's new to the product, uh, but also those who have been using the product for years and years and years can basically get into the zone coding as quickly as possible. Now, Joseph mentioned a little bit about some of the streamlining that happened in Visual Studio uh, for Mac. Can you describe a little bit some of the streamlining that went on in Visual Studio for Windows? Well, I mean, in some ways, uh, so Joseph was talking a lot about kind of the installer and things like that. And we have definitely improved the install experience, the update experience, and things like that in Visual Studio 2019. Uh, a lot. Um, but some of the ways that it's been streamlined are actually kind of UI changes. So, uh, so if you start up Visual Studio 2019, you might notice that there's a slight uh, color theme change from Visual Studio 2017. Um, and if you put them side by side, uh, you'll actually, I, I find that Visual Studio 2019 feels just cleaner and you're not really quite sure why. Um, but we've done a lot of work to actually make sure that we've, you know, cut bezels and we've cut, you know, repetitive um, text and stuff like that so that you can really be focused on, on your code. Um, we've also kind of streamlined the menuing system so that it actually occupies one less row so that you have one more row of, of code that you can focus on. And then uh, I think the other thing is, you know, with the enhanced kind of search experience, uh, you now don't don't need to as often hunt and peck through the men menuing system to find the thing that you need. Uh, what I find using Visual Studio 2019 is if I want to use a certain feature or you know install a component that I hadn't installed previously, that I can actually just go to the search menu, you know, type whatever I'm looking for, and it'll come up there, and it'll then kind of streamline my experience exactly to the menu that I need. Awesome. Uh, Joseph, do you have something? I was just going to add to that, yeah, because on Xamarin, especially impactful is the we've really improved the solution load time and solution creation time. So, um, you know, it's 
that's a snappier feel too when you're able to Yeah, I mean, I didn't even <laughs> touch on that. But no. <laughs> performance is absolutely huge. I mean, I talked about the C++ uh, debugger being out of proc and the impact that that has. But we've also done some pretty amazing things in terms of um, solution load time, project load time, as well as unit test discovery. Um, so that it's now getting started in any typical project is, is you know, uh, tens of percentage points better. That's awesome. I mean, I, I personally noticed it. Like I said, I usually, I've been doing a lot of work in Visual Studio uh, Code with Python, and they said, I, they were like, hey, you got to do this AI thing. I'm like, and they said, hey, you can do Python in Visual Studio. I'm like, oh, can you? And I went in there, and it's a surprising, like it, it felt like I was back in my C Sharp days, but it was Python, which was really cool. All right, from Frank Ofoedu, from all the way from Nigeria, will there be an offline ISO installer for the community version? This will help developers here who don't have stable internet connection uh, there. Yeah, so we, we actually haven't been doing an ISO installer with 2017 or 2019. Um, what we have is a layout option so that you can actually create your own offline installer and then access it that way. So you could certainly use you know, Azure or something like that to create that layout and then, and then install it from there. Cool. All right, so from Ken we have, can a single developer release a commercial app on Community Edition if there are restrictions? Can you please elaborate? Yeah, so, uh, so the community edition is basically for teams that are smaller than five. So that is definitely something that's supported with community. Awesome. Here's another one uh, from Shannon. Will there be an issue if my team uses VS 2017 and check in code into Git while using uh, 2019? Will we be constantly batting for updates of the solution project files? Meaning, is it the solution different? Um, so, so the solution generally should not be different. You should be able to actually collaborate on them. But for the most part, what we suggest is that you have basically a team that's kind of looking at migrating your solution to 2019. You can do this on the same box. So the, I think the important thing is that an individual developer can kind of uh, go and survey the new release. And they can do it side by side on the same box without actually impacting um, the rest of their source code or the stability of their 2017 install um, and evaluate it and then kind of migrate the team over to the 2019 version. I see. And this goes to a little bit of what Samuel is asking here. Can you upgrade from VS 2017 to 2019? You can actually have them both at the same time and not even interfering with each other. Is that right? That's right. So, so you can install 2017 right next to 2019 and actually, you know, in fact, I do use you know, some sometimes and some and one the other the other times. One of the things that we've really worked on in the last version is streamlining the upgrade experience from 2017 to 2019. So where in 2017 you would have to kind of pick the workloads, basically pick which SDK is what project types you wanted to work on. Um, if you've already done that in 2017, then you're update experience to 2019 should be super, super easy because we've basically migrated all of your, all of your settings, all of your workloads to the 2019 installer. Now, here's a, here's a fun question. Uh, was there any really big features that you wanted to include but didn't make the cut? Now, it feels like recently Visual Studio, we've been putting out stuff super early. It's not like it used to be like, you know, we'd wait two years and then it would come in this huge box. Uh, tell us a little about how you plan and, and what goes into releases. Both you want to take that one, Joseph? Well, sure. Yeah, I mean, it speaks right to the heart of the of the VS for Mac uh, release. We listen to uh, feedback from from users, and we we test uh, features as we're going. And uh, the really big push that we have for VS for Mac uh, 2019 is to switch the editor over to that editor I was describing earlier. That's a preview uh, today in VS for Mac 2019. Uh, you can go into your preferences and select. The new editor, it's a great experience and I recommend you do it. Right now it's in C Sharp, but we held it back from turning it on by default because it just wasn't the right call. It wasn't the best thing for users. Um, but uh, as that comes online, like, you know, in, in updates to 2019, we'll have it on by default very soon, uh, followed by additional languages, XAML, JavaScript, uh, Razor Blazor, et cetera. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, so I, you know, especially with our update cadence, where we now have uh, preview releases coming out super regularly, and we have updates coming out every you know few weeks or so. Um, I don't. I never feel terrible about actually not getting a particular feature into Visual Studio because I know that it's coming down the road uh, super quickly. Um, there are come. There are a couple that that are. Uh, in basically like preview at this point that will make it into an update shortly. 
Um, one that comes to mind is time travel debugging. Um, another one is the um, IntelliCo kind of being in the box. Another one is, uh, is the PR experience. All of those things will be coming up in future updates. And I think one of the things that's really changed over the last couple of years in terms of how we manage Visual Studio and kind of talk about it with the community is we're actually pretty transparent about what our roadmap looks like. And so you can actually look for a Visual Studio roadmap, and you can see all of these features that are coming down the pike. Yeah, and this is very different than what it used to be, because I remember we would just be like, oh, wow, it's out. But I, I have talked to, for example, just with languages, with Mads Torgerson, I have talked to him years in advance before some, like C Sharp 8's coming out, and I talked to him like a year and a half ago about the features that they were just thinking about, which is pretty cool. Now I'd like to move on to IntelliCode, because I, I'm a machine learning person, and this is an interesting question that we're going to table just for a second while you talk about IntelliCode. What is it? And maybe there's some concerns that people have. How do you address them? Oh, for example, he's, he's worried uh, if IntelliCode suggests code according to what most people use, couldn't that cause bad practices around the world as a result of most people using old and efficient practices? Yeah, so I mean, IntelliCode is, some, is, a, is the first steps in a long road towards uh, allowing machine learning to enhance your developer experience. And so, um, so the first thing that we did is we actually trained it on public repos that were highly rated. And so we assumed that if they were highly rated, that that probably meant that they were decent code. Um, what we've now added is the ability to train your IntelliCode machine learning models on your own custom code, even private code, um, that's, that's unique to your team. Uh, and so you, know, you actually can select kind of which uh, repos you use to train those models. Yeah, so it's basically you get to choose what models you do. Yeah, that's right. And not only that, once you do that, once you choose to train on a model, which might take a couple of minutes um, to kind of get the model back because it actually has to go and, and kind of calculate it in the yeah. cloud, create the machine learning models, um, you can actually share that model with your other teammates. So let's say you're a developer that's inside of a large enterprise with lots of developers on it, and you build a common framework for your team. Uh, you could actually train the IntelliCode model on that common framework and then share that, uh, share that model just like you would share any kind of you know, library or a, or a, rep a source repo um, with the other developers on your team. So they don't even need to go through the process of training it on that, on that custom library. You've done that. You've curated that. And then you can make sure that they have the most productive experience on that library. And I think that's an important distinction, right? Because like he brings up a good point. What if it's not according to the way we want to do it, that's the way I read it, you can actually use your own code and train it on that and have your own style as, as a company uh, in the model. Okay, right. uh, a couple more questions. There was, uh, there's one new coming in here. Uh, this one's a funny one. How fast can I install Visual Studio 2019? Uh, so the absolute minimum installer for Visual Studio 2019 should take about two and a half minutes. Um, but of course, that comes with no workloads. So what you're going to get with that is basically like a lightweight editing experience with um, lightweight language services. So you know you might get some uh, grammar and syntax. You might get some grammar and syntax checking, but not really kind of semantic analysis. It's pretty fast. I mean, like I downloaded a couple of workloads, and it was like I download. I, I always check all the things, which I probably shouldn't do. <laughs> and that, that takes a little bit of time because you're downloading a lot of different workloads, but I, I feel that the greatest thing is you have choice in what it is that you put on. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, we've definitely been working to try to make sure that our installers for various workloads are a lot yeah. more lightweight. Yeah, that's why I smiled when I heard the question because I was like, man, you know, config, depending on the configuration, like the, the install times have just dropped so significantly. Yeah. And yeah, minimal, two minutes, sure, but like for your workloads, it's, you're, you're going to be pleased. Because we, we learned how to zip, of course. That's right, we just, exactly, we just as I figured said. Out. Uh, here's yeah. a really important question. Is the new Visual Studio 2019 editor ADA compliant? Yeah, so we've definitely been working on improving the accessibility of Visual Studio 2019 for, for a couple of years. And actually, 2017, I believe, was ADA compliant. Um, but we continue to work on that uh, and, and improve that. OK, awesome. So what other features did you really, because uh, we talked about speed. We talked about uh, we talked about IntelliCode a little bit. Is there another feature that you, you feel people should really look at in Visual Studio 2019 for both of you? Putting you on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, 
why I sure I sure <laughs> leapt in to fill some some audio space. I'm stalling for Amanda because I know no. she's gonna have a great one. <laughs> no, I mean I think some of the stuff that we've done, uh, like for example, we've introduced debug search. Uh, so basically, if you're in the middle of a debugging session, you can actually go and um, search uh, for different levels of all of the variables that you might want to get values for. So you can basically kind of search on possible expressions that you might want to evaluate in the debug session. Um, we have a lot of new diff like refactoring features. So one of the big uh, capabilities that we've introduced is um, code cleanup. So you can actually kind of go and, you know, if you have style guidelines with an editor config, which actually can be inferred using IntelliCode, um, then you can actually go and just hit a hotkey, Control K, Control D for most people, and it'll it'll clean up that entire file. Um, so there are tons of goodies like that. But we also didn't even talk about kind of deploying to Azure, right? So um, or to Docker or containers or Kubernetes. So a lot of kind of what we've also been working on is making making it so that you know cloud native applications are super easy to author with Visual Studio 2019. That's cool. Yeah, because I mean, we can write all the code we want, but if it falls in the forest and there's no one around, <laughs> does it even make a sound? It's, we got to put it in the cloud, right? A question for you, when will the Python tools in Windows version land in the Mac version? Uh, no ETA yet. Um, I think we're definitely listening to, to feedback there, interest. We have the ability to add new languages and uh, we're doing that all the time, but uh, you know, Python's not, it's not on the immediate, uh, Delivery, but, but hey, reach out to me, yeah. and uh, I would love to hear how you how you want to use Python. If enough people yell at Joseph, that makes it happen. I'm just saying, we had donuts here this morning because we all yelled at Joseph. <laughs> all right, from uh, Evan, how do I get the new colorization of the text in VS 2019 if the installer is automatically importing my 2017 color configuration? So, uh, so I. This question is slightly ambiguous. I will answer it in two ways, kind of assuming that it's two different questions. Um, so one is, uh, I spoke a little bit earlier about the theming updates in Visual Studio 2019. So that, uh, if you're using the default light theme, then that, you'll just automatically get the default light theme. You can always go back and reset your settings for, a th for the theme and kind of set it to the default light theme and then you'll get those new kind of color options. That doesn't necessarily impact your, your text editor options um, because if you have your own custom settings for what you want your, your editor to look like, then that will override what our, theming, our default theming does. And so for that, you'd have to go into tools options and reset. basically reset. Yeah. So we care more about what they set in there as opposed to what we want. Yeah, because there are a lot of people who have very particular <laughs> uh, preferences. True. Or I, I saw somebody, I think this was an April Fool's joke, but I saw somebody yesterday who was talking about the hot dog theme <laughs> that they'd like to set on their uh, colleagues so that uh, basically it's a red background with yellow text. Oh. Uh, so if somebody I, steps out without locking oh, their machine, oh. they, they do that. So. <laughs> that would be, I would spill my drink. <laughs> oh, I'm just saying. Uh, from Sander, is there an option to show the current solution in the title bar? I believe we had it before. Yeah, so um, there actually is uh, an option to go into tools options and reset the title bar back. Oh, so just a lot of resetting then if you want to go in there. Uh, here's a question. Will live unit testing be available in the professional edition? No. Uh, live unit testing is a feature that's exclusive to Visual Studio Enterprise. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, from Ilias, are you planning to work on improving development and debugging experience for Microsoft Dynamics CRM? Now here, this is an interesting question because when people ask this, I feel like they're like, you're, there's like 10 of us here at Microsoft and we're all like talking to each other. Why don't you describe like what it takes to build something like this? Because every, everyone's going to have a question of, are you planning to work on Foo for Visual Studio? Why don't you describe this process? Um, sure. So the dynamic CRM, I mean, this is this is a little bit of kind of insider baseball, but the dynamic CRM team is obviously a different team than the Visual Studio team. Uh, and while we collaborate with each other, it's, you know, we're not sitting in the same room, we're not, not sitting in the same building. Um, sometimes we're pretty far away from each other. So while we might talk every, you know, couple of months about kind of what needs to happen, uh, we're not not talking all the time. Um, and actually the dynamic CRM ex like development experience uh, that's in dynamic CRM is part of the dynamic CRM product, not the Visual Studio product. Mm -hmm. um, they have some extensions for Visual Studio, 
Um, so, you know, all of the debugging improvements that are in C Sharp that, that would show up there will show, you know, show up in Visual Studio would show up for Dynamic. Having said that, though, tell us what you want. Yeah. Like, like if, if someone comes and is like, hey, we really want this Foo product to be super good in Visual Studio 2019, we will go talk to whomever about whatever. I mean, you saw that in the keynote. Yeah, and it's also super important that, that if that's really important to you, that you're also giving that feedback to the Dynamics team. Awesome. Oh, and I, I, I went moved this one away. This is from Starling. For you, what's the main improvement of Visual Studio 2019? I, I know we kind of harp on it, but if you could condense it down to one thing, what would it be for you? I think the thing that pe most people are going to mo notice are that streamlining theme. Um, you know, and that I would include performance, UI improvements, the search experience, um, things like that, that will basically just make you feel like you are sailing through code. That's awesome. Joseph? Yeah, I mean, same. So it's snappier, it's, uh, you're getting to code quicker. Get to code, that's the most visible thing, right? Uh, improve Git support, um, and uh, yeah, you, you'll, you'll definitely feel it's, you know, it, it's, it's a new, it's a new idea. It's new. There's it's shininess. New. new is nice. I love it. Uh, from Dimitri, any news about Visual Studio extensibility in VS 2019? So what we've really been working on uh, with the ecosystem or in the 2019 era as we've been developing it is basically getting more things um, out, of, out of process and asynchronous. And so that really is, is improving the reliability and the performance of the core Visual Studio product. Awesome. So from Arwin, just to let you know, he installed the absolute minimum with no workloads. It's 2.5 minutes for him. I think that's what I said. Yeah, is which, is, said? which is awesome. Like, <laughs> we have community validation that this is actually the right thing. I just want to make sure that you knew uh, that. Uh, does VS 2019 have an ARM template validation and improved intelligence? Now, ARM template, I'm assuming they mean Azure Resource Management, Manager template. Yeah, so I, um, that's actually a highly requested feature that we're looking at for the next, you know, next semester, basically. Cool. Yeah. So here's a, a question about, because they're so excited. Actually, this is, there is an answer to this question. Any idea about when will the IntelliCode be available for VS Code for C Sharp? Um, so the IntelliCode, uh, IntelliCode itself is actually something that's available for Visual Studio Code, yeah. and it's it's actually the same extension for any programming language that you're programming in. So if you're doing Python or C Sharp or um, TypeScript down the road, like then it will just automatically pick up um, which programming language you're you're programming in, and then kind of um, the completion list will start to show up. Cool, and, and it's so subtle that you may not even know that it's it, just look for the little star. Yeah. Right? Because sometimes I, I miss it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the one I want. Ooh, good. Yeah, that was a big debate. We were, we were trying to decide if we should actually distinguish the IntelliCode recommendations or just change the reordering. Um, and in the end, we decided to include the star just so that you know kind of what's coming from there. Because otherwise, I think you probably wouldn't notice. Yeah. And you'd just feel more productive, but you wouldn't really know why. And not only that, but I feel like when it comes to AI things, we need to be pretty upfront that it's being generated by AI. Yeah, I agree. And a star is really good for that. Okay, so from uh, M. Kenyon, the second, what changes have you made for deploying to Docker, VS You mentioned something a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, so we've actually uh, improved a lot of the ASP.NET kind of publish experience, so you can actually go and, and deploy directly to a Docker container. Um, you know, we've made it easier to kind of discover a D Docker container that you might want to attach to, things like that. That's awesome. So next question, is there an integrated console in VS 2019 like code? Great feature in code, we'd love to have it in VS. I think what he means is an integrated terminal, yeah, term terminal yeah. experience. So one of the things that uh, actually this came from LiveShare, when we found that people were collaborating, a lot of times the issue of like the bug repros on your machine but it doesn't repro on my machine mm -hmm. are actually due to environment setup and configuration. And the only way to kind of go figure that out is to actually go and get terminal access to the other person's machine. And so via LiveShare, we kind of came, we, we increased the priority of an, in introducing an integrated terminal in uh, 2019 mm -hmm. for the purposes of LiveShare. So now it is there. Cool. So that was a good answer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, from Ishan uh, uh, Bhutani, how has VS 2019 improved over VS 2017 in performance parameters for low configuration devices? And I, I, maybe they mean like not so powerful machines. 
Yeah, um, that's a great question. I haven't looked at that that specific question, kind of those dimensions, super recently. Um, so I don't know. I can't just cite that off the top of my head. Um, I, I couldn't speak specifics, but just to point out on the, on the Mac, I run a 2013 MacBook because the keyboard works great. <laughs> oh, snap. And so, like, you know, at least on that side, I know that uh, our, our improvements are uh, working great on, on older hardware, very visible. So That's cool. Well, we have about two minutes left, and so if there's any other questions that come in, I'll make sure to grab them. But what's the takeaway for people? What do you want them to do? What do you want them to tell us uh, if they're experiencing, what, about their experience? Because, like, I... I'm a programmer. Usually, I've learned over the many years that if some if a customer says, "Yeah, but can it also?" it means that I did the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the big thing is go install Visual Studio 2019. It's safe to install on your machine right next to 2017. You can open up your projects and start working on them. Um, and I think if you're encountering any kind of issues or have any kind of feedback, you can always go up into the right-hand corner with that little. Uh, that little message box, and basically send us a message of feedback uh, to our dev community. And, and we look at those. It's not like a... We look at every single one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I know that one of our, because I work in the cloud advocacy group, one of our people put it in and they got like an email. Yep. Like, I, I, like every time I do stuff you know, at Microsoft, I get an email from someone. They're like, hey, how was your experience? They don't know who I am. Yeah, I mean, we definitely use like, uh, we use, uh, software to actually detect duplicates and things like that. And so if we find that it is a duplicate, then we might kind of resolve it and say, hey, this is a duplicate. But if it's something that's a suggestion or if it's a feature request or you know something like that or, or an issue that you're encountering, then that will definitely be looked at by, by a person on our team. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. It is time now for us to uh, check in with Jeff. Jeff, are you there, buddy? He's right. Oh, we're not checking in with Jeff? Okay, that's okay. He's running. I saw him grab his hat and run over there. I think his beard turned white after that. <laughs> Pretty excited about that. Uh, we have here, uh, to my left, Kendra Haven is going to be talking about all about writing beautiful code faster. How are you, Kendra? I'm doing good. How are you, Seth? Fantastic. Now, for those that are watching, make sure you uh, send in your questions because we'll have a little wrap at the end, okay? Definitely. All right, let's turn it over to you, my friend. Okay, so welcome to Write Beautiful Code Faster with uh, Kendra Havens. Yeah, that's the title they made me use. Good stuff. <laughs> um, so first off, I really want to talk all about the .NET productivity improvements in Visual Studio 2019. A ton of those start with UX and shell. So first off, side-by-side -side installation. I know many of you might not be totally ready to make the jump switch entirely to 2019, and that is absolutely OK. Because with the Visual Studio installer, you can have multiple versions of Visual Studio 2017 right next to 2019, both installed on your machine. You can switch back to 2017 if you run into any issues and use 2019 for all of the projects that, um, yeah, that you absolutely can. Uh, OK, so as soon as I open it up, you might see, notice the difference. I'm in the blue theme. It's a little bit more purpley, as I like to describe it. Um, Amanda was just talking about some of the UI changes you might see. Um, one of the biggest, most useful productivity tips I want to call out is control Q search. So uh, we had this in 2017. It was actually off to the right just a little bit. We've centered it, so it's, and we've indexed way, way more in it, and we've enabled this fudgy uh, fuzzy searching. So let's say I'm trying to uh, open up the start window and I can misspell it as star widow and uh, I can actually still go ahead and launch it. So um, Pratik was just talking about um, getting to code really quickly. Um, so we have kind of simplified the experience uh, and you can still see all of your most recent files uh, and that's what I definitely use the most. Uh, more things that you can do is like adding items from control Q uh, as well as always uh, looking up different code style options that you may have. So I'll be using this a ton throughout the rest of uh, my demos. Um, so a major thing that we wanted to, speaking of it, add, speaking of getting to code fast is uh, we have enabled a way to load solution filters. So let's say you're working on a project you're working on a subset of code, 
you don't want to load the entire solution, only a few projects, you can actually unload certain projects in your solution. So I've unloaded my test, right click on the solution file and save it as a solution filter. And I have one saved already that I can go ahead and open up. So I, it saves as a .slnf file. And when I click on it, it only uh, loads the projects that were loaded when I saved that solution filter. So that is a huge deal for enterprises with hundreds, maybe even thousands of projects in one solution. We're not here to judge uh, your architecture decisions for sure. Um, <laughs> so it's a great way to uh, open code really quickly. Really excited about solution filters. Um, I think uh, Amanda just called this out in the Q&A, but you might notice that these code lens uh, references are now showing up in uh, co the community. So um, you can yeah, get references, you can get your um, Git history, you can show like authors and recent changes. Code lens is super useful. It's su a super good um, just a prompt for, for learning a little bit more about your methods and the code that you're working in and helping you learn more context. So you can edit what code lenses appear on your solution. All I did was um, in Control-Q search, I typed in code lens and I have everything enabled because I want to know as much as possible. Okay, so and that is in community, so yay. Um, another thing that is New in Visual Studio 2019, which is a huge reason to upgrade, is per monitor awareness. So it used to be when you launched Visual Studio on your laptop, laptop and you dragged it to another monitor um, because you're living that blessed multi-monitor lifestyle. Um, Visual Studio wouldn't always resize correctly. So now we're much more smart about um, adjusting fonts for high resolution, which is absolutely wonderful. Okay, so next off, all of the tooling improvements we have in Visual Studio 2019. So first off, new classification colors. Um, you will notice your editor is much more colorful. So keywords, uh, and I just mentioned this in the keynote, so I'll recap just a little bit. Keywords, user methods, local variable names, parameter names, and overloaded operators are all getting new colorization. And you can actually customize these colors if you don't love the ones that we chose for you. So I'll go ahead and go to fonts and colors. And again, I just use control Q search. I didn't need to go through environment and find fonts and colors and all of that. And uh, if I scroll down to user members, there's my properties um, and locals and um, constants and all of that I can adjust myself. Um, speaking of weird hot dog themes, <laughs> no, uh, as we were developing this, a lot of people were excited to see um, uh, statics were bolded in some of our first iterations. We got a lot of pushback because it was just jumping out to too many people. I was definitely one of the people where I was like, whoa, statics, why are you yelling at me? Um, so, but if you really did love that, you can still enable it because all of these are extension points that we offer for you to customize because we definitely want to be a platform and not make all of your decisions for you. So um, yeah, that's a new one. Uh, so Allison will be mentioning even more about IntelliCode. You've seen a lot of IntelliCode excitement so far in the keynotes. Um, I can totally uh, use IntelliCode all over my project. Um, it's an extension. We're hoping it will soon be on by default at some point, but uh, you can go and grab it at aka.ms slash IntelliCode. That'll bring you to this page. It works for multiple languages, as Allison mentioned. Um, and it offers smarter completion uh, for doc completion, smarter overload suggestions, uh, and it learns from your context, which is super helpful. It even indexes things that like newtonsoft.json is not a Microsoft library. It's a super popular NuGet package in the community. Um, it still learns what suggestions are most popular in certain situations. So we still have deserialized object being offered here. So super excited about IntelliCode. Another thing I'm really excited about tooling is, oh, I'll go ahead and reload my test project, is for SDK style projects. So using um, so .NET Core um, projects or um, .NET Framework adapted to the SDK style, you can simply double click on that project in the solution explorer and it opens the CS, CS project immediately. We are 
so far away from the good old days of um, having to right click and unload and edit your CS Brudge. Whew, just a simple double click. Awesome editing experience for CS Brudge. Um, it is all about the little things trying to make uh, your experience better. Uh, another thing about the CS Proj is uh, you can now find CS Projects in uh, Go to All Navigation. So I can type Go uh, Control T, and that's how I can get to files, members, recent files, um, or my particular favorite navigation. Um, and now we also index CS projects. So any files within those, um, we even show a preview. Uh, so if I closed out of that, and I think retype here, it will so show CS project in your little preview window without fully opening the file. Pretty sweet. Okay, so speaking of being able to uh, find code quickly, um, we added a new category into our find all references. So um, I, that's shift F11, or you can right click and find all references. We added this kind of category, category that categorizes references by um, the reference type. So read, write, name only. Um, and you can actually filter all of these to, for example, only the right references. So you can see everywhere that this particular variable is being written to, which is very helpful. Super, super big ask and totally new in 2019. Um, and I am excited to show off the uh, search local and watch windows during debugging, but I'm actually going to leave that for Leslie that has a talk um, later in the day. So stay tuned for more debugging features. Really excited about that. Okay, so I mentioned um, in the keynote a little bit about code style and management. So let's dig into that a little bit further. So um, many of you may be familiar with uh, adjusting code style through your tools options. So you can scroll around, you can set your prior pre preferences to um, prefer var or explicit type, and uh, you can set the severity of this as well. So something new in 2019 is being able to generate your editor config file from these settings. So I have one generated here. Um, and this is where I can manage all of these settings. So if I went and looked up my var rules, I can say that right now it's um, actually preferring the explicit type because it's set to false. Um, and I can go ahead and change it to a suggestion and we can see it impact my code. So here I'm using var in my test project. Um, I can go ahead and select all matching using shift alt dot and change that to a suggestion. That's multi-cursor by the way. Um, if any of you were like, oh yeah, shift alt click or shift alt dot to um, insert at the next matching. Very cool. So now when I go here, I am now getting these dots underneath my var. So the code fix for this is um, going and, and changing it to explicit type, but let's say I want to do this for my entire file, and I want to go ahead and fix some of my inconsistent spacing. I have curly braces sometimes on the first line, sometimes the second. I want to apply all of my, ref my formatting fixes and my code fixes all at once. I can do that using code cleanup. So we added this little broom icon to the bottom of files. So I can click it to execute code cleanup, which is control uh, K, control E, or I can go and configure code cleanup. And here I can actually specify what fixers I want code cleanup to apply. So here I can apply implicit explicit type preferences. So I promoted that to be associated with uh, my code cleanup profile. So this is just deciding what fixers exactly are associated with uh, a certain keyboard command. So if I apply control KE, it fixes all of my spacing and it changed uh, my vars into explicit types. Cool, and uh, another thing I wanna call out is, so we have a lot of asks for code cleanup to be able to work on your entire solution. We are working on that. 
We also have a lot of asks to have code cleanup somehow work on the command line so people might be able to check it into CICD. Um, right now, we do have a .NET format global tool that will apply formatting options. So not all code style fixers, um, more like white space fixers. Um, the curly braces would be a good example of that or um, having space in between um, the parentheses of a parameter or of a method. Um, you can hook up the .NET format global tool right now to your CICD pipeline. So it'll do some formatting, not all code style. We're still developing the area and we're really open to feedback on it. Cool. So next I'll move on to .NET refactorings and code fixes. So I have a ton to get through. Um, let's see how fast I can go. <laughs> So first off is sync namespace and folder name. So a lot of people have been really excited um, in requesting that one. So if I went ahead and dragged my emoji test.cs to my home controller, um, so I just changed its containing folder name, right? If I now go to my namespace and hit control dot, which is the trusty uh, keyboard shortcut for accessing all of your tooltips and light bulb suggestions uh, for wherever your cursor is. Um, I will get the suggestion to change my namespace to my folder name. Boom, so now it's in the home controller namespace. And this will also change all of the references um, to this namespace and update all of them as you would uh, sort of expect. Okay, so in the keynote, I was super glad they got this in. Uh, we have convert for each to link. So you have um, the link query body, or you could also use the link uh, method syntax or the call form. So it's all in one line using a Lambda. Very nice. Um, we can invert conditionals. Uh, so right here, oh, I can tell you what this app does. And actually, I can go ahead and run it. Um, so this app grabs all of your tweets that you're currently uh, making on Twitter, and uh, it runs it through Azure Cognitive Services to get the sentiment score. And uh, when I click Analyze here, it will give me back the scores along with the tweets. We also have this ability to analyze the average, so it kind of totals the average sentiment for each user. Just pretty nice little code. Um, Tweets are very important to me, obviously. Um, so here is where we gauge whether or not the tweet sentiment score qualifies as happy, sad, or indifferent. So um, I have some conditional operators here. And maybe I want to, this to read happy, indifferent, and then sad. I can go ahead and hit control dot um, after I place my cursor right next to a logical operator. And it will invert that condition. So it didn't actually change the meaning of my code, um, scores that are still less than 0.3, we would qualify as sad. Um, and above that was indifferent. Um, so it just changed the way the code is written. So nice little refactoring to have. OK, another ask that we uh, was very popular was being able to not only extract your interface, but extract your interface to the current file. So um, I can access this by hitting, putting, just placing my cursor in any class. And I can hit Extract Interface. It opens this little dialog. And now I have an iEmoji search interface. Um, and Emoji Search is implementing it. But what if I meant to add more members and to that interface? What if I added some to um, my type and I actually want to promote them so I can use them in other places this interface is inherited? Um, I can do that with uh, Pull Members Up. So I place my cursor in any of the members, and I can pull members up to a base type. So it reopens that dialog, and I can go ahead and select all the members, and I can pull them up to my interface. So handy dandy little uh, refactorings uh, that we offer now. OK. So here I have a super long list of parameters. Right, It goes all the way off the page. I'm uh, looking at multiple different emojis. A uh, new refactoring we're offering is wrap indent every parameter. So I can do that here. And now I can actually read not only my list of string, but my string text. So pretty helpful there. 
Um, okay, and let's say that this is another very popular refactoring. Um, I'm trying to type out a function that I know I have the dependency installed in my project, but I just don't have the using statement. So here I'm trying to call newtonsoft.json. I get an actual code fix to add the missing using. So I can add using uh, newtonsoft.json, pop that at the top of my project, and now I can get all of the IntelliSense that I actually wanted for it. Cool. And um, let's see. So going back to my emoji search class, I wanted to call out that the regex I have here, you may notice it's getting some colorization. That's because we added regex language support in Visual Studio 2019. You even have brace completion in some, uh, or sorry, brace detection in some uh, error messages. And um, it can, so it can sense when you're missing something or you mistype something, because let's be real, uh, typing regex is hard enough, so <laughs> we're trying to make that a lot easier for you. Um, you may notice I'm getting some warning text here. So I never actually use this variable, and I'm also reassigning it in some place. So I'm getting two different um, code fixes here. One is to remove the redundant assignment. So that's what I'm getting um, dots on. So when I take that, it eliminates one assignment that I never used in my code, and the warning is for because I never actually use this variable at all. So now we have dead code analysis that will actually see um, what variables you aren't using and what you can erase. So this will definitely help you clean up your code. All right, so that's not even all of our code fixes and refactorings. There's definitely way more that I wanted to show off. Um, you can find the complete list in um, our release notes. Uh, as, along with our blog posts as well. We have another one coming out today. Should be really great. Um, so, yeah, Q&A. <laughs> Are you ready for me, Seth? Let's do it. Man. Okay. I love, I love Q&A. Hold on, they're going to probably get my mic ready. There we go. I can start to hear stuff. There we so, go. So, here's the thing that I love about uh, Visual Studio is how productive I am with just autocomplete. If you could summarize, like, the top three things that 2019 years, like you should totally look at this because oh, there, yeah. I feel like there's so many hidden things like the editor config stuff you were doing, some of that stuff when you went into like deep into the menu system. I was like, right. I've never heard of that. Like what are the top three things that people should look at? Okay. First off, I really love IntelliCode. <laughs> I won't stop talking about it. It's totally Allison's thing. She'll talk about it more later. Yeah. Um, but that smarter completion is so key. We ran it over 2,000 open source GitHub repos in order to train this AI model. It's super cool. Um, yeah, so I'm just like, my mind is kind of boggled. Um, I started in, what, like 2014 was right. my first internship. Mm -hmm. I did not know computers would making, we'd be making my coding experience so much better at this yeah. time. And, and you know, I've been doing like just autocomplete for so long that now seeing it being even smarter to me is, is super cool. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we want to make sure to get your questions in. So I'm going to get them right here as I as I get them. Uh, here's one from Mike. Great VS 2019 presentation. Where can I find the code to your Twitter sentiment analysis you showed during your presentation? Care to share? Sure. Um, s some of the emoji search classes and that kind of stuff I added myself, but um, generally there's a great tutorial on Twitter sentiment analysis um, that you can find um, in our Azure Docs. I'll try to figure out the link for it and tweet it. Awesome. We'll make sure to put it out there for you. Uh, from Travis, uh, oh, I know Travis. For oh, code hey, Travis. cleanup, how do you <laughs> configure it to run Roslyn Analyzer fixes like those found in StyleCop? Would love to have one click member reordering and spacing fixes. Sure. Um, so a lot of the style cop analyzers we have implemented in our Roslyn analyzers repo. Um, so this is a repository separate from what ships with the compiler um, because it offers a lot more suggestions um, than we want to have on by default. But if you want to go and grab that NuGet package, I think you'll get a lot of uh, what you would normally see in style cop. Awesome. Not 100 percent, okay. but a lot of them. Okay, so uh, yeah. enough of them, right? Let so us know. <laughs> can, you, can you show me one more time because they something happened with audio when I was outside. I want to see the menu where you were changing a lot of the coloring. Can you show that? Because I, oh, I want to yeah. be able to get to that again when I go back. So let's go to our screen if we sure. can. 
So it's super easy to open. You use Control Q and just type in fonts, right? See, like that's the part I missed because the thing is, you gotta I gotta use search. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I this is the problem that I have. Like I saw, I, I was walking by because I'm gonna be honest with everybody. I went to actually grab a donut, but don't tell anybody. Because okay, it's our I secret. But I saw you were in this menu changing very specific things, and you can see it on your screen right now. If we go to the screen. And I always, like, I have a hard time, like, finding the right thing. Why don't you, like, impress upon me, because I, I need, like, the impression here <laughs> stuck in my head. What kinds of things can you search for when you're doing search? Um, so all of our uh, menu commands used to be the only things accessible through search. And now we have things like adding certain NuGet packages or adding, like, a project new file in search as well, as well as a ton of stuff in tools options. And not... Everything in tools options is there. Um, it depends on, yeah, how we tag it when we sure. check in. But we're trying to add more and more. And if there's something that was really difficult to find, please let us know. Yeah, absolutely. You can let us know. Actually, I'll go ahead and call out this little guy at the top that Amanda was talking about. This is our little report a problem guy. And um, it'll take you to Visual Studio um, developer community. And uh, you can go ahead and report a problem there or suggest a feature. And we will absolutely go through it. Awesome. And I think I think the challenge that I have is I'm stuck like in in this stage of Visual Studio where <laughs> like when I search for things, I'm like, I'm searching for things in a file. But that's not what search is nowadays, right? No, it's search yeah. for all sorts of things. Tools options, commands, NuGet packages. It's super useful. Control Q. Yes. Okay. So here is a question, uh, I think, from David. When you use solution filters and do a rebuild all, what gets built? Just the filtered projects or all of them? Do you know that one? Yes, just the filtered projects. Okay, cool. So you will still have issues if you have unloaded dependencies and whatnot. But if you don't have any, if you, all of the dependencies are loaded, it'll build just fine. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, we okay. figured that out at the MVP Summit when I didn't know, <laughs> so we tried it out. <laughs> He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure that one out. It's the same. Like, we all do the same thing, okay? From Jens, when you show new features, could you also state if they are in community? So all the stuff that you were showing, which part is in community and which part isn't? Do you know? Yeah, the biggest thing to call out, uh, everything? Yeah, everything I just showed was in community. So all the code fixes and refactorings and stuff, automatically in. Code Lens is now in community, Ooh, which we're really excited about. Hey, that's um, cool. Yeah, uh, editing project files, yeah, everything is just in there. What I want to do <laughs> now is we have a couple of minutes, and then as your questions come in, I want to make sure that we call out some people. Here's some people in Boston that are here yeah. that are watching. Look at look how cool they are. Thanks, Jim, for that. Hi, Jim. Uh, and I wanted to do a little. I wanted to do a little inception here. Mind blown. Hold on, let me let me line it up. This is cool. I mean, <laughs> can someone tweet a picture of this? Yeah, let, let me let me get in there more. so you can you can be ready. I'm gonna get the exact. Okay. All right, so they probably got it already. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, another couple of people. We have uh, people here in Minneapolis from Mike. I know Mike. He's nice. Look at them. This, they're all watching. And then we had someone from more far. Oh, here we are uh, from Denmark. The, you can see you there in the evening hour over there. Okay. A couple of other questions. When we talk about uh, Visual Studio uh, IntelliCode, they talked a little earlier about training a model. Can you show us where someone is? Is that, is that you? They're, that, they're doing that next, right? Is yeah, that, okay. yeah. Allison will be yeah. doing that they're, right they're after like, me. They're like over here. Which is good because I'm not sure. Okay. I don't have a good okay. <laughs> You got me. From Andre, <laughs> when adding a new file with search control Q, is there an easy way to tell the folder that I want the new file to be created in? Oh, I should just, I should make it big from Andre. Control Q. So you can make it. You can add new files with Control Search Control Q. Uh, it opens up the regular Add File dialog. Okay. So the same sort of input that. Let's see if I can add new item. Yeah. So it just opens up sort of the same um, page that you would see. And when I hit Add, ah, so it learns. Oh, that's right. Control Q actually is contextual for what you have selected versus like in the Solution Explorer or in your editor, which is also really trippy. I see. That, that's <laughs> kind of cool. It's like knowing. When, we're not even going to be able to code anymore if you people have your way. I'm just saying. <laughs> right? Yeah, Shoot. absolutely. That'll be really cool. So you're, you're saying that it opens based upon context. So someone mm -hmm. was very helpful. Let's do it. Let's yes. do a third one here if we can. 
Uh, just because we have another minute. Let me get in there here. Uh, just okay. All right. So uh, oh, I love the internet. Uh, thank you so <laughs> <It's> much. <great. laughs> all right. So hold on. Uh, thank you, Kendra. We're, we're all done. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. We're going to get this recorded and put up. I think we have Jeff available here. Let me get into inception pose for you, uh, buddy. Uh, so Jeff, are you there, my friend? Hey, Seth. Oh my gosh. I've got, I've got some folks that are called in to us right now from, from the other side of the world. I'm talking to Augustine out there in Mumbai. Oh my goodness. Let's go. Let's go. Hi, let's see if we can bring him up. Hey, hey there he is. is. Hey, Augustine, say hello. Look hello. at all the folks there in Mumbai. Nice. Oh my gosh. Hey, Augustine, what are folks really excited about that you've seen so far in the launch video? Hey guys, what do you find of existing or existing? I'm making a website. On, I'm deploying Man, it's just so much excitement over there. I can't even hear them in my ear. Uh, yeah, that's one of the good things. It's very fast compared to the last one. All right. Install. That's really useful for guys up here where the internet is a little bit shaky. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else? Less memory, less space, plus fast searching. So very hey man. Smaller Isn't install it? footprint, faster search. That is amazing. So there you go. There's the word from Mumbai. Thanks so much, Augustine, for uh, Thanks, man. for yes. letting us call All in. All right, let me go back to Seth. Hey Seth, how you doing? Oh man, I love seeing the excitement from folks all over jumping in and able to connect with us. Um, yeah, I mean I. I'm pretty excited. Like I said, I, Visual Studio has been my home for a very long time, and so I'm excited that we get to do this. But up next, I have here in my hands, warm from, the, warm from the printer. Yeah, we might get another subception later on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this away because it's slightly disturbing to some of our viewers. Uh, we have our stream... Streamline your dream dev team with Allison and John. How are you, my friends? We're great. Oh, wow. Fantastic. So why don't you introduce yourselves, and then we'll get into your content. Cool. So I am Allison Buchholz Al. I am the program manager on Visual Studio IntelliCode, and we will show you how to create your own custom model very shortly. And I'm John Chu, a program manager on the Visual Studio LiveShare team. You can also refer to us as hashtag sharepair because we've decided that is our duo name for all the talks we do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are we ready to get going? Let's do it. All right. Cool. So uh, hot off that question from Kendra, we are going to talk about Visual Studio IntelliCode. So I hope all of you tuned in to our keynote this morning and got sort of a preview of what Visual Studio IntelliCode is. But for those of you who might have missed it, Visual Studio IntelliCode uses machine learning and artificial intelligence in order to superpower your developer productivity. So we heard for years that intelligence is great, but isn't there a better way than alphabetical, right? Yeah, there's like, got to be. There, there has to mm -hmm. be. Uh, so what we did is we scanned over 2,000 open source repositories, and we took that wisdom of the community and put that all together into IntelliCode to give you better suggestions. So let me give you a quick example right now off my machine. So if I have you know, some test variable here, and I'm just going to make it a string, and if I do test dot, you'll see that I get these starred recommendations. And it says, hey, given this context, this is probably what you want right now. Now, if I give it a little bit more information and make this a string array versus just a var and activate IntelliSense again, you'll notice I get slightly different things. There's link, there's clone, there's get linked. It's slightly different. And if I do an if statement, ooh, that was unexpected, but you know, live demo, it happens. If I do test dot, you'll notice I get yet a different set of recommendations, which is pretty cool. So this is, you know, just classic IntelliCode right out of the box. Um, I do want to let everyone know that IntelliCode is an extension still. You need to download it from the marketplace to get it to work in Visual Studio 2019. But we're just so excited that we had to share it with you guys and make sure you knew it was out there. But do install it. Uh, it is fully supported within Visual Studio 2019 and also uh, the latest update of Visual Studio 2017. Cool. So that's our base case. That works great. Uh, but we had that question about how do I train it on my code. So I'm using the same sort of sentiment analysis uh, solution that Kendra was using. And I'm, 
you know, writing this extreme love method here. <laughs> and what I want to do is go through our list of tweets and figure out, do people really love Visual Studio 2019? And the way I'm doing that is seeing if there are at least five heart emojis. So okay. if you want to show your love for Visual Studio, okay. I need to see at least five hearts. OK, guys? So <laughs> what I want to do is do ES, which is my custom class here. And you'll see this emoji search class doesn't have any star recommendations. Yeah, That's it's a custom class. It's a custom class, right. That's not in the open source. It's really sad. Um, so what I'm going to do is do Control Q, and I'm just going to type IntelliCode. This is the easiest way to find the IntelliCode model management window. I'm going to hit Enter, and it's going to bring this up. You'll see here it's got some information about custom models, and I'm just going to click train on my code, and it's going to go away. It's learning my code patterns right now, and then when my model is done being created, it will give me those starred suggestions, which we're so excited for. So obviously, there's a lot of really interesting machine learning going on right now, so we have to be patient, but it will all be worth it. Um, <clears throat> so what about if I'm working with a team and they want to get the starred recommendations from the custom model? Right. So if once we have our model here, you'll actually be able to share that model. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll see here, if we move back to my screen, our model is done. You can actually hit share model right here. Uh -huh. We've got a link copied to mm -hmm. the clipboard, very similar to live share. We took some mm -hmm. inspiration from you, John. Um, and I can just send that link out to my team. And I can go ahead and click add model here and paste that link in and get that model lickety split. Nice. So now that we've got our model, I'm going to go back to my best tweets. And I'm going to activate IntelliGoat again. And you'll see that, in fact, I get the starred recommendation, which is awesome. So I'm going to count the emojis. And another great feature that we just released for IntelliCode is argument completion. So if I am here within my count emoji method and I do control space, which activates the argument completion uh, window, you'll see that it gives me starred recommendations Whoa. for my argument. So I can do heart, comma, activate it again. There's my test tweet. It's pretty much just activate, IntelliCode, enter. Like it's, it's typing it's it up for magic. you. It's getting it's the code for you. Me. So as I said, I want at least five hearts in here. And then if that tweet does have five hearts, I want to go ahead and add it to my list of best tweets. So best tweets dot add. See, there it is. Don't even have to do anything. Test tweet is exactly what I want. And our method is done. I like Perfect. didn't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. It's pretty great in my opinion. So that's IntelliCode. Um, and now that we've got that all ready, you know, this test has been a little finicky. I want to go ahead and debug it, run it again, see what's going yeah. on. It's Just a to demo. Make sure before you commit it. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I know you and I have been running into some some weird issues this morning, right, John? It's funny so. how that keeps happening during these demos. <laughs> it, you know, it gets better. Hopefully, mm -hmm. yeah. maybe we just need to, you know, ask the demo gods a little bit more <laughs> to be kind to us. So, in fact, uh, when we debug this test, it does not seem to be passing, unfortunately. Okay. But you're our exception expert, right? Yeah, I got you. Okay, cool. So I'm going to start a live share session with you. I can see in the top corner here that it says, cool, I am now shared, and I am going to send this over to you. Hope you're ready on Teams, John. Perfect. So I can actually go onto my side, and I see that I got your message on Teams. You can see that we actually use Live Share a lot. And I can click <laughs> on that. Clicking on that will actually open my browser, and it will see that I have the Live Share extension installed on my IDE. And I can actually launch Visual Studio 2019. And one of the really cool things about LiveShare is now that it comes in box with Visual Studio. Um, so like if you install it with um, supported workloads, you, you get it in box and you can start sharing with your teammates. So with LiveShare, you're able to get real-time collaboration with your teammates from the comfort of your own tools. So you don't have to configure it. You don't have to clone repos, recreate the environment to be able to work together with your teammates. Oh, that's awesome. So do you have any like workloads downloaded on your machine right now, or is this just like the core editor right now? Yeah, so this is the core editor. And what's the, ma the beauty of LiveShare is that it's all forwarded over from your machine to my machine. So I don't have to be able to set up, I don't have to set up any of those workloads to be able to collaborate. Additionally, so let's go into a split screen. Is that you'll see on my side that I'm in the blue theme and Allison is in the dark theme. 
And you're able to work in the editors or your IDE and tools, whether it's Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. And you, ha you can have them configured however you want. And you're able to collaborate without having to change it to be able to do that. So it's font sizes, themes, um, high contrast, anything that you need for your editors. And as you can see, once I joined in, I actually saw the solution explorer <laughs> for um, the solution explorer for my project. Yeah. And yeah, so you, you can actually see the solution explorer from, my, from Allison's project. And as I can do that, I can expand the projects. I can see the files and folders that are going on inside of that, um, that inside of the project to be able to explore around. And additionally, um, as I saw um, with Allison moving around in the project, I saw her cursor. As I highlight, you actually see on her screen my highlights going on. And additionally, um, as well, uh, she sees it on hers as well. Cool. So, yeah. so do you get solution view in VS Code as well, or is that a VS specific feature? So that's a VS specific feature. And that's something that we heard a lot of feedback from like during our preview for LiveShare was that a lot of Visual Studio users wanted to see solution explorers to be able their solution explorer view to be able to collaborate with their teammates properly. And that's something that we built based off feedback. Cool. So yeah, so now that we're in, I saw that you were typing. Just to show, I can type as well and we're able to work in that way. So tell me, what's going on with this bug? So before I get to that, I just got this notification here in the bottom that uh, someone tried to join as read-only. Someone's trying to crash our session, oh. it looks like. <laughs> um, but read-only sounds really cool. Is that mm -hmm. a, a, a standard feature of LiveShare now? Yeah, so read-only is actually another piece of feedback that we received from the community wanting to have read-only for guests to be able to join in. So this is the case where you want to start up a session and maybe you don't want, uh, maybe you don't want people to make edits and you just want to show something off. Maybe you're giving a lecture or you're giving a brown bag to your team and you just want to show off the code. You're able to give, start a read-only session and have people join in as well. That would have been really useful for me in college, John. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really wish you had built this like six years ago. Mm -hmm. It would have been super helpful. And then I wouldn't have needed to trek across campus <laughs> to help all my students. Yeah. It's so helpful now, especially since we're, we collaborate so much on these demos and we're able to just work in our own editors wherever we are, across the team room, on different floors of the building, from home, wherever it is oh, you're working. That's true. It was really mm -hmm. great at our last conference where we mm -hmm. could be in our own hotel rooms and not have to find yeah. some weird middle ground. Mm -hmm. oh, exactly. I love live share. Okay, cool. So this test here. Um, it looks like the specific emoji null test was failing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to take a look at it here. I think something might be going on with specific emoji. That would okay. make sense because of how the test is named. But yeah. you're the expert here, John. So I'm going to let you figure mm -hmm. out what's going on. Yeah, so what I can do is I can actually explore around in the project to be able to get that context. So you said it's something with specific emoji. So mm -hmm. if I right click on that, I can actually get language service navigation to be able to go to definition. And that's actually forwarded over from your machine to mine. Like I said, I don't have any of the workload set up. I don't need to have .NET Core or ASP set up on my machine to be able to do these navigations. And I move over to emoji search. I'm going to follow you just so I can keep yeah. track of where you're going. So yeah, so as you saw, Allison clicked on my avatar in the top right corner, and it followed me to where I'm at. Additionally, if I were to scroll, it would scroll on Allison's IDE. And we're able to move to different files and be able to guide someone as you're talking through a problem. Cool. So yeah, so let's, looking at this, um, we navigated to specific emoji. And um, one of the things that I can do is that I, when, before I try to fix this, one of the things that I think is really cool that I wanted to show off was if I start typing match, oops, <laughs> dot, I actually get start in IntelliCode you know, suggestions based off your language service with IntelliCode. I don't have IntelliCode installed on my machine, and this is being forwarded over from your machine. Thank you for supporting that, John. Mm -hmm. The Visual Studio IntelliCode team really thanks you for that. <laughs> we, we appreciate your mm -hmm. support of IntelliCode. Yeah. Um, cool. So on this side, uh, what I can do is I think I actually know the problem that's causing this test to fail. So I can, right -click, I can click on here and see that I get refactorings as well. And I can add a null check as well. What? to be able to add that in, and it should actually help fix the test. Awesome. So let me set down a breakpoint to be able to debug this. So when I set down that breakpoint, you'll actually see on Allison's machine that the breakpoint is synced over as well. I can see that. That is pretty awesome. All right, are we ready to debug this test again? Yep. All right, let's debug that test. Cool. I'm getting uh, the output here, which I also mm -hmm. believe you're getting on your side. Yeah, and I've actually seen the build output, and my debugger has started because both our machines are starting debugging, and it's actually attaching to the running app on your side. That's crazy cool. And yeah, we actually stop at that breakpoint. 
amazing. Great. So since it's hitting that, I think it's probably, probably working. And additionally, as you can see, I have the locals, I have the call stack. I can independently inspect to be able to debug an issue. So I can expand them, figure out what's going on there. And additionally, we can negotiate control between the two of us to be able to, let's say, um, step over or, or whatnot to be able to control the flow of debugging. So let me step over. I can find the button. <laughs> step over, and it actually steps. And we can actually see that it hits the, it, it hits the, it, it throws the exception Which as expected. We expected. Yeah, and then you can hit continue as well. Let me find my continue button. You know, yeah. it's always hard when we're on mm -hmm. smush screens sometimes. Yeah. So but. if you open up your side, let's see if the test actually passed. All right. Indeed, we've got that shiny green check mark. So nice. thank you, exception expert John. Perfect. So one last thing before we do this is that. Um, this is a test, but sometimes you're working on web apps, and you want to be able to see the front end to be able to figure out whether or not a bug you're working on or something you're programming on is actually working. Mm -hmm. And for that, LiveShare enables you to share your servers. <sighs> okay, so should I should I start this Yeah, up? so how about we try debugging as well? Okay. Just Classic debugging the full debugging. Mm -hmm. so Yeah, we see that the debuggers are started, and that on your side, the your browser has launched, and actually on my side as well, the browser has launched as well to be able to, it's loading the app. Um, with this, your local host is, my local host is mapped to your local host. So whether you're working What's with mine a, is yours. Yeah, exactly. So whether you're working with um, web apps, you're working with DBs, or you're some REST API, you're able to share the server for the port for that, ser the port for that server that you're working with, oh and you're able to share that with your guests. That's so cool. I mean, this is obviously a you know it's a pretty simple demo app here, but the fact that you can see it and mm. interact with it is it's pretty darn awesome. Yeah, and it's showing up on both of our screens. Yeah. Although yours still apparently one still I seems think you to need be to loading. Oh. oh, oh yeah, it's still. Let's see. Is it over here? No. <laughs> well, apparently something has it's frozen, but window. you know okay, I can yeah. guarantee y'all on my screen. It shows <laughs> that it is there. But really, it's more important that John has it because yeah. he's the one seeing it. So yeah, so as the guest, I'm able to get the, get the context of the app and being able to work from the comfort of my own tools. Oh, so cool. And the applicability of LiveShare is that it's not just one-to-one. -one. It works in many different ways. As you're able to independently navigate, you're able to be synced with each other however you want to be able to collaborate. LiveShare <laughs> supports that. So maybe you're a classroom. And with LiveShare, we support up to 30 guests joining in. It could be all read-only, or you could do some mob programming to have 30 people coming in and typing all together to create a project as well. That sounds a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to like selectively promote someone from read only mm -hmm. to read write and back? Like mm -hmm. I could see that being really useful in a sort of mob programming sort of style. Yeah, yes you can. So if you start a read only session, when you have guests join in, you have the ability to promote them to read write mm -hmm. and you can turn them back into read, read only as well to be able to have that control. So maybe you're giving a lecture and you want to be able to have a student make some changes, so you promote that student to be able to have read write, and then after that, you turn them back into read only. Oh, wow. That's, you know, I really wish mm -hmm. I had had this in college. So I feel so like helpful for I would have been students. such a better programmer mm -hmm. if I had had this then, and yeah. a better teacher. Yeah. Um, so yes, cool. cool. So I think we actually fixed all the issues that were going on with your tests. I'm feeling good about yeah. this solution so now. Let's get you ready for that pull request. And cool. one of the last things with LiveShare is that in addition to co-editing and navigation um, and servers, you also can share terminals. So what Allison can do is she can go in and she can share a terminal. Cool. So again, if I don't trust you, I could do read only and here, have you check it. Here, let me show your screen. Let me let me show you going full screen. Cool. All and right. I think I know what the issue was. It was on my machine. <laughs> oh well, okay. So yeah, so on Allison's machine, what she can do is she can actually pull up a, a terminal and she can share it with me. Cool. So I'm going to do read write because I trust mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I trust you not to mess up my hard drive. So yeah, and you'll actually see on my side that a terminal pops up as well. And what I can do is I can type commands and they, as how they would execute on Alice's machine as well. So we can type dir. I can see how that executes. And so you're able to run commands as, as you would as a guest to be able to help figure out like maybe some command line issues. So I can help you with um, setting this up and pushing this. So I can do git add dot. Um, Very cool. Oops. Ah. <laughs> I know it's hard to type when I know. people are watching you. 
Awesome. Cool. Oh man, you just pushed that. Just yeah. didn't even wait, just went for it. I got Full you. I, I'm very confident in the changes that we made. All right, sounds good. I know there's a lot of people mm -hmm. who are hoping for this repository, so mm -hmm. I hope we didn't mess it up yeah. at all. So yeah, so after this, what you can actually do on your side is you can actually go and create a pull request with this using the GitHub, GitHub extension for Visual Studio. And for more info about that, for creating pull requests and working with them, tune in later for Stanley and Steven's session on Git, the GitHub extension. Yeah, so they're going to go you know, really in depth on how you can be more productive with pull requests. And we just wouldn't do it justice in the time we've got exactly. left. So on that cliffhanger, we'll leave you guys to wait for how you do pull requests in VS yeah. a little later on. It's a cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. <laughs> Are we cool. ready for questions? We, yes, we are. are. Let's see. My, oh, I see lots of hearts, and I'm very excited right my now. My goodness, I'm excited. So it looks like this inception thing kind of took <laughs> off here. I'm a little concerned about that myself. Uh, so let's go through some questions. I have 47 new posts. Uh, here's, here's some good questions, and we'll go through all of them as fast as we can, because I want to make sure we get to everyone's questions. We'll talk what, fast. What is the limit of concurrent users for live shares? Not too fast. 30. Concurrent. Yeah. 30. So we support up to 30 guests joining into a session. OK, 30. Yes. What happens on the 31st? Do we do like a sad panda trombone? <laughs> you get a notification that you're at the, that you, they're not allowing any more guests. Awesome. And the support for up to 30 is, an actually, is actually a setting that you can set in the tools options to be able to have increased guest limit. OK, cool. Uh, so you can have, it's just 30 is the max for, for mm -hmm. all of it. OK. Yes. Unless you tweak something, right? That's the, that, yeah. that's the max. It, by default, it's five, but uh, we have a setting to go up to 30. Got it, got, got it. it. And that's really cool, like you were saying, for classroom type settings mm -hmm. where it's like, because you know, sometimes I have a hard time paying attention. Mm -hmm. I was going to say in class, but I took that <laughs> off, right? It'd be cool, like if I'm in there with the professor, like, because I used to teach, and, and having like the little bar that says student foo is on this line. Mm -hmm. And then they highlight, like, well, what part don't you understand? And everyone highlights the same thing. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's also great. Like, I remember, you know, maybe I wasn't the best student and I was sitting a little far back from the screen, you know, sitting in the, the back rows. It's really hard to see code yeah. being projected mm -hmm. that far away. Um, and I can only imagine if someone needs high contrast or larger fonts, mm -hmm. being able to have that on your screen with the way you like seeing something is, is invaluable. Like, like it would have been great. But it's much easier to pay attention. I feel like I wished I could have had this. <laughs> we uh, all do. From Eric uh, Blanc, how do how does region handling work with live share? Region handling. Hmm. Region handling. With region, so in terms of if you have like a cursor on the same line, um, so I'm I'm gonna guess that might be the case. So since this is all real time, you're uh, if you have both users typing, you would be able to see both of them mixed in together on that same line. If you're on different lines, it works just out of the box with that. Awesome. So this is an interesting question that speaks to what machine learning actually <laughs> is, yeah. which is super nice, right? Why would string.length be the first suggested item when it is a getter and we are not assigning a value nor doing a comparison? Now, I think we need to clarify that it's not like, well, why don't you tell us? Yeah, so I think it's important to realize that IntelliCode learns from what we call the wisdom of the community. So. Um, there might have been cases where someone is using string.length in this sort of weird way. Um, it also picks up, you know, when we did our custom model, it picks up on things in the solution. So maybe I had a few not so uh, popular ways of using strings uh, that are very prevalent in my solution that aren't in the open source one. So machine learning is is, is ambiguous sometimes, right? Uh, it's still learning, and we are trying to figure out the best heuristics to give you the best suggestions possible. But it's still in preview, it's still learning, and uh, if you find that usage really strange, like give us feedback so we can help tune our model. Yeah, and I like how you said that. It's We are not explicitly programming this. No. It's not like it's we went It's a suggestion. Yeah. It's a recommendation. We're not always going to be right, and we don't expect to be right all right. the time. What we do hope is that one of those top five suggestions is what you want most of the time. Got it. Is it possible to use Live Share LAN only? <laughs> live, live Share use LAN only. So, um, so in the case with Live Share, if you're on the same network, it actually forms a peer to um, a, a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection. If you're on different networks, it uses an Azure Relay to con communicate. So if you're on a LAN, it's able to, to communicate directly. You might need to configure that, right? Yeah. If you want to make well, sure you're mm -hmm. not using yeah. cloud environments. So there's a setting that you can go into to ensure that you're using direct connections rather than, or instead of like an automatic 
But by default, we try to find the we try to do a direct connection by default. Awesome. Next question: How will live share handle sessions between VS 2019 and VS 2017? It works perfectly. You're able to work between these different editors. You can work between Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Any mix of that, if you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux, any combination of that, you can collaborate for any number of collaborators as well. Man, there, we have like yes people today. I love <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, from Dijon, can you have live share work on multiple VS 2019 instances and thus different projects at the same time? Is it server port dynamic? So which firewall ports need to be open? It's There's like, a lot to it, write down. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's, I feel like they're getting into like, oh, I've got to write this down because they, they want to use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for this one, yeah, you can have multiple instances of LiveShare up on, on a machine. I, we, I've actually done this a couple times where I'm testing with LiveShare or where I can have multiple people joining into a session, but you can have multiple instances going as well. All right, next question. Can all concurrent users at a LiveShare write on the code at the same time? Or is it limited to one user having writing rights? I think they're asking, can there be multiple yeah. writing people? Yeah, so by default, so in the case where like it's one person writing, that's if you had like a read read only session where you elevated someone to read write. But by default, everyone can come in and type. So we've seen some interesting use cases with like hackathons or mob <laughs> programming where a bunch of people come into a session to be able to build up all the bootstrap code or integrate everything and they can all type together. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is. Like and it and it knows like let's just say okay you write this function you write that function and it, it knows to move the lines properly I mean mm -hmm. it's co-editing right yeah. You're, it's it's taking all of that and putting it together they're all looking at me like man how old are you gosh <laughs> this is 2019 Seth from Vlak Vaklov how does live share work between different resolutions on both sides. So yeah, so this isn't this isn't screen sharing. So you're working from your own editor. So you you can use whatever resolutions that you're working with. So you can have very big font or on a small screen to be able to work with someone who's maybe on a bigger screen with really small font, and it works because it's configured to the way that you like. So it's and that's it's an important distinction, right? You're not sharing your screen. Mm -hmm. You're sharing the code experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the context of the code, not the screen. And so when you're loading it up, you're loading up your Visual Studio in your favorite way. Because mm -hmm. I, I always see, and, I, and now I understand why you do this on purpose. There's one like a dark theme one, and there's mm -hmm. another light, because you want to show it's, this is my Visual Studio, but in your context. Exactly. Yeah. If, we, if we could and we you know, had some, some more time, we would show you, you know, one that's high contrast with the mm -hmm. font way blown up. Uh, but that's really hard to give you nice context sure. when we're projecting like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Uh, next question from Amir, do you have to be online to train on your local code? Yes, so if we're training right now, you do have to be online because we use um, a service in order to actually train your code. I think it's really important to note, and we hear this a lot, that your raw source code stays on your machine. So we do um, this local extraction piece where we sort of understand the important bits about your code, but all your local code really stays on your machine. It's the summary file that ends up getting sent to our service that you do have to be online for, and then your model is sent back down, it's private to you, it's private to whoever you share it with. And then after that point, you can go offline because we keep a cached copy. And we will uh, use that cached copy if you're not online. Awesome. And if you have any you know, concerns or questions, tweet at me. I'm happy to hear what you guys need. I already know some people want full local experience, <laughs> uh, and we're evaluating that. Cool. Uh, what versions of VS 2019 Professional Enterprise support live share and IntelliCode? All, All of them! them! What? It's like, I almost feel like that was rehearsed. Wow. No. Really the like, share pair just yeah. does this share so pair. many times <laughs> that we, yeah. we just know each other like this now. Fantastic. Uh, how do undos work on live share from Jocelyn? So, so currently we support a, it's a global undo right now. So between the edits that you and your, and your guests or participants are making, if you were to control Z, you're undoing your changes and their changes in a stack. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So like if someone, like if I control Z, 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 I might like, mm -hmm move someone else's stuff out, right? Yeah. Now. That's it, cool. Yeah. Like, cause then, then I could like get into like a fight with someone and control Z them while we're, okay, I went too far. Uh, and from, then yeah. that's when they turn you to it's, read only. Uh, yeah. and oh, <laughs> that, that's right. It's one of you those are things, yeah. Cut off. <laughs> uh, VS 2019, in what way is live share better than working in Skype with a shared desktop? So yeah, so, um, with one of the things, there's always a case where you're wanting to do screen sharing. So in the case where maybe you want to have more individual control, or if you're, if you're screen sharing, you're in lockstep. So you're having to have someone who's always driving at one point. 
But with LiveShare, like, so like you would have to hand off, say like you want one person to drive, move the mouse, you have to hand that off. But with LiveShare, you're able to be independent while within the same code base. So you can be in different files, different regions of the code, so you're able to work at, the, at your own pace and the way that you think within the code as well. This is cool because I, like for some reason, I thought of it as like a, we're screen sharing. It's not. You're mm -hmm. basically, you're project sharing yeah. in Visual Studio. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right, now I understand. Thank goodness it only took a half hour. Okay. <laughs> uh, from Hugo, with VS Live Share, when I run the format code feature, whose rules will it follow? Holy cow, so, they're like, oh, well, first what, off, what will it is do? Is format code a command that's available to the guest? We can check this right now. It would be, um, let me hear, let me introduce an error. Hold on. We're going to do this live. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Here I've just taken away a semicolon. Okay. And All right. I see so this error. It does not look like format code is mm -hmm. being ported over. Uh, so a guest cannot uh, run the format code. Um, my expectation is when John eventually supports this, ideally, <laughs> it would run the host machines, right? Because remember, the host machine is what's powering everything. Right. And so. Uh, you can think of any guest Visual Studio as sort of a window into the host machine. And Got so the it. host, I imagine the host machine's rules should be run. But if any of you have strong opinions on whether yeah. that's right or wrong, that's definitely something you should weigh in on. Yeah, that's definitely something that we've had a lot of conversations with, and we want to continue hearing that, is about getting that right with like which settings from who wins out in during a session is definitely an interesting thing that we'd love to hear more feedback about. Well, we are almost out of time, and so the last minute. From Maximilian, what are the limits of live share VS 2019? What are the limits? Uh, what are the limits? The sky is the limit? Yeah, what? exactly. I, Whatever you want to do with I, your code with your teammates, you can do with live share. I feel like, like <laughs> seriously, I feel like I just like lobbed it up to you all. This is a, and then you spiked it. Good job. All right, coming up next, we have squash bugs and improved code quality with Leslie Richardson. We're very excited to toss it over to her. How are you doing, Leslie? I'm good, how are you? Fantastic, take it away, my friend. Awesome. Well, as Seth just mentioned, I'm Leslie Richardson. I'm a program manager on the Visual Studio Debugging and Diagnostics team. And in this session, I'm gonna show you how to squash bugs and improve your code quality with some of the brand new debugging features available for Visual Studio 2019. So let's start. So performance is always a big deal, no matter what version of Visual Studio that you're using. And we've read through your feedback, we've listened to your feedback, we've implemented a lot of that feedback, and as we continue to do all three of those things with your feedback, here are some new debugger performance updates that we've made. First up, most Visual Studio windows are now asynchronous, so for instance, if you're waiting for something to load in the watch window, then you should still be able to interact with the editor, the call stack, the immediate window, any of those windows that you've come to know and love in Visual Studio. Because most of these windows are now asynchronous, UI delays in those windows are down by more than 70% as a result. Stepping is now faster than ever, with block time being down by more than half in comparison to what it was in 2017. And last but certainly not least, uh, we've made symbols out of proc for C++. And what that means is if you are a C++ developer who tends to debug really big apps, say maybe a video game, then you should now be able to debug those applications without experiencing constant memory-related crashes and errors that you might have experienced previously. So to demo this, I actually have a video of Gears of War 4, and it's being debugged initially in Visual Studio 2017. So this is obviously a huge application to debug. It's a full-blown Xbox game, right? And you're probably thinking, well, that probably consumes a lot of memory while I'm debugging it. And sure enough, it does. If you were to open up your task manager and zoom in on the amount of memory that it consumes, it's a lot. It's <laughs> nearly two gigs after just five minutes. So you can probably expect to see some lovely error messages regarding the fact that you're running out of memory. In contrast, if you debug that same application in Visual Studio 2019, you'll notice that the amount of memory being consumed is significantly lower than what it was in 2017, being at around 400 megabytes after five minutes. So that's a really big reduction in memory consumption. So if you are a C++ developer debugging those large applications and you're kind of on the fence as to whether or not you should make that leap from 2017 to 2019, then this should be a huge incentive for you because in some cases you might actually be able to debug those applications for longer than just a few minutes or in some cases 
cases just simply being able to use the debugger at all, which you might not have been able to do previously. So also new for C++ is a feature called Just My Code. And this was something we introduced late into Visual Studio 2017. But this is a feature that, when enabled, will let you automatically step through code that's not yours. And that can mean anything from framework code to third-party library code, or maybe one of your teammates has pushed some code into the same repo as you, and you're just not interested in debugging it because it's not relevant to you. So the GIF on the left illustrates just my code when it's disabled. And as you can see, this user's stepping experience is not a good one because <laughs> they got caught down that uh, rabbit hole of having to step through a bunch of framework code in order to get back to the code that they actually care about. And in contrast, just my code is enabled in the GIF on the right, which showcases a stepping experience that is a lot nicer. It's a lot more efficient because this, you're only able to step through the code that is yours. So it's also great because it minimizes the thinking overhead that you might have to do when you don't have just my code enabled. So chances are you might have experienced that, it, that time where you're cautiously trying to step through code that's yours and you're worrying about, okay, well, if I step in here, does that mean I'm going to enter some weird framework code that I don't that I could care less about, or if I step out here, does that mean I'm going to miss out on something else? You no longer have to worry about those things when you have just my code enabled. And if you wanted to take it a step further and actually pick and choose what gets considered by Visual Studio as non-user code, then you can edit the .NET JMC file that's available in Visual Studio, which will allow you to pick and choose which modules, files, and functions that Visual Studio deems non-user code. So enough of the slides, now it's time for the fun part, which is demos. Now for the remainder of this session, I will be using Visual Studio 2019. And I'm also going to be using a, an ASP.NET Core application. And it simply gives me a list of random books that I can choose to read. And if I choose to read the book, it should add the book to my shelf. And if I choose to not read the book, it won't add the book to my shelf. Or at least it's what it should do, because right now I'm noticing that if I choose not to read the book, it's going to add it to my shelf anyway, which I don't want. So there's something going on. So my first theory is that there is something that is modifying my shelled books list. And this is the list that stores all the books that I want displayed on this particular page. So something is being added to it without my knowledge in a spot that I'm unaware of. So let's try to go into Visual Studio and try to figure out what the issue is. First thing I'm going to do is set a breakpoint at the start of my application. And this will just hit after I refresh my application. And now I want to hone in on my shelved books list, because I think that's where the problem lies. And that is an object that is listed under this book manager object, which I already have in the watch window here. And typically, I could just expand this book manager object and then scroll down to find the item that I want. But instead, I'm going to use the brand new search tool that is available for the Watch, Locals, and Autos windows, which is brand new for 2019, and search for it instead. So we're going to type in shelled books and hit Enter. And voila, I get what I'm looking for that much faster. So using search is super nifty, especially if maybe you have a list that's containing hundreds of items in the Watch window. So instead of having to play the scrolling game and having to constantly expand each individual object till you find the one that you want, you can search for it instead, which should save you a lot of time. All right, so now that I've found this shelved books list, now what? In this case, I am interested in finding out when something is being added to that list. And to track that, I can use a new feature available for .NET Core called a data breakpoint. Now, if you're a C++ user, you might already be familiar with this, because this is a feature that has existed with the C++ debugger for a while now. But data breakpoints are essentially breakpoints that will allow you to halt your code when a specific object's property changes in memory. So I'm going to use one of those in order to hopefully discover when this shelved books list is being updated. So to do that, I need to access its count property. And I'm going to use search again to find it, because it's buried somewhere in that object, I'm sure. And I'm going to bump up my search step to four so I can search a bit more thoroughly, since the count property is nested somewhere inside shelled books. And now that I've found it, to set a data breakpoint, I can right-click it, select break when value changes. 
and I'll know that a data breakpoint has been created because I get the standard breakpoint icon next to the property. I can also check on it in the breakpoints window, just like any other breakpoint. And if I scroll up where in, at the object containing that particular property, an object ID has also been created. And this is how Visual Studio will be able to keep track of what's going on with that object if it ever goes out of scope while my program's executing. So now that I've set the data breakpoint, I'm going to continue running my code. And hopefully, I'll get some more useful information the next time I perform that same action. So I'm going to choose not to read this book again. And this time, I get a really nice notification telling me that my data breakpoint has been hit. And as an added bonus, it will tell me what the previous value of my count property was and what the new value is. So in this case, my list has increased from containing one item to two. And once I hit that data breakpoint, I will be redirected to the exact line in my code where that change occurred. In this case, my shelled books list is being added to under my add rejected book function, which is really weird because last time I checked, I when I choose to reject a book or not or choose not to read a book, that book should be added to my rejected books list, not my shelled books one. So I might have just found my problem. So I'm going to stop debugging and change shelled books to rejected books. And that should fix the issue. But just to double check, I'm going to go ahead and run it again. Now currently, data breakpoints are only available for .NET Core 3.0 and higher. So if you're using um, .NET Core 2.1 or 2.2 or an earlier version, then you're going to need to make the leap up to uh, 3.0 in order to try this feature, which is um, 3.0 is currently under preview. So definitely go give it a try. Take a minute. All right. So hopefully this time, when I choose not to read the book, it won't be added to my shelf. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. So that was data breakpoints for managed code, um, brand new for managed code. Super cool. I just used it in the instance where I wanted to find out when something was being added or removed from a list. But another way you can use it is maybe you have a global variable that's being accessed across multiple files and multiple functions. And if you wanted to find out where a particular change is happening, then you can simply use a data breakpoint to quickly locate where that's occurring, especially if you don't know the extent of all the things that are accessing that particular variable. You can also use it in the place of a normal breakpoint. Let's say you set a breakpoint on a property setter. So you can do that to kind of emulate the idea of a data breakpoint. But keep in mind that if you do that, you might have hundreds of objects that are accessing that property, which, that property setter, which might result in you having to spam F5 or continue in order to continue writing your code because that breakpoint gets hit so often. So if you feel like you can address uh, that similar problem just by honing in on one specific object, then data breakpoints are the way to go. So now that I've finished debugging all this locally, everything checks out with this application. So I want to go ahead and deploy it and then put it in production. In this case, I've already done that. And I've deployed the same application to an Azure VM that I have. Only this time, I'm noticing that if I go to the page that is supposed to recommend lists of books to me, I get a lovely little book placeholder here with no title and no author, and it doesn't sound like a very good read. <laughs> so what's going on here? Because I'm pretty sure this worked perfectly fine when I was running this code locally. And this is a problem that you've most likely experienced if you've ever went and deployed an application and stuck it in production, right? Where your app is working perfectly fine as you run it locally, but then the moment you scale it or ship it for the world to see, things are going wrong. Now, the initial ways to try to solve or diagnose these problems might be to um, create a repro locally. But that could be tricky, depending on the complexities of your application. Or maybe even just go into some logs or dump files in order to find the issue. But some of those logs might be insufficient. Maybe there's a specific piece of information that the logs just aren't giving you in order to solve your issue. So the next two features that I'm going to address to hopefully alleviate those problems 
are Visual Studio Enterprise exclusive. So if you've decided that you're all in on everything Visual Studio has to offer and are an enterprise user, definitely try out these next two features because they're super useful. So in 2017, for Visual Studio 2017, we introduced the feature called the Snapshot Debugger. And this is a debugger that, when you attach to it, will allow you to debug your code while it's still running in production with minimal impact on the end user's experience. So I'm going to try to use the Snapshot Debugger in order to get to the bottom of this problem without having to halt my VM or anything like that. So to do that, I'm going to go up to Debug in the toolbar here, locate Attach Snapshot Debugger, and then under Azure Resource, I'm going to select the VM that I that is currently hosting my application. And this is actually a new feature for a Snapshot Debugger for 2019 because in 2017, the Snapshot Debugger was only compatible with Azure App Services, but now we've extended it out so that um, Snapshot Debugger is also um, compatible with Azure VMs and Azure Kubernetes for Linux Docker containers. So in this case, I'm going to be using a VM and I've selected my storage account that I want to use. And if you haven't remote debugged before, then you're going to need to install the remote debugger extension. Otherwise, you can skip that step. And I'm also going to check this feature called time travel debugging, which sounds pretty cool. It's got that time travel buzzword that I like. And normally, this would be the moment where I select attach. But because it might take a minute or two to initially attach the snapshot debugger, I actually have another instance of Visual Studio 2019 that's running the same code with the snapshot debugger already attached. And you'll know that you've attached successfully if you end up on this snapshot debugger landing page here. OK, so let's get to the bottom of this problem. So I'm thinking that a placeholder book is being created right now because the JSON file, which stores the contents of all my book information at the moment, isn't being loaded correctly. So to test this theory, I'm going to set what's called a snap point instead of a breakpoint at the line that loads up that file. And you'll notice that it's a hexagon instead of a circle, and that it's hollow. And that's because I need to upload that info to the cloud, which I can do by selecting Start Collection. And as you can see, it's gone from being a hollow hexagon to a solid one. And what that's doing is I'm telling Azure, hey, the next time I interact with my application in a way that causes that snap point to trigger, and I want Visual Studio to take a picture or a snapshot of the state of my application at that particular line. And to trigger this one, all I really need to do is refresh my application. And this time, you'll notice in the Diagnostics Tools window here, I got a snapshot that corresponds with the snap point that I set. And in order to further inspect all these variables and utilize some of the debugger functionality, I can select View Snapshot here. So this might take a minute because uh, we're, 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 still rem we're still remote debugging, debugging, so I need to attach to several processes. But at the end of the day, the important thing is that the user can still interact with this application even if it, um, well, to some extent anyway, can still interact with the non-problematic parts of the application while it's, and be none the wiser about the fact that you're trying to diagnose some problems. Also, what's great about Snapshot Debugger is that it is uh, supported for applications that might be widely distributed. Let's say you have an app that's working, that's running across multiple servers, then you should still be able to use the Snapshot Debugger without having to halt any of those servers in the process. All right, and as you can see, my snap point has been hit, as indicated by this pinkish execution pointer here. And uh, you'll also notice that I can utilize the locals, watch autos windows, or any of the other debugging windows as if I were debugging the same application locally still. So in this case, if I hone in on the autos window, I notice that I have this absolute path variable here, which that doesn't sound good if it's what I think it is. And sure enough, if I check out the string, that is stored here, 
it is in fact an absolute path that is being used to access my JSON file. So I don't want to be using this absolute path, which is obviously not going to be accessed since this app is currently being hosted on my VM instead of my local environment now, nowadays. So for future reference, I need to remember to change that to a relative path or store that info in a database somewhere for later. So what if I actually want to get some additional log information right off the bat that tells me that a placeholder was being created because that JSON file was being loaded incorrectly or just not being loaded at all. So to address that insufficient log problem, I can use what's called a log point instead of a simple snap point. And these are kind of like trace points, if you're familiar with those when debugging locally, in that they allow you to print things to the output window, or in this case, app application logs, in the event, or without having to modify any additional code. So to do that, I can set a snap point here, go to settings, and then under actions, and message, I'm going to just print out a simple message. In this case, I'll just say book not found, placeholder created. We're going to hit enter and X out of that. And again, I need to update my collection to send that info up to the cloud again. And I can trigger that log point by refreshing my app. And this time you'll notice that in addition to the two snapshots that correspond to the two snap points that I created, I also get log point info, which I can view in the diagnostics tools window that gives me the error message that I wanted it to that I wanted it to print out a minute ago. Pretty sweet. So from there, though, what if I actually wanted to be able to step through my code? What if there's a particular method that I wanted to view how it's being executed while running in production. So before 2019, the only way to really do this was kind of to emulate it. And to do that, you'd have to set multiple snap points everywhere and then navigate back and forth between the snapshots that get created as a result and then inspect all of your variables that way. But that's obviously not very intuitive. It's not necessarily the most efficient way to go about it either. Like, why can't we just <laughs> step regularly, right? So for 2019, we've introduced this additional feature called the time travel debugger. And this is a tool that expands upon snapshot debugging by allowing you to step through your code. So let's try to use that on a method that I'm interested in. In this case, I want to hone in on my get book, get book placeholder function here, because I'm curious to see how a book placeholder gets made. Now that I've gotten that, I can set a snap point at the start of this function, hover over it and select settings again. And we're going to go into actions. Oh, and going to minimize this a little bit so you can see it. All right, and then I'm going to check the option that says collect a time travel trace to the end of this method. So what this means is that when this particular snap point gets hit it will record the entire execution flow of this method while in production. So now that I've updated the collection again, I can trigger it by refreshing the page. It might take a little longer to do that this time because we are recording this entire function this time. It's not just, it's not just one line. All right, and here's the snapshot that corresponds with the snap point here, and we're going to select view snapshot. And again, this might take a minute, but at the end of the day, much like snapshot debugger, the user can still play around with the rest of the app while it's still running. So another thing to note about the time travel debugger is that it's still currently in preview mode. So that means you might experience some weird quirks here and there if you start to play around with it um, as of this particular point in time. But just know that we are working to further improve and update and expand upon it in later updates for 2019.
It's trying. You can do it. Well, it's taking a little longer than usual, so at the very least, I can kind of describe what's going on with it. So think of it as being able to, once you record your method, it's kind of like being given access to the remote control uh, to your TV and then being able to fast forward or rewind or step by step check out and analyze each and every line of code that you have. And you can move, you can step forwards through it, you can step backward through it if you're familiar with step back if you're also an enterprise user. Um, step back is another tool you can use and uh, while debugging locally, for instance. It's kind of similar to that, but with a bit more control. All right, well, because I'm running low on time, unfortunately, I might have to halt it here. But just know that, again, this is a preview feature. It's really cool <laughs> when it works. And um, definitely try giving, giving it a try, but just know that we are going to improve it upon it in the near future. And for now, that kind of concludes my talk on some of the brand new features available for Visual Studio 2019 in the debugging space. So definitely go download 2019 and give it a try. And now we're going to open it up for questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Leslie. Debugging is hard. Yeah. Luckily, when I write code, I never have to debug because it, it's always perfect. <laughs> right? That's not even, that's oh, not even she's, like, she's like, I don't even know yeah. you and that. We know <laughs> that's not true. All right, just a couple of questions that we have. Uh, can the debug window uh, show a list customer entity as a table visual? Oh, good question. So currently, no, but that is something that we are considering in the near future. The closest we have is a data set visualizer, which is a class that you can use. And then um, you can use a visualizer similar to the ones that are listed here, except instead of just getting a text string, you can view the whole table in a tabular format as if you were in, a, in like Excel or something. That's cool. So. And I, you can make your own visualizers too, because I made one one time and I showed something really cool. It was, it was very exciting for just me because I was the only one there. Yeah. So from Tijani, do we have access to the reading list demo app? Uh, not at the moment, but I mean, I can provide access. I have it on a public Git repo, so. Oh, there you go, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, from Mike Simon, data breakpoints and watch local search may be my favorite features of VS 2019. Can you go into the call stack from the break? Yes, you can. So um, if you end up, there might be cases where you set a data breakpoint and it will immediately take you to just like the property setter, but that might not be entirely useful right off the bat, right? You're most likely more interested in finding out what called that particular setter. So you can go into the call stack afterward and it'll redirect you to the place that called it. Fantastic. During debugging, when I have a list of objects, I want to find the object having the property x equals value y. Can I do that in VS 2019? Uh, wait, I'm trying to think about oh, it. Oh, <laughs> I, I kind of like went away. Oh, no. here, here we go. Let me bring it up. There here you go. go. Yeah, when I have a list of objects, find the object having property x equals value y. Okay, so you want to be able to find a specific value yeah. that the property. Yeah, so if you use search, you can search for keywords across all three of those columns, so the name, value, and type columns. So as of right now in the search, you can't use logic-based strings like that, but at the very least, you can search for the property name or the value that you expect to see and find it that way. Fantastic. VS 2019, can you use the snapshot debugger with services running in AKS? Yes, you can. So um, as of 2019, we've expanded it out for Linux Docker containers in AKS um, currently. So any of the Linux types, so Ubuntu, um, the other two that I'm blanking on at the moment, but you get the idea. So um, for Azure Kubernetes, it's for Linux containers currently. Fantastic. So I'm going through here to see if there's, oh, there's five new, if there's any new 
Other questions, here we go. Will Snapshot debugger in VS 2019 allow to inspect C++ release executable in debug mode? Currently, no. So Snapshot debugger is only available for ASP.NET and ASP and .NET Core applications at the moment. Awesome. From Enrique, is this, is this time travel debugger also for standalone applications? Look by your explanation. Looks like you already talked about for Azure deploy applications. Yeah. So as of right now, it's um, exclusive for applications that were pushed to into blah, into the Azure space. So if you have your app running somewhere else, unfortunately, the snapshot debugger is not compatible currently. Awesome. And then we're gonna we're gonna finish up with this question. What about data breakpoints for Xamarin and other non.NET three core three project types? Yeah, so currently that's something that we're still working on. I I can't I don't have a concrete answer on the Xamarin part. Very good question that I can definitely get back to you on, but uh, for main.net core applications and ASP.net, C sharp, that sort of thing, it should work fine. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. This has been amazing. And I, what I want to do is I want to continue to shout out uh, people that are, this is from Germany, that are watching uh, in Germany. And Jeff, I believe you are on the line with somebody right now. Is that correct? Oh my gosh, Seth. We've been, we've been hearing from folks around the world and we reached out. We're hearing from our friend Mike in Minneapolis with a crowd there. Hey, Mike, how's it going with the crowd in Minneapolis? Hey. hey, Jeff, how's it going? Oh, are, are we excited? Are you happy with what you're seeing for Visual Studio today? Can we hear a little yes. bit of applause, a little noise? Uh, yeah, all right. So, so to the folks in the room, what are the features that you've been hearing about that you're most excited about from Visual Studio 2019? Fantastic. So we are really enjoying it. Oh, there's five new, if there's any new. We're really excited about all kinds of the uh, new stuff with what? The live sharing? Live sharing. Live, live, live share. Live share. All right. Intellicode, I heard some folks say. Intellicode? Intellicode. Yeah. And uh, Mike, love the throwback hockey jersey, Visual Studio hockey jersey. That's, that's some premium swag right there, man. Oh, yeah. Awesome oh, yeah. stuff. No fits. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. Hey, Seth, going yes, back sir. to you. Let me tell you, that's just another group in Minnesota that, that's enjoying the launch. And we've got some more folks we're going to be talking to in a little bit in between some of the sessions coming up. Well, I'm having a, an absolutely fantastic time. But you know, what I, you know what I always say, code isn't good until you ship it. There's even a book I read called Ship It. And right now, we have Taking DevOps to the Next Level with GitHub and Azure DevOps because Code is only as good as, as if you ship it. It's only good when you put it out there. It's no good on Visual Studio. And we have here with us Steve and Stanley. They're going to talk about GitHub and Azure DevOps. Thank you very much. Take it away, my friends. My name's Steven Borg. I'm on the Azure DevOps team. I'm Stanley Goldman. I'm on the Editor Tools team at GitHub. And just so you can follow along later, we've got a couple links, and you'll have access to these as well. But there's some GitHub repos. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. For if you want to reproduce this demo at home, we want to, you to follow along and see the benefits of this better together story. And in fact, that's where we are. We have the GitHub story and the Azure DevOps story, and it's it's better together. Let's start with DevOps. Let's start with GitHub. Sure. Tell me a little bit about why Beyond GitHub. Well, I mean, GitHub is the place where everybody goes when you think about open source, right? I mean, it's not gonna say it's the only place, but it's definitely the most popular one, right? Um, yeah, there are tons of open source projects built on GitHub every day. Perfect. And if you um, also, there's another platform, there's several platforms out there, and two of the biggest, GitHub and Azure DevOps, support that team development, that collaboration between individuals on a, on a development team. And we'll talk a little bit about delivering with the Azure DevOps suite of tools, which is several tools that work very well together to help build and deliver software. And as you'll see, they work very well with GitHub. But probably the best way to do that is really just to dive into a demo. What sure thing. Say? Yeah, why not? All right, let's pop in. I'm going to start off on the demo, and I'm going to show you the website that we're going to be using for the demonstration. And it's the uh, Contoso Air website. It's a fictional website, or fictional company, that you can buy airline tickets and travel all around the world for. And on the uh, site here, it's for the demos that we use, and you'll see that there's an awful lot of code and a little bit of foreshadowing here, some Azure Pipelines action going on as well. Cool. But we're keeping it in GitHub because we want everybody to be able to have access to this code and to use it for their own demonstrations on that Better Together story. Of course. 
So this is what it looks like. Here's Contoso Air itself, and we've got uh, evidently a little bit of an April Fool's joke going on here. We've got crawl, walk, run, and destinations you can walk to. It was April Fool's yesterday in America, and so uh, humor's hard. Yeah, it is. It's definitely hard to craft a good April Fool's joke. It is, it is. And so we're going to definitely need to remove this April Fool's joke right away. And that's kind of the, what we're using as the context of our Better Together story. So if you look now, you're going to see our Azure DevOps page. And I'm going to come in and talk a little bit about boards, repos, pipelines, etc. once the demo is complete. But to start with, Let's take a look at what we're trying to accomplish. And right here, we want to remove this April's fool, Fool's Code. It, 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 just, it just wasn't that funny. Mm. If, I, if I open it up, you can see qual, crawl, walk, run. Um, some discussions here. It just really, it, we need to move it back to something more professional. And this particular board is available to anyone on the planet. It's a public uh, public boards that anybody can see. And so I'm moving that over into this active column just in hopes that somebody anybody out there in that community is going to pick that up and work on it. Well, I just happen to be an open source maintainer, so I might be interested in giving you a hint. <laughs> All right. So let's switch over to my computer, and I am going to open up Visual Studio 2019. And from Visual Studio 2019, I can simply hit clone or check out code, head over to GitHub, and I believe I've contributed to a repository before, so if I start typing in your name, it should just come up. And there we go, Stephen Borg, Contoso Air. So I'm going to go over and hit clone. And so now what this is doing is it's just simply cloning it from GitHub, bringing it down local to your machine, okay. opening up in Visual Studio. Give me Visual Studio a second to catch up, and here we go. So we're looking at your project, and we're looking at Team Explorer. And this is Team Explorer with, now the Team Explorer sees that we have a GitHub URL. It activates the GitHub plugin. And some of our features show up here. All right, and you can see right here that this repo is being cloned directly from Steven Borg's uh, user account in GitHub. And so the first thing that I'm going to want to do if I'm going to make a change is fork the repo. Okay. Now, you've mentioned a couple things. Forking, cloning. Mm -hmm. Pull requests. Pull requests. Sure. Tie so, those together for me. Right. So in other words, in order to send you a change, I don't have access to your, I don't have write access to your repo on GitHub, right? But I can fork your project, so that way I can make the changes in my account and send you a pull request with those changes for you to review and accept into your project. Excellent. Yeah. Let's see it go. All right, so let's give it a shot. So I'm going to come here to the Team Explorer, and I'm going to use this fork feature that we added very recently. And I'm going to fork your repo over to my account. Now what's happening is we're forking the repo on GitHub. Also, what this plugin is doing for us, it is changing the remote, so that way the remote's origin now points to my fork. It also gives me another remote called upstream, which points to the original. And that's something I would have had to do myself right in Git if yeah. I didn't have the plugin for Visual Studio. Yeah, that's one of the things that we try to address in the GitHub plugin, right? We try to find those little workflows that make your life a little bit easier. But a person that's normally working would have to fork the repo, then go over to his remotes in Git, hopefully, well, well, well uh, versed in the git commands to do so, but they would have to do that themselves. All right. All right. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change to a new branch. So fix April Fools is what I'm going to name this branch. Now, if I remember right, the language changes were over in locales en, right? I believe so. OK, cool. So here we have destinations you can walk to, April Fools. So what should we change that to say? Something like your personalized recommendation. Okay, or cool. Something of that nature. I'm going to leave a misspelling there on purpose. Ah. <laughs> um, so crawl, walk, run, and this should say fly, 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 shouldn't it? Absolutely. We're all about the all about flying. Oh, I can't type right now. Of course. All right. Change is made. Now, this is a really simple change. I mean, we're just making some code changes. But the idea is that this change could be relatively complex. We could be crossing many code files. Yeah, yeah of that. course. I mean, right, this is just a simple <laughs> example, right, Hello, where, where the text isn't that much to change. So I'm going to commit my changes and push them. OK. So changing the text, I'm just going to choose commit all and push. 
Now that's pushing off to your repository, or is it? Yep. Do I see it yet? No, you don't no? see it yet. Okay. It's pushing to my fork and GitHub. Okay. Right. So now I'm going to from here head over to the GitHub plugin and create pull request. So I'm going to name this removing April Fools. And you were telling me about some way to link a pull request with an Azure board uh, item. Absolutely. If you simply say fixes a B pound sign and mm -hmm. then the identifier in our case okay. 443. All right. So um, let's that, that will link those two together. That's cool. And that comes out of the Azure boards integration. That's correct. GitHub, right? Okay, yes. cool. So fixes a B pound 443, you said? That's correct. All right. So create pull request. <laughs> Sometimes. There we go. And it shows me right there that I created this pull request in Contoso Air 8. And I can click to the pull request and I can see it's already created. And I got a little, I could feel a little vibration on my phone. I've got right. an alert that says, okay. hey, I, there's something new. Someone's done something. All right. So we can come back to my code and I can take a look at it. My machine, and we can take a look at it. Sure, let's go ahead. So I'm out on GitHub.com and I can see that I've got a pull request right here. If I open up the pull request, I can see a few core things about it. Here's removing April Fools. And as I open it up, I can see that it fixes AB443. Now I'm directly on GitHub, but if I click that link, it brings me over to Azure, yeah, Azure Boards. Yeah, That's yeah. cool. And I can see it, and I can see what it was resolving. I'll also point out that there's a link over here to the right. It's a GitHub link. I can see the GitHub logo right there. And it's that removing April Fools. So I can get right back to it. Now let me go back to my board, I mean my, uh, my GitHub pull request, and there's a couple things that are happening right now. That's the uh, Azure Pipelines logo. And yeah. from right here, you can see that Pipelines, I've got something going on, something cooking. And in this particular case, I have a build that's executing, and that build is going to run a bunch of tests, it's going to check for code coverage. Basically, it's going to tell me a little bit on whether your pull request is something I should take. Okay. It gives me just that, that the warm fuzzies right sure, off the get-go, right? So that check has, has, has started. But a couple things that I can do. I can, I can go in and look at those files changed, but I'm going to want to do that in Visual Studio. Yeah. If that's my environment. That's where I live day to day. So if I open up Visual Studio, I can go over to my pull requests and uh, refresh those, and I can see this removing April Fools, and it was submitted by you a minute ago. Let me jump into that. And from the pull request, I can stay right inside of my Visual Studio environment. So let's see the changes you made, see if these are any good. Sure. And I'm going to open up this JSON file. And I can read here, fly, fly, fly. Yeah, that's better than crawl, oh, uh, crawl, crawl, walk, crawl, walk, run. And your personalized recommendations. Ooh, a little bit of a misspelling there. I might just jump in and open this up and say, um, please correct the spelling of recommendations. And it's really nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it may be something. You, you're yeah. given this pull request. Just, of course. It's this open source community. I didn't give you permission to help me out. Of course. You just came in and did it yourself, and I love that. But I, it's a pleasure to meet you, but I'm still going to want to start this review. So I'm going to start a review, and I might make a couple other comments here. This fly, fly, fly. I might say, love it. Haven't thought of that before, and it's going to be our new logo. I love it. I'm going to add that review comment to the place. And I'm going to come over here to the right where I'm viewing my pull request, and I'm going to continue my review. Um, thanks so much for your help. A um, couple changes. And I'll submit that review, and I'm going to request those changes. Okay. Now, all of this stuff that I'm doing inside Visual Studio could also be done out on the GitHub website. Yeah. And it, it works, but this, I'm right here. I'm right. seeing my code. This is my code editor. Why leave way. Visual Studio if you don't have Why to? Why leave Visual Studio? Agreed. So now it's, it's back in your court. The ball's back in your court. All right. So now let's come over back to my screen. And I am going to go back to Visual Studio, refresh this pull request screen, and I can see that there have been some comments here. Right, and I can see that you've requested changes all from here. If I open up this file in the diff, I can see 
all of your comments in line. And let me fix that. So I'm going to hit Enter. It takes me right to the file. Delete that one extra M. Save. Spelling fix. Commit all and push. So it's being pushed up to GitHub. It's being added to my pull request. And balls in your court again. All right. Let's come right back over to my screen again. And up, up, up. There we got another vibration telling me, hey, I've got a pull request coming yeah. in. I changed the pull request. So if I open up the Removing April Fools and scroll down, I'm going to see a few things. Um, first, I'm going to see that this change here is outdated. This is telling me this. I can scroll down a little bit further, and I can see that hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> right. we have some comments out from some of the folks. From some Someone of the on the internet. <laughs> Again, we're wide open, right? Yes, of course. Thank goodness that was safe for work. For better or for um, worse. For better or for worse. Um, all checks have passed. I'm, I'm loving it here, but I need to review these changes. Now, I'm going to do this right here and go over to my files changed and see the difference now. I've got crawl, rock, run. That became fly, fly, fly. And um, we have some back and forths there. Um, we can see your personalized recommendations. And yep, it's spelled correctly. I'm going to resolve this overall conversation, call it good. And from here, I can go ahead and approve this review. Yep. I'm done. I like it. Cool. It's, it's good. Well, well done. Thank you. Well done out there. Thank you. So I'll submit that review. Now, some checks haven't yet completed. Now, sure. frankly, uh, I, I normally want to be patient. These things run in about a minute to two minutes to run all my tests, do all of my, both unit tests, analyze my code coverage, and publish out those details. Um, if I talk long enough, it'll, it'll update. But yeah. for our case, we have a code change I'm going to go ahead and merge that pull request. Also, before more people on the internet get to it. Right, exactly, <laughs> at this point. So let me merge that pull request. Um, merge pull request, and uh, let's confirm it. Yeah. I'll confirm that pull request. And at this point, it's now merged into my master. Now, this is a really interesting back and forth that happened. You had no access to my source code, but it's this collaborative environment that's out in the open. Yeah. Really. Yeah, we can collaborate out, clearly out in the open. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but too much sometimes. Exactly. So if I go over to my Azure team boards and I, and I look at my Azure team boards, what I'm going to find is that, that that fix, remove April's fool code, was automatically move, merv, merged and then moved into this remove April's fool code. Now, that wasn't funny. And I, could, I can move it over and I can say, yeah, that's, we're going to move that to closed. I may not want to do that quite yet until I verify that it's out in, in the, wild. the website, sure. out in the wild, exactly. So before I do that, I want to walk through some of the things you get with Azure DevOps. So you spend a lot of time on the really wonderful pull requests and the way people interact out on GitHub. And so now I want to come back and show some of the power of Azure DevOps and why you might want to use that as well. So on Azure DevOps, it's made up of several highly related products. Um, boards is one of those products. As you see here, it, it helps us connect these ideas to releases and lets us do things like Scrum and Kanban. It gives us a health of our, of our overall work. We've got repos, and that's free Git hosting, unlimited Git, and Team Foundation version control hosting for private repos as opposed to the public and private that you support. We have pipelines, and I'll come back to that in just a moment because that's a real nice integration to talk about. Um, test plans help us manage um, kind of our, our manual tests and our automated and our uh, uh, exploratory tests and, and collect enough data that we can reproduce those bugs. And artifacts helps us share code really effectively through things like NuGet and, and right. stuff like that. It manages a lot of different types of packages for us. Let's go back to pipelines. Because I think pipelines is important here. And on the pipeline side, we're going to see we've got a couple of things happening here. For a build, we've got a build that's currently executing. And that's that build off that merge pull request. Right. Now, not only did I want to check your pull request, I also, now that I've merged it in, I want to run that test again. Okay. So that's currently running at this point in time. And you can see that it's, it's running right here. We can drill in and see details about it. It's running on a Ubuntu agent. I can see some of the console um, output. Right now, it's going through um, component detection and making sure that, that uh, I've, all of my open source components are legit. Next thing we can see are releases. And I'm going to pop back to take it. We have this release is waiting. So oh, so you have it configured it. to deploy automatically it's for master. Yes, yeah, so That's anytime cool. someone contributes to master, we're going to go all the way through out 
and deploy it. And we're going to be able to run a bunch of tests and checks on that. Um, and the releases, I'm going to step back. It's still executing. But I can step back earlier and see some of the earlier ones. And we can see what happens to those. We can look at our logs, how we downloaded the artifacts from our artifact repository, pulled them all in, did the, com did the deployment out to the Azure website. Coming back to releases, let's see if it's uh, it's still chunking along. Of we're course. Not, we're not quite there yet. Right, because we're demonstrating. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's, that's all right. It sometimes it takes a little while to get yeah. that release out to production. So these are all the things that tie together. And then the last thing I want to show, two things. I want to go back to boards, and I want to open up that April Fools. wasn't funny. We open up that code. Once again, we have this link out to this removing April Fools. So we can go straight out and see that code. We've also seen out on GitHub that it's highlighted as an integration point. So I can click and come straight into it. If you want to set this up, very quickly to set this up, you simply go into project settings and set up your GitHub connections right with boards. And it's a very easy connection. Walks you right through a wizard where you have to provide your GitHub identity and where you want to connect in GitHub. And those will tie those two together. That's that, really that, cool. that kind of lights up that feature. And if you want the automated builds and releases and the pipelines pieces, that's right out here as well. If I scroll to the top, I can go to the GitHub Marketplace. I could also do it from within yeah. as well. But I'm going to come out to the GitHub Marketplace and search for pipelines. And right here are Azure Pipelines. And I can continuously build and deploy to any platform. Now, Pipelines is amazing. I just barely covered it a little bit. But um, it allows us to build and deploy off of a single configuration file to Linux, Mac OS, as well as Windows. Yeah. yeah. And it's any platform, any language, any cloud. It's not just meant to push to Azure, but it does it really well. Yeah, but, we can uh, see. But that's a misconception people sometimes have. It's a build and deploy system for pretty much anything. And it's best in class for open source. Since we're talking GitHub, sure. probably worth mentioning that if you have an open source project, you have unlimited minutes with pipelines. Yeah, you I've heard that. Build and deploy to your heart's content. Excellent. And that brings us right back to questions. Fantastic questions. First of all, I will tell you how I first used source control. I lost an entire folder of things like 15 years ago. <laughs> and that's when my love affair with Git started. Yeah. And it's continued ever since with GitHub. And so, yeah, please, like if the first thing you can do is put stuff in the source control, you should do that. All right, let's get to some questions. Uh, let's see here. Uh, there's a lot of live share stuff here going on. Here's one more post. So here's a question. One of the things that I struggle with mm -hmm. as a Git user is I'm terrified that I'm going to mess something up. <laughs> Tell me how the stuff inside of Visual Studio is helping with that a little bit. Sure. sure. Yeah, it's all yours. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, Team Explorer is a built-in part of Visual Studio, right? And it offers all the commit tools, the branching tools, pretty much a very good GUI interface to get. So you don't really have to mess around with the command line too much and possibly make a mistake. Yeah, because like, I, I remember like the first time I did the thing and every, you've all done this, okay? So don't, <laughs> nobody, where you're just like, oh, I'll just delete it and check it out again. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh -huh. Like, is, is this stuff in Visual Studio there to help us? Is it like the bumpers when I'm bowling? Is that what it's intended it, it to be? It definitely has bumpers. So for instance, if you go to commit and you haven't saved all your files, it'll actually actively remind you that maybe you want to save these files because you're committing. So there are some, some definitely some bumpers that help keep you within the lanes from making mistakes. The other thing that's interesting to me, and, and this is the part that I haven't been able to set up on some of my open source stuff, is like when people like do like a merge or a pull request, for example, you have yeah. stuff checking whether it can do that. I, and I, I, maybe I missed it because I, I, I grabbed some chips during this show. I'm sorry. <laughs> but how do you set that up so that it, it does the checks as well? I, did you show that? Or is there like a really easy way to, to a do A little it? bit. Right. Well, I mean, that's set up right through introducing a YAML file that sits at the root of your version control repository. So yeah. we, as soon as you connect those up, we pick up that YAML file and can build out that, that build system that will check everything out and make sure that the code is built, compiled, unit tests are executed. Um, code coverage is done, and a bunch of other things, including all the way through to deployment if we need to. Um, or you can flip it and go into um, 
Azure Pipelines and build the pipeline strictly from within Azure Pipelines and keep it out of source control if you prefer. Oh, wow. My preference is stuff it in source control. Right. You, you want to track everything. the changes of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Version so, everything. So if you have that YAML file, because I've seen the YAML file, it's, it's yeah. pretty, it, I mean, it, it's literally like do this first, then do that. It's not, it's not super complicated. I was able to do that myself, so if I can, you can too. But you've got to hook it up somehow into yeah. Azure Pipelines though, right? That's correct. What's, what's the process for doing that from GitHub? Because I know there's something you have to do. Absolutely. Run right to the marketplace, search for pipelines. Once pipelines opens up, um, you can click on it, scroll down, there's a little buy now button. Yeah. And your total cost per month says zero dollars per month. Right. That's all it is if it's an open source project. Um, click on purchase at that particular time and it'll bring you through a nice wizard to help you connect up those two pieces. Awesome. So yep. I, and that connects you to pipeline. I also was able to do that. So that means anyone <laughs> can. I'm pretty excited about that. All right. So here's a couple of questions. Now they're starting to come in. What is the best place to find some training content on VS 2019, specifically around the whole integration with GitHub and DevOps? Sure. Um, I, this was one. I'm, I'm going to take this one okay, for the GitHub, GitHub extension. Because yeah. as I pulled open the GitHub extension for the first time, I simply installed it. And the first thing that popped up was, hey, if you want to learn more, Here's some videos and here's the direct documentation with two links. Very helpful. I clicked both of those links, watch some videos, get familiar with it, as well as see the documentation. Um, I should mention that if you're in Azure repos, we have the equivalent experience baked right into the Team Explorer that will allow you to do um, that whole pull request feel right from inside of Visual Studio, but do it to Azure repos as well. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, did you want to add something or should we go to the no, next question? No, there's a team working on a Azure, well, probably answering a question for you, so you might as well go ahead first. <laughs> uh, is the review experience with VS 2019 only available for GitHub repos or is it also available for AZ DevOps repos? <laughs> sure. So we make the extension for GitHub repos. That's the team that I work on at GitHub. Um, there is also a team at Microsoft that works on a Azure DevOps plugin. Um, we are often in talks with them because we kind of play off of each other and we try to share features that are built into Visual Studio Core itself. Um, and yeah, it's a different plugin. Uh, I believe it's called Pull Requests. Um, and yeah, you can find it on the marketplace as well. Awesome. So this is brings up the next kind of topic because obviously in in our Azure uh, in our Azure uh, Azure pipelines, there's also like boards and, and there's also repos as well. But if you if you I like to use GitHub for example, but it's it's okay. We can use Azure DevOps as well. How do they get married together in a sense? Because I know there's a way, like if I say fixes number two, yeah. right? It, it, it does something in GitHub. Is there a way to do this all together? And this, I think, gets to the heart of Conrad's question. Can VS 2019 review pull requests created within Azure DevOps as well as GitHub? Yes. So we use the uh, Azure DevOps, the pull request extension that yeah. you mentioned, and that has that very similar experience. Um, alternatively, you can also go out to GitHub proper to do it there, or you can go out to Azure DevOps websites and do it right from there. Sure. As well. But I mean, the pull request that you send in Azure DevOps is different than the pull request that you send in of course. GitHub. Of course. They're different, they're different places. Okay. So here is a question from Sean. If my team has a corporate Azure DevOps account, is GitHub included with it? <laughs> It depends. Um, you'll need to check with your Microsoft sales folks to yeah. make that determination. There are several SKUs that do include um, GitHub with Visual Studio. Awesome. A next question from an insecure developer. I think we're, we might be related. <laughs> uh, any plans of making, making it possible to configure Azure DevOps pipelines releases inside of VS 2019? Currently, I, that's Something on the roadmap, but I'm not making any commitments to, the, to, the, <laughs> nice. to, that, particular, to that particular piece. And I, I wish I could. Um, Visual Studio is a wonderful place to do that, and it makes total sense. Um, but I, I can't commit to future um, development on those. Awesome. Next question. Can you create a new branch from work item for GitHub repo when you don't use repository in Azure DevOps? That's a little bit trickier. That is something I'll say is, is something on a high priority for, for future features. Um, if you happen to be inside of a work item inside of um, Azure Boards, you can click um, Branch right from that work item. And if you happen to be using Azure Repos, that integration already occurs and that branch is just made for you. Um, that's coming for GitHub, but it's not here yet. Awesome. From Robert Glickman, is Git Stash supported in VS 2019? It is. It's one of the more popular things that I've heard about in VS 2019 is that there's finally stash support. I haven't used it yet. I saw it very recently just now. 
Um, but yeah, I get to use it. I'm gonna be honest. I literally just figured this out like a couple months ago, and I'm like, you can do what? It's amazing. <laughs> you can commit, but not commit. You can. It's like. It's like being non-committal <laughs> right. your code, yes. right? You can switch between branches at your leisure mm -hmm. and just stash and then pop it off whenever you want. Okay, uh, let's see. Any other questions here? Uh, very good. Can I drop using GitHub and use only the extension in VS 2019? Well, you actually <laughs> are using GitHub if you're using the GitHub yeah, extension? Yeah, you're still, you're still using GitHub. Um, the extension doesn't have everything that you can do on GitHub, right? I mean, they're, they're able to develop on GitHub.com a lot faster than we're able to catch up with them in the extension. So things like merging, you know, final actions, you'll always be still tied to GitHub, but we try to at least give you some basic functionality within Visual Studio. And nice links. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing I like. I'm in Visual Studio, and even if, if, if something it takes me out that I have to go out, yeah. you provide a link right there that takes me yeah. right to There's definitely a lot of ways to get links. Like, for instance, you can get, uh, you know, highlighted links that'll take you, like, to a branch and highlight lines of code right in GitHub.com for you to share. So there's a... There's still a lot of integrations with GitHub.com. You can't cool. really leave it. It's yeah. not. It's like the back end to all yeah. the glorious things. I don't even think about it anymore, which is great. So, just a final. We got a couple of minutes or so. Sure. Final takeaway: What should people go do today? I think you should go out and start contributing to GitHub first, an open source project. I think that's a. It's a the GitHub it's, extension. It, sure. With the GitHub extension, bring it down, install it locally. You can install it Visual Studio 2017. You can put it in Visual Studio 2019 release candidate 2019. It's downloaded The today. extension actually comes by default installed into Visual Studio. I think you just have to enable it. Okay. Fantastic. And then do that, then go find an open source project and contribute. I think that's one of the best things you can do, and it's an excellent mark on your resume. As, as a hiring instructor, as a hi uh, anybody hiring, where are you going to go? Right? You're going to go look at people's GitHub repos. Yeah. What have they done? What have they contributed to? And I like that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I believe Jeff is here somewhere. I think he's right next to me. Hey, how's it going there, Seth? Fantastic, bud. How's everything going over there? You know what? I've been making some phone calls. We've been reaching out to some other folks around the country, and I connected with the host of the Six Figure, Six Figure Developer Podcast. Check it out. Here they are from St. Petersburg, Florida. It's John Ash, Clayton Hunt, and John Calloway. How's it going, fellas? Going great. Good. Now, How are you Oh, um, you know what? I think I've got a pretty, I think I've got a pretty colorful beard here. But John Ash, dear Lord, you, my friend, have the beard of the day there. Wow. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna follow, follow your, uh, you know, maybe go purple. And it, it's a wonderful I mean, look. How awesome the release is going. So, so uh, how's it going there in Saint Petersburg? A lot of excitement around the the launch of Visual Studio with your group. Yeah, yeah. We're here with the St. Pete.net meetup and uh, hey. Suncoast Developers. Hey, there you go. All right. Oh, that's terrific. Now, in the room, what are some of the what are some of the features that your folks are looking forward to in Visual Studio 2019? Oh, okay, okay, very cool. Yep. Well, thanks so much, guys. I appreciate you joining us, and and everybody there in St. Petersburg. I, I heard Uber stop by with with some food. Enjoy, <laughs> and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the rest of the event here. But I've been wanting to learn a little bit about artificial intelligence. So, guys, I, I understand, Seth. You know a you know a thing or two about artificial intelligence. How's it going over I, there? I sure do. They are going to let me actually do some code. I am pretty excited here. Let me pull this out here because I can hear too many people right now. Uh, but one of the cool things is that now it's the lunch break. Uh, but uh, okay, they're telling me I'm good now. But we're going to do some AI stuff uh, because I feel like um, AI is kind of the cool thing right now. But I feel like also a lot of people are kind of struggling with what it is that it actually does. And I'm going to show you today what it actually does and that it's actually really simple to get started. So. I'm just going to open uh, Visual Studio here and show you, like, from scratch, like, that's really fast. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this project, and then we're going to get into a little bit about what we're going to do. I have just a little, a couple of slides. Oh, look, see, look, the, the Visual Studio, I have the release candidate installed right now. Uh, and so notice that it, it loads up pretty fast. Everything's in there. Let me show you the application we're going to build, uh, and then I'm going to show you how Visual Studio helps me out with that. Let me make my 
code a little bit bigger here. Let me go to, uh, I think, 150 so you can see. Very good. So that's uh, all set up. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run this. And this, I'm going to go all the way back to old school. This is like WinForms stuff, okay? So this is a WinForms project just to show you that AI does not care where it runs, okay? So I'm going to run this program and show you like what it is that we're building. And I'm going to show you the two functions that we have to actually build in order to get this to work. And we're going to be building some Python. It's going to be really cool. So notice that this here is a uh, program. And I'm going to draw with my finger a number. And then we have to recognize it. But notice that nothing happens because I didn't write that bit yet. And that's what we're going to do. So if we go to this uh, old school WinForms application, you can see there is a predict and there is a load model. Now, here's the thing about machine learning that's really cool. When you think of an AI model, literally all you have to think about is think of it as a function. I'll give you an example. When we write programs, uh, we usually think of a problem, and then we come up with a series of steps to solve the problem called an algorithm. And what we do is we marry an algorithm and the input, and out comes some answers. Machine learning is a little bit different than that. right? And by the way, I'm going to take your questions as well, so make sure you get those in there as well. Machine learning is a little bit different. What we do is we simply swap two things. Now, instead of getting the algorithm as part of the thing that goes from the left-hand side, the algorithm is a thing that comes out of the right. So what's happening is, basically, for machine learning, you're giving a bunch of answers and the right input, and then it learns the right thing to do on its own. And, and, and so, by the way, in, in uh, machine learning parlance, we call the thing coming in data. I think everyone calls it that. And the thing that comes out is a model, but you should think of it as a function, something that you execute. And then stuff happens in here. I'm not going to get into too much of this stuff. I want you to see the boundaries of what comes in and what comes out to show you how to actually use AI inside of a, a .NET program. Basically, we want something like this. right? We want an int get digit, and we want to pass in a picture, and then we want a number to come out. Now, basically, when you, when you saw this, I don't know if you saw this here when I ran it, because I wanted to t show you what the input looks like here. So I'm going to hit, I'm going to draw the number three and hit recognize. In the output window, you should be able to see here what it is that the computer actually sees. This is what we're giving the machine. This big long string. And if you, if you squint enough, you'll be able to see into the matrix that that is exactly the thing that I drew. Do you see that if you, if you squint at it? So that's what we're giving the computer. So if you think of the input, that's the picture we're giving the actual computer. And this becomes important when you train these things because I want you to see what's, what's going on. Now, as we go, I want you to notice that the tool is going to start to melt away and become super important to what I'm doing. Right? And, and this is, hopefully this will, this will become apparent. OK, so uh, I'm going to go back over here. We want uh, to get a picture in there. We want to pass out a digit. In general, machine learning is all about creating some function. And you have to specify the shape and do all this other cool stuff beforehand. But you get this function. You pass in these numbers, and out comes the actual number. right? And again, the things that goes in is that huge array of, of numbers. OK, so that's, that's it for my slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to code this the way I would normally code something like this. OK? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to right click here, and I am going to add a new project. And, uh, and this, this is the thing that I want to show you, because this is where the tool starts to, to show up and be really cool, right? So notice that the first thing here, let me go over here. The first thing is that it remembers some of the stuff that I've already done. And I want to do a Python application. The other thing I can do is I can go in here to the language and pick the language that I want. Or I can go to search for whatever templates I want to. I can pick the platform. I can pick the project type as well. And one of the cool things you see here is it also has one for machine learning. There's some default scikit-learn projects that you can just by default start running. And I love the, like, how fast we can get to doing the thing that we want. So I'm going to go ahead and select a Python application because that's generally how I do my, my AI. And I'm going, to, I'm going to call this the Terminator for no good reason. And I'm going to hit Create. And so now notice that I'm actually in the same solution working on both Python code as well as C Sharp code. OK? So now, as you know, if we want to uh, write some machine learning code, we're going to have to do some internet sleuthing. 
And so I'm going to say PyTorch MNIST here, uh, MNIST, because that, that's the example. Hopefully there's an example that I can do. So here's one. This is the first one. Notice it has the same numbers that I have. And okay, so we have some code here. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to copy it because that's what some of us do sometimes. And I'm going to go ahead and paste it. And I am just going to run this code as is. Okay. Now again, notice that I'm using Visual Studio. Next to this, I, next to uh, you can see I have the code side by side, both in Python and in .NET. And what I have going on here, let me put this back so that they're all uh, next to each other. What I have here is I have the actual code to run like digit recognition. Okay. But there's a couple of things. For those of you that are Python users, this is arg parse. Notice that there's some there's some arguments that I want to pass in. Well, how do I do that? The other thing is, like, if you're a Python developer, you need to know what version of Python you're running. How do you know? Because, by the way, I, had, I did not have Visual Studio. I repaid my machine a couple weeks ago, and I installed my Python environments the way I like them first, and then I installed Visual Studio. And look at, look at this goodness right here. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. For those of you that are Python developers, look at this. It knows all of my environments that I previously set up. Here's one for TensorFlow Actual. TensorFlow 112, TensorFlow new version 2.0. This is using the PyTorch latest version uh, at Conda environment. And notice that the Conda environments are not the ones that Visual Studio installed. In fact, I went in there and I said, don't install yours, use mine. And they were like, we're good with that. And notice that we have all of that goodness in here. Okay, the next thing I need to do is I need to run this thing, right? But I want to save this into a format that actually works. And so I'm going to go down and scroll here, notice that we have some saving stuff here. I want to save this not into a PT file, but into something called Onyx. And again, Onyx is just think of it like as a, as a DLL or as a jar file. It's a way of encapsulating an AI algorithm. Okay, So I want to save this to Onyx. And like I said before, what we do when we write code is we need to go and actually um, do some internet sleuthing. And you can see here that I have already done some internet sleuthing and found a way to save something to Onyx. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going just gonna to copy this here real quick. And I'm going to go back here because no one ever does this kind of coding, I don't think. And OK, so I'm going to notice the format's a little wrong. So I am going to do this. OK, I think this will work. So let's go to the Solution Explorer. And we need to give it some actual, remember we had to give it some, some things to do. So there's the working directory. Let me, let me zoom in so you can see. Like all the stuff you would expect for, to run a Python application. But to debug it, we need to pass in some special script arguments. So let's go and see what they are. Uh, epochs is the number of loops that it needs to go through. I am just going to do one for now because I want to make sure that this all works. So let's go to the Terminator code here. Epochs is one, and then I'm going to go here and I want to actually save the model to a file. So I'm just going to hit save. I'm just going to make sure that the save model is in there. And now I'm going to save it, and I am going to set this as the startup project, and I'm going to run it. Okay? Just like we would any other thing, notice that it starts to run, right? Everything is going in there. Uh, you can see everything is uh, starting to get in there. Hopefully it'll, let's see, let me go back here to the terminal. All right, everything is running, right? You can see everything's hunky-dory, just like I would do anything else. Right now it's learning from a bunch of digits that it downloaded, and it's going through the freeze epoch. And the reason why I do this, because again, I just downloaded this from some random code in the, uh-oh. So it looks like we have a problem. Oh, Onyx is not defined. Now here's the thing, I kind of did this on purpose, because this is just what I would have expected if I was running it in C-sharp. Except for I was, I was dumb and I forgot to add something. So let's go up to the top because I forgot to add this import statement, like a goober that I am. So we're going to hit, go ahead and stop here and go up to the top and add this up to here, number one. And there's another error that I saw here. Like, I don't think this file exists. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it the CNN model. Uh, dot onyx here, and we're going to make sure to do this one more time. So I'm going to run this one more time, and hopefully it works. Crossing our fingers. 
Crossing, I'm crossing my fingers right now. So as this goes, again, notice that something bad happened, a breakpoint stopped right where I wanted it to stop, and I know exactly what's going on. This is the same thing that I would have done you know, at other times with C-sharp, and this is cool because I've never like ran Python inside of Visual Studio. Oh, dang it, looks like something else is going on. So let's look at this X here. Um, let's see, oh, look at that, I think I see it. So it looks like it's expecting a four-dimensional tensor, and instead I passed it a one-dimensional tensor. Uh, let's fix it. So let's go here and say X, and we're going to use some PyTorch here. We're going to view minus one, and we're, uh, we're going to do a view uh, minus one, and we have one channel, 28 by 28, and that's what we want. And now, if you're thinking about like, what the heck is he doing, it turns out that when we give it a lot of pictures, right, if you think of a picture as a set of pictures, that's the first value here that we're doing. How many are we giving it? I put a minus one in there to tell it just whatever's left over. One says there's one channel, because there's only grayscale. 28 by 28 is the size of the pictures that we're giving it, and I think this part will work. Okay, cross my fingers one more time, and I think we got it. Now, again, the cool thing about this is that I'm debugging and I'm doing everything exactly the way I thought I would have done it if it was C sharp. So as this goes through, it looks like we're at 60, 70, 80, 90. This should all save correctly. Boom! We saved it. Everything is looking happy. And let me show you what it is that we're actually saving. So let's go to Open Folder and File Explorer. And let me click on this thing called the CNN model. And you're going to see that, again, it's just a function, but that's formatted in a very funny way. The input that comes in is those 784 numbers that you saw uh, from uh, the code I ran before in WinForms. And then a bunch of stuff happens, and out comes this thing that's 1 by 10, which means that the output is going to be 10 wide. And what's going to happen is in that array of 10 things, there's going to be a number in each slot that says which, one it, which number it thinks it is. All right. So now the question is, we've already done that. I actually uh, trained a smarter one. You can see this Onyx one is smarter because I actually trained it for a little bit longer. Um, and so that's the one we're going to use. So now we're going to switch over to Visual Studio. I've just trained this thing. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to switch over to C Sharp, and we're going to start to load the model. I've already written some some of the helper code down here to like initialize the canvas and all the buttons and the show results. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start by writing this thing called an inference, inference session. And we're going to call it session. Now here's the thing, and you're probably wondering, well, where does this even come from? Well, that's a good question. What I did beforehand, I'm going to set this one as the startup project, is I added a NuGet package. Anytime you do something in Onyx, you can, have, you can run this thing in .NET called the Onyx Runtime. And what the Onyx Runtime does is it allows you to load up files, Onyx files, as if it were something to execute, and then it executes them. And so we're going to go ahead and figure out how to do that the same way that anyone else would. So I'm going to do this here, session uh, equals new uh, inference session. It knows about that, and it looks like it needs a file. So we're going to give it the file. There we go. And that's it. Uh, we're going to make sure that the uh, output, the text box up here, let's see here, so we can tell that it's loaded, the URL is loaded. So text URL dot text equals loaded. Okay. So let's make sure that works, and let's see what's actually in there. So I'm going to run this here and set a breakpoint like we would any other time. So uh, let me load up the model here, and we want this one right here. And you can see that it's loaded. And let's take a look at what's actually in the session itself. And this is, this is the cool bit, right? So notice that we have the input metadata. And notice that, hold on, let me, let me open it up a little bit more, and let me zoom in here. Oh, it disappeared too soon. I'm actually going to do a quick watch. So let's do a quick watch here, and let's zoom in to what it is that we're actually loading up. Notice that the input metadata is this, thing's, this thing uh, on the zero. Notice that it, ha it says zero. Now, for those of you that were paying attention, when you looked at this, uh, you remember that in the project itself, let's go back to that, uh, sorry, not this one, projects and numbers. 
you remember that in the actual project itself, when I click on it, the initial node that we had here was labeled as a zero. The output node, you recall, was labeled as a 22. Why it named it that, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I can't give you the answer to that. So if you ask, I'll be like, I have no idea. But notice that it also knows about the output metadata. It's labeled as number 22. Now, what is it that we can do with the session? So let's go over here and let's, uh, oh, no, we don't want to do that. So let's hit, let's hit close. And let's go one more time to the session. Let's do a quick watch. And we'll say session dot. Notice that there is one thing you can do, and that's run. And in the run, notice that it takes these things called named onyx values. All right, so let's see if we can get that bit to work. So uh, uh, this is all loaded up. You can see that it's loaded, but we still need to do the recognition, which we haven't done. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to go to um, the predict area. And like I'm free coding this, okay? So there's going to be mistakes, and that's okay. So the first thing we need to do is now that we have the session, is we have to actually run this digit code. So what I'm going to do first is I am going to go ahead and say session.run and let's see what it needs because I'm not even, okay, it needs like, it needs a named onyx value. So let's, let's see what that is, named onyx value and it looks like, let's do dot, looks like you can create from an actual tensor, float. Okay, and it looks like we need to give it a name and the name is going to be zero because that's the thing that needs to go in and now we need to have a tensor. All right, so let's see how we do that. So uh, in .NET, there is this new data type called a tensor. So I'm going to say tensor, I'm going to say var, var of x equals new, and there's a thing called a dense tensor of float. And what we're going to do is we are going to uh, say it's of digit dot length. Okay, and then pass that in. Okay, so now we have x here. Looks like we can pass that, we have this named value. So this is going to be the input equals and now we can actually run the session. So let's do this. So let's do, uh, oh, I forgot. I, I switched from Python there real quick. So we're going to say session.run and I only have 10 minutes. So we're going to get through this session.run and I am going to pass in an input. But it looks like it needs a collection of it. So I'm going to do this goodness here input, right? Because it might have more than one input. Okay. Uh, looks like it's happy, and then we're going to say var out output equals. Okay, so I'm going to set a breakpoint here because one of the things important is notice that this tensor does not have this data, so let's let's fix that too. So for int i equals zero, i is less than digit dot length, and then i plus plus. What we're going to do is we're going to say x dot i gets digit dot uh, digit i as well. Now here's the thing that's important is we, it, it expects it to be in 255. Uh, it, it expects it to be a value between 0 and 1, and you remember when we were doing the output, we saw 255, so we'll just divide by 255, because that means it's the darkest color. Okay, so let's run it and see what happens, okay? Uh, so I set a breakpoint there to load, so let's run it, and let's see what happens, because I want to see what's going on. So first we've got to load the model, because if it's not there, it won't work. So there it is. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw the number three and I'm going to recognize. Okay, so it worked, but we don't know what's in here. So let me do a quick watch here to show you what's going on because again, this is how I like to code. Uh, looks like there is a zero element. So let, let's go here to zero and see what that, oh, looks like it doesn't like that. And the reason why is one, two, three. It's a read only collection. So we got to do first. We can do that. And what's in there? Uh, when I go down there, it looks like there is a value in there. That's awesome. Looks like it has a name of 22. So let's see what I can do. Let's, oh, looks like I can pull it out as a tensor. So let's do that and let's see if that, no, doesn't like it. And the reason why is because I need to tell it it's a float. By the way, does anyone else code like this? Notice that I'm now getting the value that I want and I'm, I'm going to convert it to, let's see if I can convert it to an array. Uh, because that's easiest. Okay, so two array. Okay, good. So I've got all of this code that I've, I've figured out, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do dot and, and just do this, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and see if I can rewind a little bit. Uh-oh, so it looks like it can't. Oh, the reason why it can't is because of this. 
So now we can, we can save it and then go back here, one, two. Okay, looks like it went back and now when I hit F10, let's see what happens. What do we get? A float of 10 and we get these crazy, we get these crazy numbers. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit, uh, I'm going to go back one more time and run it again. But now I am going to uh, do this output, which is uh, show, uh, I want to show the result. So show result. And the out that we got to do a prediction here. So how do we do a prediction on an array? Well, we want the max index. How do we do that? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say uh, var prediction equals array dot index of, and then we're going to pass in the output, and then we're going to get the output dot max, because this will give us the, the index with the max, and that's the prediction. And so now when I say show result, show result, I can pass in the prediction, and I can pass in the scores, which is the output. I'm going to put in zero, just because that's how, uh, how long it takes. I'm just going to, we're going to run this again and see what we got. So I'm going to F10, 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 F5, and hopefully you will, there you go. Looks like it predicted the number three. That's awesome. Now you're probably looking at these numbers thinking, what in the heck is this doing? Well, let's do some side-by-side -side exploration here to give you a sense of what is actually going on. So I'm going to do a new vertical group and I am going to hide these things so you can see what is going on. So it looks like here, I'm going to move this one over here so we can do side-by-side -side the other way and this one over here. Very good. So notice one of the interesting things that when we're loading this data up, they're doing a funny thing here. Number one, they're normalizing the data, which I did not take into account. So we need to fix that. So let's go see if I can figure what this is. So let's go to uh, PyTorch, boom, uh, transform.normalize. So it looks like it figured it out. So we'll go here and then I'll normalize. Oh, here we go. So it looks like what this does is this subtracts the first value and divides by the second. So let's do that to make sure our, our output is real good. So very good. Okay, so it subtracts the first number, which is this number right here, minus this, and then divided by this. Okay. Okay, so it looks like there's something right here. So that's going to make it a lot smarter, number one. And then number two, the other thing that's interesting is like those numbers are really weird. I'd rather it give me like a probability of how confident it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here to this code and I'm going to look at this here and see what this is actually doing. By the way, again, hopefully you notice that I'm doing things in Visual Studio that you would never think about doing in Python. I just hovered over it. It's telling me. So this is the same as log of the softmax. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say e to that power, and it should give me something. Because remember, the opposite of log is e, and you can flip them around. So let's fix that. So I am going to do this, because I was very clever ahead of time. I put that in there, a conversion. So I'm going to say v goes to system.math.exp of v. But then I'm going to be even more clever, because, you know, we like to be clever here. So let me, let me hit save here, and let me move this over to the middle of the window here. Uh, you can do something really cool called using static. So using static system.math, boom. So now I can get rid of this thing right here. And notice that because of the way lambda expressions work, I can also just get rid of all of this. All right, let's run it. Boom. With three minutes to spare in C sharp. Let me load the model here that I just created. And now I'm going to start to draw some numbers and then hit recognize and you should, you should be able to see, oh, there's a breakpoint, F5. You should be able to see that it's guessing the right thing and now with probabilities. Hey now, 99%, 99%. All right, let's, let's do some other numbers. Let's do the number one, recognize, yes, it got that. The number two, recognize, yes, it does that. The number three we already did. The number four, let's see what we got. The number five. What? It's a genius. Eight. Recognize the number zero. Yes. So notice that what I was able to do in Visual Studio 2019 is I was able to create a solution that actually depicts what I'm trying to solve 
with a number of different languages at the same time. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I obviously released the source code so you can play with it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get up and I'm going to go over here to take any questions because my time is about up. But I want to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, 13 new posts. There's no questions. Everyone, look, I, I know that these, yes, auch beim Thema, machine learning, haben die Jungs ihren Schraj. I was totally perfect German. I feel bad. By the way, for those of you that want to learn more about that, obviously we have tons of content to help you with that. But the key takeaway was, in Visual Studio 2019, I was able to seamlessly create a machine learning model and use that to actually make predictions inside of a .NET application. It was pretty amazing for me. All right, uh, before we go, I want to make sure there's no more questions. Oh, look at this. Great, great, great. Yes, thanks. Thank you. I, my friendship dues will be sent in via check in the mail, so we'll make sure to do that. Uh, again, machine learning, I want, if the, the key takeaway is, we only have about a minute left and then we're going to go to the next uh, session. The key takeaway is that it's just a different way of writing an algorithm. Instead of you coming up with the steps, you give it the data, and Visual Studio 2019 is an amazing tool for you to actually do that, both in Python, in C Sharp, and whatever language you choose. Okay, coming up next, accelerate your C++ environment with Erica and Marion. How are you doing, my friends? Hello. Doing good? Fantastic. <laughs> we'll take it away. All right. Um, well, I'm uh, Marion Luparu, uh, and I'm Erica Sweet. We are both uh, program managers in this Plus Plus team, and for the next half hour, we'll take you through a tour of everything that's new and exciting with Visual Studio 2019 yep. if you're a Plus Plus developer. Uh, throughout the session, um, if you want to delve deeper into some of the uh, specific topics, we have ak.ms links that you can uh, follow. And uh, if you have any questions, hashtag VS2019 uh, on Twitter, and we'll try to get to all of the questions, some of them even in, uh, in the session later on. All right, so the first thing you'll see when you open Visual Studio 2019 will be uh, the start window. Uh, which basically brings together all of the entry points that you commonly use when you use Visual Studio. So whether you are a Git first user, or you like browsing on disk for your solutions, or you often open the same ones, uh, Start Window brings them all together and kind of streamlines that, that experience. And uh, rest assured that after you make the selection in this UI, uh, behind this window you will get the Visual Studio UI you are familiar with. Now, before I continue, um, I want to warn you that if you are a happy Visual Studio 2017 user or Visual Studio 15 user, um, throughout the session and really throughout the day, the thought of uh, upgrading to 2019 might cross your mind. Um, and um, you know, change sometimes uh, can be can add some stress, and uh, even when change is good. So before we jump in and talk about all the new things we're doing. Uh, I want to take a bit of time to tell you about the work we've been doing inside uh, the product to make sure that uh, Visual Studio 2019 upgrade uh, is stress-free and pain-free for you. So I'll start. The, the first thing is that you can install the IDE side by side with any other version of Visual Studio. And um, you can switch back and forth between the two IDEs uh, at any time while you explore um, the latest IDE. And when you're ready to make the switch, uh, you can install Visual Studio 2019 IDE um, and bring all of your source code into uh, the IDE without having to also upgrade the toolset. Uh, and that's important because in uh, large teams, um, upgrading the toolset sometimes requires some uh, coordination. So if you're using 2015 or 2017 ID uh, uh, compilers, uh, with a 2019 ID, you can install those on the machine and continue building your projects in the same way you used to with older um, IDEs. And uh, once the whole team is ready to come, uh, you can consider upgrading the toolset as well. And once you do consider upgrading the toolset, um, with 2019, it has never been easier uh, to upgrade your toolset because of binary compatibility. Um, if specifically you have third-party libraries that are built with previous versions of the toolset, for example, 2015 or 2017, uh, you can take your source code, build it with 2019, and then bring all these binaries together, uh, and your application will continue to run as expected. 
And last but not least, if uh, any of your third-party libraries uh, are open source projects, um, the best way to acquire these libraries is through VC Package. VC Package is a popular C++ package manager. And um, it brings full support for the Visual Studio 2019 uh, toolset. If uh, you're not familiar with the uh, VC package, these are the three commands you have to run to get started and have uh, uh, your, uh, one of the open source library fully set up on your uh, dev box ready for consumption. I hope this, uh, this reasons uh, give you the, uh, the peace of mind and uh, the comfort that upgrading to 2019 uh, is pain-free, and now we can delve deeper into some of the improvements we're making. And we'll start with um, the MSVC toolset. Uh, so we have a new version of the MSVC toolset in uh, Visual Studio 2019, uh, which brings uh, improvements in four important areas. Conformance, build throughput, runtime performance, and code analysis. And we'll delve deeper into, into these. Uh, and we'll start with conformance, where uh, the new uh, compiler toolset builds on the success of the previous version uh, and comes with a full C++17 conformance in the compiler, as well as the most complete C++17 standard library implementation to date. But uh, we didn't stop there. And we're currently, the team is actively working on adding C++20 support. The C++20 standard is a huge standard for C++ developers, and uh, it will be likely approved later on next year. Uh, the team is already working on adding support in the compiler libraries IDE, and um, we already have some functionality uh, in the uh, update that you're getting today. And we continue working on this, and future updates of Visual Studio will add even more C++20 features, so stay tuned. When it comes to build speeds, this is uh, an ongoing area where uh, we, we make lots of efforts to, to improve. And in uh, 2019, the focus is the linker. Um, we rethought the way uh, we manage debug information. And um, with the work you're going to get in uh, Visual Studio 2019, whether you're using uh, the debug full or debug fast link switches, uh, you can get up to 2.4x uh, performance improvements in link time. In addition to that, um, if you want to speed up your build even further, um, you can uh, install IncrediBuild, and with um, uh, you can get up to 16 cores of parallel builds for free. Another thing that uh, you get for free by recompiling your source code with uh, the latest MSVC toolset uh, is the runtime performance improvements uh, made by uh, the addition of new optimizations or uh, improvements in existing optimizations. So in our uh, uh, internal benchmarkings, we've seen uh, improvements of up to 2.8% by just recompiling your source code. And um, these are just uh, the things you get by default. There are additional knobs inside Visual Studio 2019 uh, that allows you to uh, get even more performance improvements. For example, OpenMP, CMD extension, uh, more aggressive inlining, and uh, the reduction in size uh, for exception handling. Uh, these are all things that uh, you can turn on by uh, specifying specific switches. And for more details, you can go to the aka.ms link below. Code analysis also comes with uh, fresh checks. And in addition to the concurrency checks, for which I have an example on the slide over here, um, code analysis assists you with writing uh, coroutine code as well as um, uh, aiding in finding lifetime issues with uh, dangling pointers or references or uh, use after move check. In summary, these are the improvements in the toolset uh, in conformance, build throughput, code analysis, and runtime performance. And um, what you're getting is the best C++ compiler toolset uh, available for targeting Windows. Uh, overall, Visual Studio gives you the best tools for uh, developing Windows applications. But Visual Studio does not stop there. Many of you also target additional platforms. And when you do so, uh, you move to a different operating system sometimes or a different uh, developer environment. Um, and really, with Visual Studio 2019, you don't have to do that. Inside Visual Studio 2019, you can target all of, the, all of these platforms uh, from the comfort of a single IDE. It's very easy to get started. 
Um, and if you um, are using C++ tools um, of, uh, that you're familiar with, you don't have to stop using them. For example, Clang format. Um, if you're using it today, you can continue using it because Visual Studio has built-in support for Clang format. And the same way, um, if you're uh, building with Clang LLVM or GCC, Visual Studio has support for all of these compilers, not just MSBC. And once you're inside the IDE, you get a familiar and rich experience, uh, the top uh, IntelliSense and refactoring operations, uh, build uh, uh, integration, as well as uh, state-of-the-art debugging. But really, there's no better way to uh, show you this than, uh, than through a demo. So Erika, you want to take it away? Yeah. Uh, we can switch on over to show my screen now. Uh, so as Marion mentioned, with Visual Studio 2019, we have simplified the start window experience. To the left, you can still view your recently opened folders and projects. And to the right, you have four entry points to get into your code. You can clone or check out code from an online code repository open an existing Visual Studio project or solution file, open a local folder, which supports any folder containing C++ code without ever generating Visual Studio project and solution files, or create a new project. The new project dialog has also been simplified, so it is easier than ever to filter templates by language, target platform, or project type. In this demo, I'm going to be working with a cross-platform CMake application that runs on both Windows and Linux called SuperTux. So if I was starting from scratch, I could search for the CMake project template, but I already have a copy of the project saved locally on my machine, so I'm going to open it using the open folder experience. <coughs> Visual Studio has native support for CMake, which means that you can open any folder containing a cmakelist.txt file and have a full IDE experience without ever generating Visual Studio project and solution files. To the right, in my Solution Explorer, you can see that my file structure mirrors the layout of my files on disk. But Visual Studio also supports something called CMake Targets View, which is a more CMake-centric way of viewing your code, organized by target, and allows you to build a single target at a time, run code analysis on a target, or run code analysis on a single file, to name a few options. In Visual Studio, all of the CMake configuration that is normally done via the command line is moved into a CMake settings.json file. But with Visual Studio 2019, we have introduced a CMake settings editor as an alternative to editing that file directly. So here you can see I am prompted with a few properties for me to edit that will make it easier for you to get started with CMake. Um, there are some general ones like configuration name and type, um, some command arguments that are passed directly to CMake, and a new section called CMake variables and cache. So I've already generated my cache, but if I were to click here, I will be prompted with a list of all the CMake cache variables available for me to edit. And you can use this function functionality like you might use a tool like the CMake GUI to help diagnose issues with your CMake lists. Advanced variables per the CMake GUI are hidden by default, but I can click here to see the full list. And I can also filter variables by name. You can also use this functionality to modify the value of any variable you see here by simply clicking the value column and modifying it. Um, modified variables are automatically saved to the CMake settings.json file, and variables defined there are ultimately passed to CMake via the command line. So the only piece of configuration I needed to do to get this working for Windows was to pass CMake the path to my toolchain file. But if you're using VC package, then VC package now autom automatically integrates its toolchain file with Visual Studio so you can bypass this step completely. Um, if you haven't heard of it, VC Package is a command line package management tool for C and C++ libraries that runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. And I was able to install all of the dependencies I needed to get SuperTux working on both Windows and Linux using VC Package. So quickly, all of the dependencies you see here could be installed with a simple command, VC Package install library name. To the left, we have a configuration manager where you can easily toggle between existing configurations or add a new one. We have template support for targeting IoT devices, 
remote Linux machines, MinGW, Windows machines, and now in Visual Studio 2019, you can target an existing cache. So for a normal CMake project in Visual Studio, Visual Studio will generate and manage all of the details of your cache for you. But now you have the ability to point Visual Studio to an existing cache that was generated outside of the IDE and so that you or your preferred tools have complete control over your cache and your build tree. So for example, if you have a script that automates the way CMake is invoked, you can continue to use that alongside Visual Studio. I have already set up a Linux configuration targeting a Linux VM. So I'll go make that my active configuration, select the startup item, and while this is running quickly in the background, um, you can see that the CMake settings editor for a remote Linux configuration is almost identical to the one for a local Windows configuration with a few additional properties exposed that are specific to a remote build. So for example, remote machine name, CMake will automatically pick up on any remote machines you've configured in Visual Studio. But if you need to add a new one, you can easily do this uh, in the connection manager and click add. We don't have many restrictions on the distro that you're connecting to. All we require is SSH, a working C++ toolchain on the remote machine, GDB, and if you're using CMake, then a relatively recent version of CMake also on the remote machine. But with Visual Studio 2019, Visual Studio will now automatically detect if the machine you're connected to doesn't have CMake installed and can automatically deploy those binaries for you to the remote machine. So, Looks like this is done. So now if I toggle over to my VM, I will see SuperTex. Uh, but this is now a graphical application running in my VM. And I only have 15 minutes here with you. So I'm going to go ahead and switch right back to my Windows configuration. So I'll select x86 debug. Again, the startup item. And so you can see that Visual Studio allows you to target multiple platforms easily from the comfort of a single IDE. Uh, the SuperTux game that I'm using is an open source project. You can find it on GitHub. And again, I used VC Package to install all the dependencies I needed on both Windows and Linux. So it looks like this was done building. And now we see SuperTux. Hopefully, you can hear it too. <laughs> So story mode, I'll play it a little bit. Still in debug mode, so it's a little slow sometimes, but once the game starts, it's usually good. All right, so this is SuperTux, uh, similar to other games you might have played before, but a good one. Um, I think I'm actually going to go into the options menu and turn the sound up a little bit. So options, go down to sound volume. And as I'm toggling through here with the arrow key, it looks like these volumes are not in order at all, like they're supposed to be. Uh, in contrast, you can see that these music volumes are increasing in order. So I think I'm going to try to figure out what's going on there. Leave world and quit. So Control T brings up go to all, which is a way to easily filter your searches to lines, files, members, types. So I'm going to use F to limit my search to files and navigate over to the options menu.cpp file, which is where most of the logic surrounding the options menu takes place. And it looks like I have a to-do that I have not yet done to sort the sound volumes. So here I have a vector of strings called sound volumes, and I'm just going to sort it. Sound volumes. So normally, IntelliSense member list suggestions are sorted alphabetically. But with Visual Studio 2019, we have an entirely new experience for C++ developers called IntelliCode. And IntelliCode will use the context of your code to suggest uh, the most relevant suggestions, put them at the top of your list, and indicate them with a star, as you can see here. So here I'm being prompted with begin. And then as I continue coding, I'm prompted with 
end, which shows that my IntelliCode suggestions are changing based on the context of my code. Uh, IntelliCode trains over numerous real-world projects, including open source projects on GitHub with over 100 stars, and for this reason can give great suggestions for commonly used libraries. I'm also going to pass in this less than volume function, which is also a part of this code base. I can quickly preview what that looks like for you um, as my comparison function to sort. Um, it's also a part of this options menu.cpp file. So I'll go ahead and set a breakpoint here, which should be hit when I go into the options menu and make sure that this is working. All right, so options, and all right, good, I hit my breakpoint. So now I can leverage something called just my code debugging. And just my code debugging automatically steps over calls to system, framework, or other non-user code. So when I press F11 here to step into, I'm automatically going to step into the less than volume function instead of stepping into vector or the implementation of sort. So I'll press F11 and I'm brought straight to less than volume uh, or user code. Um, I'll step out of that, press F5 to continue, and oops, it looks like my sounds are now in order. All right, so the next productivity feature that I want to show you guys today is called Template IntelliSense. So, uh, C++ developers using class, class templates or function templates can now leverage the full power of IntelliSense within their template bodies. So you can hear, see here inside of this template, I'm not getting member list IntelliSense. But if I go up here and specify a sample argument of a roadblock, then you can see I'm getting relevant member list suggestions like get level or get type. I can also hover over R and see that R is a roadblock. If I wanted to go back and specify a different sample argument, so now I'll say snowman, then I could leverage this drop-down menu, which shows me my most recently used sample arguments and makes it easy for me to toggle between them. Uh, Visual Studio 2019 also now has quick info on closing braces, so if I hover over any closing brace, you can see I'm getting information on the first line of this if statement, of the for loop and of the function itself. Um, the last thing that I'm going to show you guys today is some improvements to our code analysis. So code analysis will now run automatically in the, on the, in the background on file save or whenever you open up a new file. So you can see here, if I scroll down, that I'm getting a code analysis warning indicated with the green squiggles that is warning me to use null pointer rather than null. Um, and so for this specific code analysis rule, we have implemented a quick fix. So if I click show potential fixes, uh, Visual Studio will show me what this change would look like to my code. And then if I apply the change, it'll make the change to my code in this instance. Um, this particular code analysis rule is actually not on by default. And so I can show you how to manage your code analysis rules for a CMake project in particular. Um, you can manage it using this rule set file. And here you can inherit from different rule sets or manually specify exactly which rules you want to be turned on to give you either warnings or errors. Um, so you can see here, the only one I've turned on right now is this use null pointer instead of null warning. Uh, but here I could easily customize that for my project. And for CMake, you do have to pass this rule set file as an argument to CMake settings.json as a code analysis rule set in order for CMake to pick up on it. And that's about all I have for the demo portion today. Uh, we can switch back to the slides now and show a full list of what's new. So yes, this is 
the full list of everything that's new with Visual Studio 2019. I only had a chance to talk about some of it today. So if you have questions about some of the things that we didn't cover or some of the things that we did cover, you can reach out to our team uh, via Twitter or to either of us or check out blog posts. A lot of these new features have blog posts accompanying them showing you what's new and how to use them. Um, there's two features in particular that I do want to call your attention to that I didn't have time to show today. One of that is Live Share for C++ developers, and another is a 64-bit out of proc debugger process. Um, both of these features are covered in sessions similar to this throughout the day. So as a C++ developer, I would highly recommend that you go check out um, those two sessions as well. And that's about all that we have for the session now. I think we can transition to Q&A. Q&A. Cool. Thank you. Great demo. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, <laughs> the last time I wrote C++ was a very long time ago. Like, I feel like I'm the guy, like, the first time I learned to drive stick shift, I feel like that's C++ and only experience, <laughs> like, good programmers <laughs> can do that. So I'm going to ask questions that come on, and then I'm going to try to ask questions from my own small brain when it comes to C++. For cross-platform C++ build, will VS 2019 maintain duplicate copy of source code, one in local and another in a remote machine? Consider I try to build for a Linux platform for Windows environment. Um, yeah, so if you're targeting a remote Linux machine, you can copy over your sources and it's usually on by default except if you're using an existing cache. But basically that's also a part of the editor. So if I go down to the advanced settings Let's here. Let's get your screen on there so people can see oh. what you're doing. There you go. I'm back in the CMake settings editor. Uh, my Linux configuration is active right now. And um, there's a checkbox here that says copy remote, remote sources to the remote machine and also the copy sources method that defaults to rsync. Fantastic. So, Here's the thing, like, and this is, I saw this a while back. You're able to actually write C++ code in Visual Studio and debug it in a Linux environment. And not just debugging. I think one important thing to call out is that while we're moving the sources, the build actually happens on the remote machine as well. Yeah. So it's not a cross compilation experience yes. where you kind of have to move the whole Linux environment onto the Windows machine to get those binaries created. Like everything builds on the machine as if you were built on the command line. Whatever experience you're familiar with inside, inside you know, building on the Linux machine, you can bring it inside Visual Studio. And Visual Studio can automate that for you. Did you want to add anything to that? I feel like you wanted to say something. Oh, no, I was just uh, in agreement with what Mary was saying. <laughs> Fantastic. She's in agreement. All right, here's another question. Uh, for VS 2019, can we have one solution containing both CMake and C Sharp projects? That was not possible in 2017. So that's a very interesting question. Um, the CMake, so CMake as a tool uh, built by Kitward does have some support for C Sharp projects. You can interoperate between C++ and C Sharp. Now, when you bring those solutions, uh, those CMake projects inside Visual Studio, you're not going to get the, the assistance you're familiar with for C Sharp projects. Uh, so that's something that uh, we're considering as one of the suggestions uh, that we can improve the Visual Studio experience right now. Um, for now, you will have to switch between solutions and the native CMake experience to get also C Sharp, uh, like nice IntelliSense and debugging capabilities. Awesome. Another question. Do I need to install build tools in remote machine for building cross-platform C++ applications in VS 2019? Consider I am building an app for Linux from Windows. Do I need to install GCC, G++ for remote machines? So yeah, as Marion was saying, we're really just driving the build on your Linux machine. So we do have a couple of dependencies there. Uh, working, we, yeah, GCC, um, GDB, rsync, and SSH are the dependencies that you will need on the Linux machine that you're targeting. These are really good questions that we're getting. I'm and, so glad because yeah. I would ask dumb things like, hey, you know, how do you manage pointers? Is that still a thing? <laughs> 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 They're laughing at me. Don't manage. They should be. <laughs> Don't manage. They should be laughing at me. Does cross-platform compilers come with VS 2019 installation? Uh, that's a good question. We we do have um, one GCC cross compilation tool set that ships with the Linux workload, uh, but that's specifically targeted uh, for ARM yeah. um, and. Beyond that, you can add any cross-compilation uh, GCC tools that you have and configure them uh, inside Visual Studio. So we, we don't limit to that. But there, there's only one coming in, in Visual Studio. Awesome. 
Did you want anything? Nope. Okay, good. <laughs> VS20. Yeah, I, sorry, uh, yeah. I, I assume the question was for Linux. Uh, yes. Because oh, yeah. for Windows, we do ship cross compilers for targeting ARM64, uh, ARM, uh, x86, x64, and we have the full metrics of, of architectures that we support for Visual Studio. So. Like, they're inspiring me now to, like, go and do something in C++. You should. You should. Probably catch my machine on fire is what I'll do. So let's do, uh, ES 2019 claims C++ 14 full support, but actually lacks an obscure C++ 11 and later feature, Pragma. I was going to say the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with the underscore Pragma, capital P? Underscore Pragma doesn't come up uh, often enough. Uh, we should talk more about it. Um, so... Uh, we do have uh, support for, for many of the C++ 17 features in the product. Uh, we, we do consider that uh, we are, uh, in the compiler, we have implemented all the, all the features from C++ 17 and, and beyond. Um, we should follow up on that particular feature. Maybe uh, they ran into a bug that uh, they assume doesn't work, or maybe that's something that's still on the backlog that we should basically clarify the state of. I'll, I'll follow up offline on Twitter, maybe. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. we want to know. Like, I don't even know <laughs> yes. what it does. I remember Pragma, but with hashtags. Yes, we didn't Pragma call them hashtags back then. <laughs> Pound pra From Keith, uh, what do we have to do to get our G test, test to show up in the Test Explorer? Um, so all you should have to do is get a build. Uh, and as soon as the build ends, Test Explorer will go collect all the binaries from the build and, and populate Test Explorer with those, uh, with those tests. Uh, that should be true for both uh, whether you're using MS Build projects or using CMake projects. Fantastic. So I'm gonna if I'm gonna go and do some C++ things in Visual Studio. I, I honestly love the the debugging stuff that you showed, like clarifying what the T was and then having that was amazing. What should I go start with? I haven't done C++ in a very long time. I had a very bad experience in college with C++ <laughs> because my professor. <laughs> I did the Minimax algorithm, which is AI old school, and he was measuring memory leaks, and I failed it. I got to see, yeah. And so it's, it's burdened me ever since. So what can I do to go back, and how can Visual Studio help me with C++ if I'm a newbie? I, I think it's the right time to go back, because with the new standards, uh, C++ 14 and C++ 17, the language has changed significantly. So uh, like dealing with memory leaks is a lot easier now if you, if you use uh, area AI wrappers and you know, like smart pointers. Um, we do have uh, tutorials on visualstudio.com, so I'd recommend anyone to, to go in and, uh, and, and try the, you know, the, the hello world and the calculator yep. uh, tutorials that we have on, uh, on the Visual Studio docs. And um, hey, if you ever get stuck, uh, you know, ask us questions. We're, we're here to help. We always try to improve Visual Studio to make it you know, as accessible and uh, um, approachable to people that are just getting started to learn. So. Definitely. Final word? Yeah, no, we have been working on our getting started experience. And so hopefully there's some tutorials out there if you are new to C++. And um, with some of these changes 2019, things are easier for someone who's new to Visual Studio, new to C++, new to CMake, whatever it may be, to navigate and make sense and be more productive with Visual Studio. Well, thank you so much. I feel a lot more confident. I might go do something in C++. <laughs> I might go re-implement that Minimax algorithm. <laughs> I'm, I might. I really am. I'm pretty excited because we have my good friend here. Coming up next, cross-platform mobile apps made easy using Xamarin with the fabulous and amazing James Montemagno. I, I try to hang out with him a lot, but like he won't let me in his house. I mean, I, I was only there at 3 last night. I mean, you didn't let me in. What the heck? Sorry. I mean, I was asleep. I was prepping. Oh, that's right. That's right. I was that's getting right. ready for this. All right, so, James. Take it away, buddy. Awesome. Well, thanks, Seth. Uh, the, the problem is you would have came at 2. Boom, you can, I'll buzz you in. Three, that's too late for me. So, well, thanks everyone. I'm really excited to actually talk about today all the really exciting enhancements that we have for .NET development uh, for mobile applications with Xamarin and Visual Studio 2019. You may have seen me a few times uh, before uh, on, on, on Channel 9 and on YouTube doing the Xamarin Show, which we record every single week and put out for all of the things that you're going to do. So I want to kind of walk through a few things today, show off some apps, what we're building in VS 2019, uh, both on Windows and on the Mac, and show you some of the new features, but also for anyone brand new to mobile development with .NET and Xamarin, I'm going to walk you through the basics. I don't want to do too many slides. I want to get into demos, so let's get started. Now, what I think about mobile development or just development in general here at Microsoft, 
We want you to be able to build for any platform humanly possible, and that's where .NET comes in. Whether you want to build a desktop app with WPF or UWP or WinForms, a mobile app with Xamarin for iOS or Android, an IoT device, a web application, .NET is for you. And Xamarin fits right inside of here. Uh, so building iOS, Android apps, Mac applications, tvOS watch applications. So Xamarin is part of .NET, and it's all inside of Visual Studio for you. So I like to define really quick of like what is Xamarin. You know, people are thinking, what is Xamarin? And you're saying it's part of .NET. Well, I like to define Xamarin as an open source app platform from Microsoft for building modern and performant iOS, Android, macOS, watchOS, and tvOS applications all with C Sharp and .NET. That means that you can reuse your existing C Sharp and .NET skills to you know, write apps for all of these different platforms, humanly possible. And I'll walk through what that means from like shared logic and user interface and how these applications are native. So let's talk about that app development. You know, with Xamarin, we want to give you a productive environment, reuse all of the things that you love in Visual Studio and Visual Studio for Macs, uh, reuse all of your code across different platforms. And we want these applications to have great integrations and native performance, and of course, integrate into that expansive ecosystem of .NET. So when I think of the app architecture really quick, I think of it like this as we have these head projects, iOS projects, Android projects, and now with Xamarin, and then any other .NET application. It could be a UWP app, a WPF application, your web applications. And then what we're going to do is share a bulk of our C Sharp business logic, platform APIs, and user interface, um, depending on how much or how little you want to share between all of them. But the unique part is that Xamarin delivers the ability to build out native apps for each and then share a bulk of your code while being native. So those native APRs are kind of what you would kind of expect when you use your phone. So things like finger, fingerprint permissions, uh, you know, augmented reality, machine learning, music APIs, uh, Google Play services, camera, all those great native APIs. And for Xamarin, we give you all of those APIs for iOS, Android, and all the other platforms all in C Sharp, all inside of Visual Studio. Now, each platform is pretty unique and have different APIs, but there are some similarities between all of them. So we try to simplify that aspect of uh, the development with Xamarin and .NET. And that's why we created Xamarin Essentials, which is a single library that enables developers to access native APIs from a shared single cross-platform library. So things like secure settings and preferences and geolocation, connectivity, uh, all from a single API. So now we can kind of see, well, we have business logic. That's just .NET logic, right? Models, view models, RESTful service calls. Xamarin Essentials kind of lifts it up here. So what we can do is take that model of the architecture and kind of expand it. It's still a blue box because it's still shared across the different platforms. But what about the, the user interface bits and pieces of it? You can build out native UIs on each platform, but we also thought about, well, developers wanting to share even more code, and that's where Xamarin Forms comes in, uh, which is a library that enables you to share cross-platform user interface on different platforms like iOS, Android, and UWP. So I like to define it as an open source mobile UI framework from Microsoft for building iOS, Android, and Windows apps with .NET from a single share, shared C Sharp code base. Now what's great about this is that you take that exact same model, right, where we had C Sharp business logic, models, view models, RESTful service calls, Xamarin essentials, and now Xamarin forms for your user interface. And you can mix and, max, uh, mix and match as much or as little of this as you want. So it could be all of your app, some of your app, or none of your app, because you can still build out native Android uh, user interfaces and iOS user interfaces as well. But most of our developers, on average, share over 80% of code across all these different platforms. So let's just get into it. Let's, uh, let's build an app. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just pull up Visual Studio 2019, our Get to Code experience. And when you say uh, create a new project, what you're going to find in here is all the project templates that you would expect. And over here, we can go ahead and drop down and tap on mobile. And when you say project type mobile, you're going to see all of the different Xamarin projects and .NET projects in here. You can also come in and say, oh, I want Android or iOS or tvOS or Windows platforms uh, specifically. And what you note is that we have Android projects, iOS projects, Android Wear, watchOS, 
Uh, down here we have these binding libraries, which enable you to bring over native libraries from iOS and Android into your Xamarin apps, uh, and even tvOS applications right, right here from this toolbox. Uh, if you select a mobile app, that's going to give you the cross-platform user interface with Xamarin Forms. It even says Xamarin Forms right there. And when you select Next, uh, you can create your project and you get a few more options here. So we've redone some of these and here we can go ahead and tap on Master Detail for like a flyout navigation, tabbed, a blank application, and we have a new preview of Shell which handles all of your app navigation. Now on any of these, you can select your platforms, add additional platforms like UWP or other ones in there, and you can even add um, an ASP.NET Core Web API backend. So I've already done that and configured it just like this, and what I'm going to do is open that project and walk through it. So here I am inside of it. So let's zoom in a little bit because I love to zoom. And what we'll notice here is that I have an Android project, an iOS project, and a .NET Core uh, ASP.NET Core Web API backend. So this a backend here is just a standard, you know, uh, API controller. I actually have it running here inside of Kestrel, which is our cross-platform web server backend that will enable me to debug locally on my Android device. And these head projects are just kind of what I described there. And I also have a .NET standard library, which is just my first mobile app. And under SDK. It's a .NET standard library. It has my models. I have services in here, view models, and I have shared XAML user interface across all these platforms for iOS, Android uh, here. Now, I also have some NuGet packages. So I have like JSON.NET. You know, you can pull down basically anything from NuGet. Then I have Xamarin Essentials and Xamarin Forms. I'm also bringing in a new library that we just released called Xamarin Forms Visual Material that will enable me to do material design uh, across each of the platforms uh, that we support, which is really nice for iOS and Android. So this is just like a .NET standard library. Here's everything that we see. And what I want to show you is what sort of the user interface looks like uh, at a high level. So we have that item controller. We need to query it. So in my code behind, I have a items view model. Here, I'm just going to use all C sharp.net that'll be shared across. I have an observable collection of items. Uh, when I want to load them, I will simply call execute load items. It's going to go off to my data store, which I'll show you in a, a few seconds here, and then add those items to the list. Now, in my user interface uh, here for my items page, we have cross platform XAML with Xamarin Forms. So inside of here, it's an XML representation of my user interface. So over here, I can pull out a toolbox, drag and drop controls right on the XAML. I can go ahead and tap on one of the controls. I get my property grid on the bottom right that you'd expect. And here I have a list view. So here I'm going to go in. I can see my item source as items. I've pulled the refresh enabled. And then inside of this data cell, I'm going to give it a representation to display an icon. Uh, and also a label here of the text and description. Now, it's just C sharp.net logic, nothing crazy. So when I make that web backend call, it's going to look a little bit like this. I have my Azure data store. It has an HTTP client that I've used for years. I have a URI that I specify with a backend. And over here, I'm doing a few interesting things. Notice when I say get items async, it will go and get a string to call the API and use JSON.NET to deserialize it. It will also check for internet connectivity using Xamarin Essentials on iOS and Android. So a single API to check internet access there. Now the important part is that I've configured this app for a specific URL since I'm running it local. Here I've set my backend just to be local host, but notice that on Android, since it's going to be an emulator, uh, we're going to just do the Android IP address for local host. And again, I'm going to use Xamarin Essentials to say, am I on Android? Use 10.0.2.2.500, else use localhost 5000 for like iOS or UWP. So here I can pull up my Android emulator, and we'll go ahead and bring up the web server in the back end. And I'm, I'm running my Android emulators here on top of Hyper-V. So we've extended Hyper-V to uh, support the native Google Android emulators right out of the box. You can run Google Play services if you want on it, anything that you want. And here, the application is loading. Uh, and here we have some tabs on the bottom. 
uh, and it's going to go and make a web request and get some items. If I come in, uh, add a new item, and I say, hello uh, world, and we'll go ahead and drop that down and hit save up here. We'll notice that this is running in the back end. And in fact, I have Swagger running over here. And if I try out my web API, hit execute over here, we can see that this hello world right here is coming from my app, which is really cool. So as we start to think about how we're going to develop the user interface, we have a, a few tools in mind, and not just only for editing the XAML. Perhaps we want to update this new item page. I don't really like that the cancel and save are here. So what I'm going to do is uh, come over to this new item page. And we have our Xamarin Forms previewer, so I can get a side by side of uh, my XAML here. And what I'm going to note here is that I don't really like this toolbar item. Uh, so we're going to get rid of that. And what we can do down here is maybe add a button. And notice that IntelliCode jumps in and gives me recommendations. I type B, and B is in label and button, and IntelliCode says button. It'll also recommend that I set text or the background color or the command here. So we'll go ahead and set the text of save. Let's do uh, the clicked event to the uh, save clicked event here. And let's just go ahead and set the background color over to, let's say, a static resource that I've defined called navigation primary. And then we can go ahead and close that out. There's my button. It shows up. Now, this, uh, this little uh, property that I just showed actually came from shared resources in all my apps. So that's where this navigation primary is coming from. So now that we have this here, we can do a few things. It, it shouldn't be right underneath it. Maybe I'll go ahead and modify, let's say, the, the vertical options and maybe do, let's say, end and expand. And it updates, uh, updates it over here for me inside my XAML, so we can see it right here. Uh, one of my favorite things that we just added is design time data support. So here, for instance, I have some attributes to say D colon on anything. And what I can do in that is I could say D colon uh, background color equals red, for instance. And then in my design view, I can see how much space it's actually filling up inside of it. Um, whereas as soon as I get rid of that, it's going to go back into my, my blue. So maybe here we want to see text color equals, let's say, white here. So now we'll see it update to white. Now, I really didn't like sort of that I had to have some labels to enter these items. I'd really love that material design look where the, the placeholder moves up and down. So what we can do here is enable a brand new feature of Xamarin Forms that we call visual. And we're going to set this to material visual. And we're going to see a few things change. Look at this inside of my preview. When I set default, it changes to be a kind of a generic default button. If I change the material, we now get updates inside of our user interface. So here what I can do on the label is actually just get rid of it. I can just say, get out of here. And then over here, maybe I'll set my placeholder equal to text, um, which will move up once I enter it. The same thing here on the editor, I'll say placeholder equals description, and we'll go ahead and set it here. Now what I do like is that with material buttons, I can set like a corner radius on this button and start to make it look real good. Maybe I'll set it to 18. I can see it respond there, which is nice. So let's go ahead with those changes, see what this looks like as I uh, rev this application. So I'm going to now go in, hit recompile, redeploy. It's going to recompile my Android application with the changes that I made and then deploy it to my Android emulator that's sitting over here. So let's give it a, give it a second to, to build up on my machine. Um, here we go. And see what it's going to do here. I go ahead and close this out. Here we go. Um, and those design attributes that I showed uh, work on any property. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit more what that looks like. So we've relaunched. We've worked a lot on optimizing uh, the build time. So you'll see a lot of improvements in Visual Studio uh, 2019 for both iOS and Android. So here I have uh, my application. Since I'm still running against that web server, I get that hello world. Uh, now I can hit add again. Now we're going to get really nice material design here on both of these uh, with literally zero work at all. And I'll say hello uh, over here and I'll say 
uh, from material design. There we go. And then on this button, I get this really nice effect and I can save that back out. I go ahead and it updates and I'm good to go. Now, uh, what I wanna show though is that inside this application, I can also debug it right here on iOS with those same changes. I have it connected here to my Mac, right here on the local guest network. And I can just see all of my iOS um, simulators right here or plug in a physical device to my Mac and have it debug over onto my iOS device or simulator. Now you may be saying, okay, well, there's a, a simulator now. This is our rem remoted iOS simulator that we have when I hit debug. Where is that running? How can it talk to the web API backend? Uh, well, the simulator is running on my Mac and we're sort of porting it over to the Windows machine. So I took the same project and ran the web server over on my Mac since this is literally running on localhost on my Mac, which is uh, pretty nice. So now I'm in a full debug session from my Windows machine right here onto my iOS simulator. When I hit add, I have the same exact material design that I would expect to have um, uh, just like I had on my uh, Android device. I can hit done here, then we can hit save. So boom, now we have the same exact application talking a web API backend from my Windows machine. But I wanna kinda of take this a little bit further and tell you some of the other things that we're doing here, especially with the design time data. So remember I had this, this uh, big list of data here and, and I wanna uh, kinda of rev on it a little bit. And if I pull out the, the previewer at this point, uh, we're gonna see uh, basically nothing <laughs> inside of it. So uh, it'll uh, initialize up here and we'll see a big blank page. Well, that's because there's you know, a list of items and literally nothing in it. But I could take advantage of our good friend design time data. So here we have an item source. And what I can do is kind of bring in a little templated code, give it a design item source. So here I'll go ahead and copy in this item source. And what I'm gonna do is simply say, uh, empty strings at this point. And I could say, hello from Visual Studio. Now we see the frame, because there's three items inside of here. And if I wanted to, I could come down and simply say d colon text. And I could set this equal to hello, for instance, which makes all of them hello. Or I could say binding dot, which is really nice. And I say hello from Visual Studio. Now let's take it to another level though, uh, because what I can do is not only just give it strings, but give it full items inside of here. So let's go ahead and replace this item source of strings with the actual model. So what I've done here is I've added two items. One that says Scott Hanselman loves tacos and a picture of his face, which is inside my iOS and Android project. And the Visual Studio 2019 is an amazing IDE. So here we have an icon, also a first name. So if I remove this icon, we'll see it update with T there. Uh, if I come in and put the uh, icon back, which I even get IntelliSense for there, to scott.png, we'll go ahead and see Scott show up. Now this is nice because uh, I've bound this icon and the text first. And if I simply remove this design, I'm gonna be using the real bindings, but using design time data with very, very little uh, energy or effort at all. And I can come in and just see Scott's beautiful face staring back at me over and over and over again, which is exactly how I want to develop all of my applications, which is why I developed a Scott Hanselman application that I've been building live and updating with all these new features. So I have Scott just looking at me right on my iOS and Android device 24 seven, <laughs> it's pretty great. So those are some of the new features we have, but I wanna show you what this looks like when I take this exact same project and open it up in Visual Studio 2019 for Mac. So I'm going to swap over my HDMI right now over to my Mac. Here we go. And what we'll go ahead and see once it's on the screen is the same exact project. Over here, I have my um, iOS Android product 
project and ASP.NET Core backend. Now what I've done though is instead of hitting my backend of localhost, I've added in an Azure backend and published it. You can right click, say publish, publish to Azure. This will query your subscriptions. You can send it right up to Azure. So now with the same exact project, I can do things that I would expect. So here I can go into my about page um, over here. We're going to go ahead and see all the same XAML that's loading up. Uh, it should go ahead and load up my iOS previewer right here on my Mac. And in fact, over on Visual Studio for Windows, I could have seen that as well. I just need to click over to the iOS tab. So here I go. I see everything here. Uh, and I can make changes and see it update. Now, if I go ahead and debug this application, what I'm going to show is that I'm running this over here inside of Azure right here. So if I go in and I say try it out and hit execute, we're going to go ahead and see my items, one, two, three, four, that are showing up. So now we're going to build our application. It's going to go into a full debug just like I did over on my Windows machine. Uh, there we go. And I'm going to be running this over on apparently my iPhone XS Max device, um, which is actually kind of cool because it's going to have the notch inside of there. And I'll show you one other thing about the items page, uh, item, new item page on top of here, which is that inside of the XAML, we have special attributes for iOS and Android. So here we're going to use the safe area. And in fact, on my main page, I was specifying bottom tabs on Android, some brand new properties there. So here's our application loading. Get it into debug mode. There we go. All of our project properties are there. I can go ahead and add a brand new one with all of our material design. Go ahead and hit save on there. And now we're hitting an Azure backend to save everything. So let me wrap up before we go into Q&A with some resources because you can grab all the source code from here and kind of summarize up here. So you've kind of seen end-to-end -end building an application, what you get out of the box, but a lot more. Some of the brand new tools that we have built right into Visual Studio 2019, like IntelliCode support for all of your XAML and C Sharp, and some brand new Previewer and Android Hyper-V emulator. And we also sped up our remoted iOS simulator by 300%, which is pretty awesome. And here I'm on a guest network at Microsoft, and it works perfect. Now, of course, you can join tons of developers and companies that are building applications with .NET and Xamarin today. We love all of them. When you head to .NET and tap on mobile, you'll see a customer showcase page highlighting amazing developers around the globe building applications with .NET and Xamarin. So to recap, beautiful applications for just about anything you could possibly think about with Xamarin while sharing all of your C Sharp and .NET logic with existing .NET applications for any platform that you possibly want. Use all your favorite libraries, JSON.NET, Refit, Poly, anything out there. .NET Standard enables all of it across all these platforms. You can share native APIs with Xamarin Essentials, share native UI code with Xamarin Forms, and of course, great new features like live share support, IntelliCode, previewers, and the iOS Remoted Simulator. You can get everything by just going to visualstudio.com, installing. You can snapshot this right now which is going to give you a link to Xamarin, Xamarin Essentials, and the GitHub project with this code right there, um, which is awesome, and links to my show here on Channel 9. Five minutes, 25 minutes. Did it, Seth. I'm so excited. What? Wow. You are like on the button. Pretty good. Fantastic. Let's go through some questions, I'm shall ready. We? All right. Number one, are there any new features in VS related to the Xamarin, such as stability of connection to the Mac? Uh, PR project build, performance, improvements, and other stuff like that. Not the getting started with Xamarin Forms for newbies on the new VS launch. Mm. Few things. So the first thing is that we uh, reduce our installation size of the product by 20, from 23 gigs to 7 gigs, which is huge. Uh, we have spent a ton of time helping Android build and deploy times. So what we've done is every single release, and especially with Visual Studio 2019, you're going to see drastic, drastic, drastic improvements. The first build may take you know, a little bit more time because you're doing a full compilation, but iterative builds are seconds, not minutes anymore between projects. Now, if you add a new NuGet package or things like that, but if you just make a change to the XAML, boom, it keeps going right away. We've also spent tons of time on stability and updates, especially around 
bin and OBJ files. So this should be a thing of the past, hopefully. And of course, things just like getting the Android emulators running, speeding up the iOS simulator. Um, and of course, that connection to a Mac should be super rock solid. I do it right here on the guest network at Microsoft. And there are thousands upon thousands of people on that network right now. Right and now. Everything, and yeah, it's all real. It happened. Right now. They're, right now. They're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Next question from Mick. Would it be possible to run on a remote iOS simulator using a Mac with a virtual instance of Windows running? Well, I don't know uh, exactly about that and how that uh, may break Apple's uh, you list for developers, but there are great partners such as Mac Stadium and Mac in Cloud, which have Visual Studio for Mac up there. All you need is an IP address to point at your Mac machine from your Windows, and boom, you're good to go. You, it you it talks to, over SSH. You need to do the right thing, though. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Yep. And of course, it integrates into like Azure DevOps, App Center, so you can do builds and get it on your phone. Fantastic. Truth is singular, which is the a picture of a puppy <laughs> dog. Which I, love is, dogs. I, I mean, I feel like this is truth. Yeah. Uh, since the Android emulator runs on Hyper-V, I will assume that the same restrictions as Docker and therefore can't run VMware at the same time. Can you run, can you run not in, in Hyper-V? Oh, absolutely. So the, the thing is before this brand new support for those Android emulators running on Hyper-V is that you had to install Intel Haxum x86 emulation and you had to turn off Hyper-V. Uh, but you can run your Android emulators with that or with Hyper-V. It's up to you. And some machines don't even have uh, Hyper-V or perhaps um, their AMD processor. So we now support that. And we're working closely with the teams uh, when we release updates to Windows to make that better and better and better, uh, especially around you know, security and the lower level stuff that Hyper-V Hyper runs on, you know, every little, every patch. Fantastic. I love the do what makes you happy answer. <laughs> yeah, you do you. You do you. you, do you. Uh, next question from Dan. What's the limitations of the new Xamarin.preview? Yeah, so the previewer part of Visual Studio will show up your iOS and Android apps. I showed Android on Windows because to do iOS, you're going to have to have it connected to a Mac. And on Visual Studio for Mac, you can do both. We've done a lot of optimizations there. So out of the box, uh, you no longer have to compile your code. It just shows your XAML. It won't try to run your code, won't try to run your code behind, won't try to run your custom controls. We talked to developers, a lot of developers, and what we found is they just wanted a quick and easy preview of just about what my application will look like. They didn't need to be pixel perfect because there's so many different devices. Now you can select the diff so a few different device form factors, you know, pixels and different uh, versions of, of iOS and, and Nexus devices and things like that. Um, you still may run into some limitations. Like if you try to run, you can opt in to run your custom code, but if you try to make web requests or do crazy low-level things on your machine, like that's going to break. So you can turn that off, though. You can opt out of that, which is the default. So you can kind of flip the bits back and forth. But we have updated documentation on docs.microsoft.com. So take a look for that. Awesome. Rapid fire, because we're running out of time. Does Xamarin Essentials now provide an abstraction layer over the iOS Android native mapping? Functional functionality. Absolutely, yes. It supports iOS, Android, and UWP. It's included in every single template inside of Visual Studio 2019. It's completely open source and available in GA today. All right, rapid fire. Is material, uh, a material visual available for Xamarin iOS without forms? Absolutely. You can grab the package called like Material iOS. You can tweet at me afterwards, but it's available on NuGet. How do I add a UWP project to Xamarin Forms solution? Yep, we have great documentation. You just add a UWP app. Add the Xamarin Forms NuGet, configure two things, boom, done. Man, we're getting it done. Is there built-in support for .NET embedding using Xamarin? Um, yes. Embedinator 4000. Is yes. it 9000 now? I don't know. 18 billion. Is hot reloading on the roadmap for Xamarin? Great question. Nice. <laughs> uh, we have more events coming soon. Awesome. And so we're going to finish with that. Thanks so much, James, for uh, being so gracious and coming in. Thanks for having me. Now we have a couple of things. Let me grab my paper here because I, I want to I get the title correctly. To the cloud with Visual Studio and Azure, we have Andrew and Paul. Why don't you get us started, my friends? Hey, thanks, Seth. Uh, so my name is Andrew Hall. I'm a program manager who works on .NET and Azure tooling. And I'm Paul Yuknovich. I'm also a program manager working with Andrew, my twin brother. Yeah, little known fact. Yep. Um, so as uh, Seth introduced, we're to the cloud with Visual Studio and Azure. Uh, we want to spend most of our time today looking at the product until we get to questions. Um, but first thing we want to talk about is Visual Studio makes it really easy to get started with Azure. Uh, we offer multiple templates for creating projects. 
Uh, so no matter what you want to do uh, in Azure in the cloud, we generally have a nice template to get you started to build that type of application, whether it's working with our first party proprietary stuff, uh, such as Azure Functions, whether it's general purpose ASP.NET Core applications that are really kind of the workhorse of any modern cloud application you'd want to do, or working with third-party technologies such as uh, wanting to Dockerize it, put it in Docker containers, and potentially put that up into Kubernetes or another host for containers. That's really caught on this year, so I'm glad we're doing that. Yeah, and one of the other things that we've d worked really hard at is to provide great offline experiences for common developer tasks. So if you're not in a place where you're ready or willing or interested to actually take the leap and run stuff in Azure yet, uh, a lot of common tasks that you can, you can build a lot of good applications on your local machine with just the offline emulators that we offer uh, for Azure and for some of the other services. Um, so you want to develop on an airplane, you want to develop at a coffee shop, but don't really trust public Wi-Fi, yeah, we can help you there. As yeah, well. and even though it's it's a little bit ironic, we see a lot of customers are saying, "Hey, there's times I just want to work locally. It's fast. Um, I have everything set up on my machine. There's other times I want production realism, so I'll run it in the cloud." And so it's we see that continuum where you want to go back and forth. Exactly. So with that, let's jump in and look at uh, some of the brand new product we just shipped today. Sweet. All right, so we're gonna start off here in Visual Studio 2019. And I just want to start off the launching into the great new uh, create new project experience that was shipped in Visual Studio. And so I have filters up here. So if I'm interested in uh, project type, I could choose cloud. And I'm going to see uh, project types that are associated with cloud, for example. I can clear that filter. Uh, once I go into, I mentioned some of the other technologies we integrate with, for example, I want to do an ASP.NET Core web application, uh, hypothetically. For the purpose of this, I can choose uh, Create, and I'm going to see you know, options right here at the new project creation uh, experience to enable Docker support if I want to do that. Of course, I can always add that to an existing project after the fact as well. Right, because a lot of people like to do that as a part of the DevOps pipeline. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and back mm. back out, um, and we're going to go ahead and open uh, an existing project that we have for the purposes of our, our talk today. Mm -hmm. And we'll make this available at the end in our slides. And so what I'm going to have here, Paul, I know that uh, you and I are angling to get rich with our newest startup. Yes, and it's taken us an awfully long time. It is. Um, pennies at a time. Pennies That's at right. a time. But a penny saved is a penny earned. And so what this application is going to ultimately be, it's going to be a photo gallery application. So we're going to have an ASP.NET Core project that we're going to run. It's going to be serve up the images. It's going to let users upload images. Yep. And then we want to introduce an Azure Function application into that project. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Azure Functions yet, they're event-driven serverless programming. Uh, serverless doesn't mean that I don't have any servers executing my code. Uh, we're not actually magic yet, as mm -hmm. much as we'd like to be. Uh, but what it does mean is it means as a user, I don't have to care about reserving resources for my application. Uh, serverless means that the cloud is going to take care of scaling up as many instances as it needs to handle incoming requests. It's going to spin it down. And from a cost perspective, I'm only going to pay for the CPU cycles and memory that I'm using to execute those functions. So yeah. no incoming requests, no events uh, causing those functions to trigger, yeah. and I'm not going to pay it's any It's the cost. most managed service possible. Right. Exactly. It's completely managed by us. Yeah, we had a great blog post by one of our uh, CDAs, Jeremy Lickness, about a year ago where he talked mm -hmm. about he'd written his own service that he was using for all his own URL redirection. I think it was costing him 20 cents a month for mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of requests every month. So, Sweet. Uh, so with that, let's uh, talk about functions because I think they're one of the cool new technologies in the cloud space. If I wanted to create a function project, we talked about how we would create one. Uh, but I mentioned that they're event-driven. So let's go ahead and start my function. So let's go ahead and start debugging. And what we want to do here um, is, if I find the, uh, we'll just set it startup. That'll be easy enough. All right, hit F5. And so this is going to spin up the Azure Functions runtime locally. I have no actual cloud connection uh, currently. I'm going to be working with the Azure Storage Emulator. So I'm mm -hmm. going to be building an event-driven, modern cloud application entirely on my local machine without even, at this point, the need for an Azure subscription. All this is That's freely cool. available. You said event-driven, so what events do we care about here? So in this case, what we're going to do, I mentioned we have a photo gallery app. Yep. We want to make sure that nobody steals our great idea, Paul. Yes. Nobody steals our images. Because it's never been done. Never been done. Never right. been done before at all. Yep. Uh, so what, what we've done is I've written a little code that's going to stamp a watermark in so people make sure that they know that this image came from our photo gallery. So how this should work is a user should upload an image to our site. Yep. 
then it should stamp a, the function should pick up that image, stamp a watermark in it, and put it back in the place that the site can serve those images up. Uh, so I'm going to go, I have uh, here That's my local Azure functions. Kind of a good example of just a worker pattern, right? You want the, the front end to be as thin as possible, let the, let the back end do the heavy lifting. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so we have our function up and running. You can see that I have a local development experience just like I would expect in Visual Studio. So I have breakpoints, I'm able to hit uh, F5, it's launching, all the code's running here, no, no cloud connection required. And so then let's go ahead and fire up our, another application here, which would be our core image gallery. And debug, we'll say start new instance. And so when this launches, you'll see my photo gallery come up and what should happen is, when I upload an image into my blob storage, I'm going to expect that this image uploaded uh, function is actually going to get triggered. Notice we haven't hit it yet, even though I can see my functions up here yep. in running in Visual Studio. And so as soon as my browser... Uh, even with cool ASCII art. Even with cool ASCII art, yeah. Yep. That's correct. All right, so that's, we can launch two of them at a time. So once this you finishes, never know what's going to happen with MSN. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen with MSN. <laughs> That is very true. It's a fun website. Yep. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, log myself in here. If anybody has any comments, questions, or complaints, there's my email address. Forgot to check the Remember Me checkbox again, Paul. Okay. All right, so now I can upload an image. So I'm going to pick an image off of here. I have these nice wallpaper images. And so that, that basically queued up the blob. I queued up the blob. Okay. That's correct. And if I put it in the right place, everything would work uh, as I would expect. So just to illustrate this um, working like I would expect here, when I have my local emulator, what I want to show is I want to show putting uh, just uploading an image unlike the way that the application works. So we can see back uh, here on my gallery page that we have an image. And when I zoom in, if I go down here very tiny, we have our little little watermark stamp. Yeah, last in. time we did this, people didn't believe us. So we have to work on that. Effect. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, we aren't accounting for, for, the, for the scale correctly. But now let's see what happens if I um, upload an image here. Uh, upload. Upload files. Let's pick another image just to use Storage Explorer. So if I want to test my function like this, I can. I can go beautiful, boom. I click Upload. And it's going to upload real quick. And then for some reason, let me make sure I have my connection strings correctly. Um, oh, I stopped debugging. I somehow stopped debugging. That is yep. why my breakpoint is not hit. Helps if the hit. function's running. It does help if the function's running. I'm not sure totally how that happened. Yep. But uh, you have to learn lifetime to master. These that, that's right. So now what I'm going to expect that my function's actually running nice. is my breakpoint hits. So I can step through. I can see that I have uh, functions have automatically passed in my information. I can see the name of the file. So it's this beautiful streams wallpaper. So full local debugging experience. I have a second uh, function that I've added here, which is going to go uh, delete the honor watermark copy. So I'm going to I can step through this as I would expect as a user. Right, hit F5, F5, boom, gets uploaded. I come into my function to delete the unwatermarked copy. F5, there's two of them since we accidentally stopped the function from running. Perfect. And so great offline uh, development experience just with our modern cloud tools here in Visual Studio. Yep. Um, so once I've done that, I have my application, uh, let's do multi-startup project uh, here. Launch both of them, just uh, make sure that it starts like I want so we can start both of them. Yep. Uh, That's a good trick for any distributed app. Right? Yep, good trick for any distributed app. We can or even containerized workloads. Exactly. So I can start multiple uh, multiple applications like this. Um, it's not. Oh, I accidentally picked the wrong project. That helps if you were you, just testing Visual Studio. I was just testing Visual Studio. That's correct. All right. Start. Start. Okay. Boom. Um, boom. And so those are just separate disconnected processes, but they, they know how to connect through the connection string. That is correct, yeah. Okay. So the, the only thing that ties these two particular applications together at this point is the storage account at the moment. The storage account, yep. Yep, and so I can see that I have the two images that I uploaded are currently present in my site. So let's say I'm ready to uh, run this up in the cloud now, Paul. 
Sweet. And I have an operations team that's going to take care of a lot of stuff for me. But I'm a developer. I like AKA to me, aka you. Yes. yes. Yep. But I like to take care of my stuff uh, previously first. So the way I can easily test this in Azure is I right-click Publish yep. uh, here in Visual Studio. Pops up. I have the ability to create new services in Azure. So a new Azure App service. This would be an easy thing for me to do uh, yep. if I wanted. Yep. Yeah. This isn't the official deployment process. This is like the quick way to try it out. Right? Exactly. Um, okay. Now it so happens, as you mentioned, because you're my ops team. Uh, that would be it. I'd click Create, and boom, I'd be up and running. I'd have it running up in the cloud. Yep. Uh, but it turns out, you're my operations team. You've already created something for me in Azure. Right. So I can choose the existing app service that you provision. So if you work in an organization where um, somebody creates the resources for the team, whether it be operations or just a particular member of the team, uh, we've really optimized to make sure that work with selecting, res selecting existing resources works just as yeah, smoothly I'm as I'm glad you're doing that we've, we've had this feedback a lot that just there are pre-existing resources and you really need to bind to them right down to the environment variables, right? Yep. So just leverage what other people have done. And so now, uh, this particular application uses a SQL server uh, to let me log in to keep the user account information. It also uses a storage account. Yep. And uh, if I didn't have those, I have the ability now, uh, after I publish the application or once I've selected an existing one, to go then add Azure Storage and Azure SQL database to that application directly from Visual Studio. Yep. Um, so again, for my own development purposes, we try to take all the common services that you would need and just make it really easy for you to do that directly from Visual Studio without and, to. And to your last point, you can bind to existing ones too. So yes, exactly. So that's going to be a theme throughout everything we show. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Either create or select existing. Uh, both uh, services completely support that. And so, in fact, in this particular case, for example, you've already created an Azure SQL yes. database for us. I've decided you need some Rails, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. Paul doesn't actually trust me. This is his personal subscription. So uh, he turns out he likes paying his mortgage and doesn't. There was want me that 1,000 VM incident that I'm still recovering from. So yes. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, so yeah, just to kind of briefly review where we ended that. Yep. We've also not only made it really easy to get started by having project templates and all the tools that you'd want to do local development, we've also tried to make it really easy to test your applications in Azure before you would hand that over to operations team or push that into production. And we showed uh, a couple of the publish and provision capabilities that we've added to Visual Studio. And we also have some really great uh, diagnostics integration that I think you're going to show us here in one minute. And uh, the last thing that I didn't show but it's worth mentioning is we have really great inter action uh, with Azure DevOps. So if you want to set up uh, CI/CD pipelines, use Azure DevOps to actually deploy and build as part of a continuous delivery, continuous integration workflow, uh, that's all just native into Visual Studio as well. And with that, why don't you tell me how sure. I fix things once I uh, actually break them in the cloud? <laughs> well said. Okay, so the first thing um, where I picked off where I picked up where Andrew left off is um, I've defined actually all the infrastructure that we need for this application, but I've defined it using what we call an ARM template. Um, ARM meaning Azure Resource Manager. And so that's a, a bit of JSON. It's up on our website, so you can just go grab it. And once we deploy that um, with a one-liner, you can see that all of our resources are created up in a resource group. So this is kind of like our namespace to work on. And um, at that point, this gives me a good separation really between ops concerns and the dev concerns. Like I can work on this, I can secure it, I can make it work the way I want, and then you can freely use it, right? These are your resources to use. Um, so a few things that I want to drill on on, um, I have a web app and I have the functions to handle the back end. And uh, the web app, you know, at this point, you can completely configure for scale, right? I can um, scale it up to use better hardware, or what I recommend more is you would scale it out have more virtual instances that you can use. Um, and then, you know, most people want to do things like set up SSL and, and set up better networking. Um, but with that said, what I really want to do at this point is I want to look at the health of my application. And the really cool thing is um, apps that we make with Visual Studio by default, and then um, apps using the pattern that I show in this ARM template, they're going to be immediately monitorable and diagnosable. So we basically set up Azure monitoring, we set up observability, and we set up the deep diagnostics. Um, so let's check that out. So I can see in my web app, I am getting metrics. And what we really see is that metrics and logs are at the heart of, you know, all diagnostics, all monitoring in the cloud. Um, so we've really, you know, kind of embraced that with our tooling and with our services. And so we can take a deeper look at, at our application monitoring. So I have my 
you know, my failures, my healthy requests, my response times for performance, and my 100% uptime, which I'm very happy about. Um, I write rock solid code. Uh, you do. Well, let's, let's, let's put that to the test, sir. Um, so one thing that I always recommend doing is just take a look at this application map in monitoring because what we can do is inspect really at runtime what the topology um, of your application is and all the different kinds of requests. We can trace those transactions across tiers. And don't you know it's a busy day probably on this local network? That's well, okay. Yeah, we're, we have a few, th one or two things going on today uh, yeah, we around do. Uh, here on campus. Okay, well. Especially in this building. So some other things just to, while we're, while we're doing that. Um, I mentioned that, you know, really your trace and your logs are at the heart of things. So all of that trace, all of those logs are coming in. And we can do some extra special things because, again, we, we set up monitoring and .NET apps really work better on Azure because we automatically emit a lot of trace, a lot of monitoring events. You're seeing things like dependencies, requests, and availability just being fired as a part of the trace. And when I go to failures, um, this gives me both just the actual list of failures, but it's actually doing some aggregate analysis. Like, what are my top exception types? What are the top response codes? Um, over time, and so we do in fact, I mean, it's part of life, but we are seeing exceptions and we're seeing responses. Um, the one that is a little bit more opaque to me would be this null reference exception. That's always something I think we cringe at when those come in. So let's take a look at those. Um, so we're seeing here, we call this an end-to-end -end transaction view in Azure, but really we're looking at all the HTTP layers of your application and tracing all the successful calls down to the point where there's a failure. And here we're saying that the 500 is attributable to a lower level exception. And as you'd expect, um, it's a null reference exception. And I can tell from the call stack that this has something to do with your uploading code, um, but that's really not a whole lot to go on. Like, any working theories on what that could be? Um, upload? I mean, we do try to collect some information about the file that to record a, a record in our database. Okay. Um, maybe some records being left null in some cases. That's Although a good one. So clearly, it would take a couple hours and go see if you can find that. Yeah, clearly it worked right. on my machine. So, so um, you know, to cut to the chase, cool thing is you've seen earlier today we have a snapshot debugger in Visual Studio, but we've also brought that to the cloud. So you can click on, for any, you know, exception that's being monitored, we create these debug snapshots. They're kind of like dumps, dump files in the cloud. And then the really neat thing is I'm actually going to get the local variables for each frame. And if I go to the username, the most suspicious thing I'm seeing is that like, we're getting exceptions um, on these uploads with no user, which is totally wacky. Yeah, that is really strange. You shouldn't be able to upload a file if you're not logged in as a user. So. Right. So let's test that. Right. So if we upload an image on our site. Um, I really like engines, by the way, in case you didn't notice. So cool. That looks good. And so I think we were. That's a no repro. Well, yeah, I think you, we, but we were seeing no user information. No user. So what if you try logging out? Okay, so I just tried that. So as you can see, nobody's logged in. Let's give that a shot. And let's upload some fish this time. I like fish too. Um, there we go. So some of our users are getting this error, and it's just one of those cases we probably haven't thought of. And we see this a lot in the cloud. You know. Things work in your lab, in your testing, but once you get real customer input, everything changes. Yeah, I just checked the Remember Me checkbox when I signed in. I Really, we shouldn't be letting people upload images that they haven't registered for an account and aren't authenticated. Yeah, that's pretty wacky, right? Um, and there's some other places you can play even beyond here. You know, we talked about failures and health, um, but what I also want to do is get to the point where I'm proactively looking at my uh, performance of my application. So the thing I like to do is I go to this performance blade, I'll sort by, you know, all of my controllers or all of my operations in the cloud, you know, from frequent to least frequent. That gives me an idea of what my customers are doing. And then I can look at this duration to see what the experience is that people are having. And if I go to the 95th percentile, that means, hey, you know, 5% of my customers are starting to have pretty dodgy experiences, like over eight seconds for a request. So that's definitely something we're going to want to do. And then the cool thing is we can just get some profile traces that open right up in Visual Studio's profiler. Yeah, so I have two questions for you real quick on, okay. on the diagnostic stuff. Yep. Because um, uh, obviously we cheated ahead of time and said we had really nice integration with Visual Studio as well from this. 
So uh, first of all is the, the exception view that you had. That's super cool, super kind of interesting, needed in a lot of cases. We saw there was an issue that popped up in the cloud that we were able to debug that I hadn't thought of or hadn't tested mm -hmm. that scenario on my local machine. And yep. no matter how thorough we are about testing stuff, that's always going to happen. Is there any way for my own kind of dev test environment as a developer that I could bring that exception information back into Visual Studio without the need to go monitor the portal regularly? Yeah, definitely. So there's there's integration of Azure monitoring and these application failures from Application Insights right inside of the IDE. So you can just navigate to Application Insights in your project, and it'll be linked up. Sweet. Second question. Uh, you obviously showed me the, the great uh, debugging experience in the cloud with snapshot debug mm -hmm. debugging. We know Visual Studio has snapshot debugging. Yes. Any way that if I w if I decided I wasn't getting enough information out of the variable view you gave me in the cloud, I could bring that back and debug it. It's kind of like a dump in Visual Studio. Yeah, definitely. We we glossed over, but there was a blue button that said Open Visual Studio. So you do that, and it actually creates. Um, the kind of dump file and metadata that we understand in Visual Studio, and it opens right up, loads your symbols, and gets you going. So um, you'll always get a better experience inside of Visual Studio, and we link to that. But this, we also think it's pretty cool, just whether you're an operator, DevOps, or Dev, just to have something, something in the portal. Yeah, you in the right obviously the portal, portal is where it starts, but as a developer, it's really nice that you know, I, have, I can get that view on my source code from exceptions, and you know, if I really needed to dig in deeper into that dump file. Last question, is that application map loaded? Because you know, I love the application map. Let's see. No, nope, not going not gonna to yeah. work for us. To, oh, there, oh we there we go. Yeah, it is pretty sweet. So um, this is an aggregate view showing the topology of our services. So we have the web app and the functions. And then you know, this is a little distributed app. So we have the, the storage services like Blobs and SQL. And one thing that I'm always looking for is the health. So I can actually drill in and look at when I have a failure rate in, or slow requests, I can navigate right from here. So it's just a helpful navigation visualization tool. Yeah, and I think the really awesome thing with that is you didn't do anything to build that, right? The no. uh, diagnostic tools, Azure Monitor, at, automatically built that map by tracing the data flow through the application in the cloud. It wasn't like you had to upload a JSON exactly. file or Exactly. In something fact, like that. there's even a, just a teeny bit more to the story, just to geek out for a second. So .NET uniquely um, helps auto trace exceptions and auto trace requests in conjunction with Azure Monitoring so that there's things like correlation IDs and that we understand a transaction through all of these components. So it's actually the combination of .NET plus Azure monitoring that make it work. That is really cool. Uh, just real quick refreshers. We talked, uh, Paul briefly showed uh, Azure Monitor, which is our solution built into Azure for diagnosing problems that you would have, whether it be dev test, production, doesn't matter, anything that's running in Azure, and that's has some you know, deep hooks into Visual Studio to make it really easy to bring some of that information back to your workflow as a developer. Uh, real quick, as I promised, we have um, a couple of resources. So you can get the uh, sample app that we were playing with if you, uh, you know, want to steal Paul and I's idea and see if you can mm -hmm. outcompete us to uh, you know, the five cent uh, I would application. encourage you to do better, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, AKA link is up there. So um, just type in that URL and it'll take you to the GitHub repository. Also, uh, there's a lot of pre-recorded sessions that we t go into a lot more depth on uh, various uh, tooling in Visual Studio 2019, and Paul debugging. gives a really great overview of container tools that oh, we yeah. just briefly mentioned but didn't have time to touch on here. Sweet. So with that, Seth, what questions do we have? What do we got going on here? <laughs> that was awesome. I, one of the coolest things about working in the cloud, specifically at Visual Studio, is it feels like the experience I used to have when I knew what was going on locally I can now also have with the cloud. Is that what we're going for? That is what we're going for, yeah. And, and it's going to be not possible in every case. There are certain things that are hard to simulate locally, but for the really common scenarios, we definitely want to try to make it really easy to do it locally. And there's some things we've been wishing for for a long time that we can actually do now because there's enough compute power and enough data in the cloud. Like we can predict what your top errors are and we can help you debug it you know, without breaking production. So That's cool. Yeah. All right, so let's get into the real question. So for those of you that are out there watching, we want your questions. So please have them come in. I'll get them on the board. So the sooner you get them on, the sooner I'll ask. From Mick, will the ability to run Azure Functions locally be available with the Mac Edition? Uh, easy answer to that. Yes, it is already exists in the Visual Studio for Mac Edition. Oh, OK. That, I, think that was... I think they shipped it uh, last summer. So he, also from Mick, and he's, he's used some strong words. I'm just going to block this part. <laughs> Any new tooling for the beautiful ARM templates? Yes, I'll take that one. So uh, we have far better IntelliSense 
that you'll see in this version. We worked on the performance to make it bindable a lot faster and also that, so that we can use um, schemas that are provided by Azure for each of the many hundred resources that we have. So that'll make IntelliSense um, definitely a lot better. And we know there's just so much to do with ARM. It's, um, it's a target-rich environment with many opportunities. Tar target-rich yeah. environment. Yes. That's like my garage. It's also <laughs> a target-rich environment of things that I can do there, right? Uh, yeah. Just to elaborate a little bit on what Paul said, a lot of that work is still in flight. So right. you'll see uh, somewhat better performance if you start with 2019 uh, today. But we actually have a team of people with, I don't know, six engineers or so actively working on better at, uh, ARM tooling as we speak. And so that will, it will continue to get better. Yeah, you know, like the first time I actually used ARM templates, once I understood what was going on, it was pretty powerful for me to be able to stand up an entire infrastructure of things yep. with a single call. Absolutely. And so, I mean, everyone, look, I, whenever, whenever I build software and someone's like, hey, you know, can it also do this or can you fix this part? It means that I've got the right core and now we just got some details to work out. So here's a question for you and this is from me. How do you prioritize the features that you put in to the software? Like, what, what is it, like, for those that are watching, I mean, it's not like we have a dartboard and it's like, oh, we didn't hit ARM templates, so we're not doing that one. You know, what, what, is it, what is it like for you all? Um, take that I'll one. Take it first, and then Paul can correct me where I okay. mess up. Uh, I mean, the short answer is, is feedback from our customers is the number one area we use to prioritize. So, you know, we have the developer community built right into Visual Studio where you can file suggestion tickets and issues. Uh, really, that's the top thing that goes in is, is what do we hear from people that they need, what needs to be improved. Uh, then the other thing that comes into play is uh, trying to talk to the Azure team quite regularly and understand what's new, what's coming, what needs tooling. Obviously, we don't want new experiences or new application types to be in Azure that you can't tool or build in Visual Studio with .NET. I think those two are really the top uh, top two things that feed into it is what our customers are asking for and where is the platform going? What is the platform working on that's going to need tooling? Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree with that. We we want to make customers successful at the end of the day, so it's it's all about that, and we get a good signal through customer feedback. We actually use the telemetry too on usage, so that's super vital to understand. You know, areas that have a lot of usage, but you know, maybe also don't have the good feedback to go with it. So that's pretty huge. And then in general, we just try to make the biggest impact we can um, with the resources we have, which I think is like many companies. So if yeah. someone's using Visual Studio and yep. they're going to use Azure, what would be the first thing you would point them to? Like, the, like day one, you know, it, if you're using Azure and Visual Studio, you should definitely look at this thing. What would it be? Yeah, I'd say basically the, the app that I demoed minus the functions is start with an ASP.NET Net core application and try to publish it to Azure App Service. Uh, that's really the best way to get started with Azure. You have the ability to turn on all the diagnostics tooling that Paul talked about. We didn't show it, but if you're just doing it for your own purposes, you can actually remote debug to App Service uh, directly from Visual Studio. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very familiar, comfortable place to start getting uh, familiar with some of the concepts and trying to run something in Azure. Yeah, web apps, um, the web app and app service uh, works very, very well for any kind of stateless application, stateless front-end web app, um, a stateless web API. So for that kind of coarse-grained service, it's, it's just great. And so many things are built in, you know, from SSL to slots. So definitely start there. Awesome. So one more question, and then we'll we'll wrap up if that's okay. From Kendall, Logic App Support in VS 2019, and or add Cosmos DB instead of just Azure SQL or Azure Storage when publishing. Is this something that we'll be able to do soon? Uh, I can't answer the question. It's kind of two parts. So there is uh, extensions for building Logic Apps for Visual Studio already today. So those should work. You just have their separate uh, acquisition from the Visual Studio extension gallery, uh, and then the Cosmos DB on our radar. Again, kind of give us that feedback and let people vote on it. It's simply a question of we'd like to do it. We just have to prioritize it against other asks and other work on our plate. Yeah. We did do some cool tooling in Storage Explorer, which I know you had up there. So we have first class tools now for Cosmos, and that's pretty recent. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andrew and Paul. That has been amazing. But coming up next, we have Dan Roth building amazing web apps with .NET Core. How are you doing, my friend? Pretty good. How are you doing? Good. All right, buddy. Take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Roth. I'm a program manager on the ASP.NET team, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you about building amazing web apps with .NET Core and Visual Studio 2019. Uh, Visual Studio 2019 comes with the latest version of .NET Core in the box, .NET Core 2.2. .NET Core 2.2 is loaded with a lot of great new features. 
We've done a lot of work on the templates to simplify them, clean them up. We've updated them to use Bootstrap 4. We also updated the Angular template to use Angular 6. Uh, Angular 7 uh, will be coming in the next release. We did a lot of work on Web API improvements. Uh, in particular, we uh, provide now API analyzers and conventions that make it easy to uh, generate complete Swagger documents or open API specifications for your APIs. We added HTTP2 support uh, to Kestrel, our cross-platform web server. And we also uh, enabled in-process hosting support uh, for IIS. Uh, we added a new health checks framework and also uh, a new routing framework that we call Endpoint Routing. Now, let me go ahead and show you what it looks like to do web development uh, with Visual Studio 2019 and .NET Core uh, 2.2. All right, so let's go over here to Visual Studio. I'm going to create, um, create a new ASP.NET Core web application. Uh, web application 1 sounds great. I'm going to put it in uh, my demo folder. Uh, that looks good. Let's create that. Okay, now you'll notice at the top that ASP.NET Core 2.2 is already selected. I installed 2.2 of .NET Core uh, when I uh, installed the web workload and the .NET Core workload uh, as part of the Visual Studio 2019 installation. All right, let's create a web application. That looks great. Create that, and this will go ahead and generate uh, my, my project for me. All right, so we're going to wait for the package restore just to complete, and then we'll go ahead and build and run this and see what the template looks like. There it goes. All right, there, so let's build and run it. While we're waiting for it to build and run, if we look at this template, hopefully you can see that it's uh, you know, a lot more lightweight. There's a lot fewer files in this template. We've done some work to try and slim it down, get rid of the stuff that you end up having to just delete whenever you start a new project so you can get going faster with your new applications. Here's the application up and running now. Just waiting for it to, to render. There it is. Uh, and you can see now the, the new templates in ASP, ASP.NET Core 2.2, they're a lot cleaner, a lot simpler, a lot fresher looking. Um, and this is all based on Bootstrap 4. If we go looking at the layout for this application, we should see Bootstrap 4 in here. And there it is. Bootstrap 4 is uh, wired up by default. This application is also using IS Express uh, to, to, um, to host the application. Let's do something real quick. Let's go into the home page of the app. And what I'm going to do, let's add a header here, and let's uh, print out the name of the current process that the app is running in. So, uh, diagnostics process, get current process, and then the process name. There we go. So, let's just save that. And then I'll refresh the home page of the application. We should now see the uh, the process that the app is running in. And it's running in the IIS Express process. This is different than earlier versions of .NET Core and ASP.NET Core. In earlier ver versions, your app would run in a .NET EXE process, and then IIS would proxy requests to your application. And that had a number of issues. Um, it had a performance hit, and it also made, if anything went wrong with your .NET uh, EXE process, then it was hard to diagnose what happened there. Uh, in starting in .NET Core 2.2, you can now host your ASP.NET Core apps directly in the IIS process. Much better performance, much easier to debug and diagnose issues. So that's great. All right, let's go back to the app. Instead of running this app in IIS Express, let's, let's now flip it to just be a standalone application, basically a console app uh, hosting an ASP.NET Core application. Uh, and let's go ahead and run that. Uh, and now we should see the, the process should change because we're no longer using IIS at all. So we would expect to be back to just running in a normal .NET EXE process, and we are. Great. Let's pop up the, uh, the, the browser uh, dev tools and look at the network trace as we refresh the application. There's all the files that are being downloaded. Notice that all these files by default are being downloaded over HTTP 1.1. Uh, but we, in .NET Core 2.2, we've added support for HTTP 2 to Kestrel. Uh, it's not on by default. You have to enable it, but it's really easy to do. Let's go ahead and do that. I've got a little code snippet here in Notepad. I'm just going to copy out. Let's grab that and then go back to the application. We'll stop it and then uh, update our, uh, where we're building up the, the web host. So let's go ahead and add a little bit of code here to configure Kestrel. And I think we need a namespace. Yes, we do. Great. So here you can see we're now enabling both HTTP 1 and HTTP 2 protocols. We're uh, setting up HTTPS so that we can do uh, negotiation to, uh, with the browser to set up HTTP 2. All right, let's, let's now rerun this application. Running on Kestrel. 
and see if we see any difference. Okay, we're back in the browser, still running on .NET. Let's look at the browser dev tools and refresh the application. And voila, instead of HTTP 1.1, you now see the protocol is H2, which is short for HTTP 2. And this is great because it means we can take advantage of features like connection reuse, uh, compressed headers, and all the optimizations that come with using the HTTP 2 protocol. Cool. All right. What about Web API development with .NET Core 2.2? Uh, let's go ahead and close the browser and close this app. And let's open up a different project. Uh, I was working earlier on uh, an API, my, my pet's API, one of my favorites, a, favorite APIs to work on. Uh, this is an API intended to manage a list of pets. that You can add pets, get the, uh, the full list of pets, and so forth. Simple CRUD operations. Uh, let's, uh, I already started a little bit here. I defined my model type. Here's my pet class. It has an ID and a name. Okay, now I want to create an API controller uh, based off of this model. So I'm going to use Visual Studio to help me do that. Let's add a new controller. All right, I'm going to create an API controller with actions using Entity Framework. So Entity Framework will be used to actually store the pet data. Let's add that. For the model class, let's use pet. I already have a, a, a data context class that I'll just reuse. And for the controller class name, pets controller sounds great. So we'll go ahead and generate that. Now Visual Studio is going to take care of generating for me an entire API controller class with action methods that uh, match all the standard CRUD, CRUD uh, actions like get, post, put, and delete. Uh, and all the um, code for interacting with Entity Framework Core is already done for me. So that's great. So I've got my API uh, all set to go here. Now I've also already gone into this project and enabled uh, Swagger generation or um, Open API Spec generation, which is sort of the, the newer name. Uh, to do that, I use a great um, uh, open source community project called Swashbuckle. You can see here that I've got the Swashbuckle package added to this application already, swashbuckle.asp.net core. And then if you go into startup, you can see that I've already wired it up, uh, added the Swagger generation um, uh, services, and then down below in my configure method, added the endpoints for uh, generating the Swagger document and exposing the Swagger UI. So I should be able to now just run this application and see uh, the default Swagger UI uh, sh uh, showing me the, um, my, my new API resource. Let's see if that works. OK, great. We're at the Swagger UI, and there's my pets API. Awesome. And there's the default values uh, API that just comes with the, the template. And if we look through this, we, we see all the things we expect. We can get the list of pets. We can post new pets. Uh, we can get individual pets, delete them, and so forth. All right. Now, but something doesn't look quite uh, satisfactory, quite complete. Like if we look at, say, the uh, post action, uh, in the responses section, it says that this thing basically always returns 200 OK. I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Like there might be you know, errors, uh, validation errors, or um, and I'm pretty sure it's like normally in response to a post, you would say, well, a resource has been recreated. You've posted a new resource, uh, 201 created. Here's the URL to the new resource. Uh, but that's not here. That's not missing. Is it in the code? Well, let's go look at uh, our pets controller again and look for the post action. Where is it? So there's put. Yeah, here's post. And yeah, there's a, uh, the, the returned value is a created at action, um, uh, action result, which, uh, yeah, it says it returns a 201. That's not documented in the Swagger document. Why is that? Well, there's only so much that libraries like Swashbuckle can do by just uh, uh, statically analyzing your APIs to figure out what the Swagger do uh, document should be, what the open API spec should say. Uh, some things you have to uh, tell Swashbuckle uh, about using attributes and additional metadata. And this is one of those cases. Uh, fortunately, in .NET Core 2.2, we give you an analyzer, an API analyzer. We can see it in the analyzer section. There it is. I've got it already uh, added to this project. Uh, that will look at your API controller and tell you about all the places where you probably should add some additional metadata. In fact, you can see I'm already getting a green squiggle here for my post action uh, with a, a potential fix up. If I go ahead and do the fix up, I get the attributes that I would expect saying that this action, by the way, uh, returns a 201 uh, created. So if we rerun this application now, hopefully our post action in the Swagger document uh, should look a little bit more descriptive. Let's see if that's the case. Post. And yes, all right, so now it says that it returns a 201, which is awesome. Also, it has uh, like a default response, 
which would be like in response to errors. And the nice thing here is in that in uh, ASP.NET Core 2.2, we added support for problem details, which is a, a standardized RFC. I think it's RFC uh, 7807. There it is. Um, for um, generating machine readable error responses. So that's already uh, configured for you and set up for, uh, for your API controller. Awesome. All right. So that looks good. Um, but it would be kind of tedious to go through and add all these attributes to all my actions. Uh, is there a better way? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, instead of adding the attributes to each and every one of your actions, you can instead apply an API convention, which looks at the patterns that your uh, methods match and applies metadata accordingly. And we give you a set of uh, API conventions out of the box that match the um, API conventions that we generate in our scaffolded code. And so you apply those, you just use the API convention type attribute. There it is. There it was. There it is. And then uh, the default uh, API conventions that we provide are this de de default API conventions type. All right, cool. Let me save that. Actually, let me copy, uh, comment that out. And then down below, if we look in the errors list, see the uh, API analyzer is telling me about all the different action methods that are missing, you know, metadata about the response types. If I now uncomment the convention and again look at the error list, poof. They've all gone away. Everything has been fixed up for me. If I now run the application one more time, hopefully our Swagger, uh, uh, Swagger, Swagger document is much more descriptive. Let's see. So uh, like the get that uh, takes an ID, uh, that you would expect to return 200 OK if it succeeded. Yeah. 404 if the ID is not found. Yep. And then the default for errors and so forth. So great. Now we have a really complete uh, open API uh, specification. All right. Cool. So that's you know, some of the new features that are in .NET Core 2.2 um, you know, used within Visual Studio 2019. Uh, there are also a bunch of really great uh, Razor tooling improvements in Visual Studio 2019. Razor is the format that we use to generate uh, HTML dynamically using a combination of HTML and C Sharp. Uh, so, uh, some of the improvements that we've added for Razor in uh, Visual Studio 2019 is support for find all references, uh, modern completions, and of course, live share. So let's go take a look at that. All right, back to Visual Studio 2019. Let's open up a different project. This is just an ASP.NET Core web app, um, but I've done a little bit more to this application. Here, I wanted to generate some pages uh, for managing products. So I've defined a product model type. It has an ID, a name, and a price. And then I went and uh, scaffolded a bunch of Razor pages this time, some UI, not, a, not an API controller, but some, uh, some Razor pages. And the way I did that, uh, I already, I've already done it, but you, you can do it yourself too. Just add Razor page and then Razor pages using Entity Framework. Uh, that's the one we want. Add that. And then here I specified my product type for the model. I used my existing data context class and then accepted all the defaults and clicked Add. And after I did that, it went ahead and generated all of these nice Razor pages for me, which is great. OK, so let's go ahead and run this app. Let's see what it's got. So let's see. We should see our normal default template that we saw before with a nice Bootstrap 4 based clean UI, and then hopefully some pages for looking at products. And we've got, so we've got a product tab up here that I added. And let's see. Yeah, so we've got a list of products. So what do we got? We got a Razor. Uh, we've got a Blazor. Blazor is, of course, free because you know, it doesn't cost any code to, uh, to, to write C Sharp. Uh, and then ASPnet, an ASPnet. I assume that's some sort of net for catching uh, poisonous snakes or something like that. I can almost hear the groans coming through the, uh, through the camera. Uh, yeah, so we've got a list of, um, of products here. We can edit things, like if we wanted to go in here and actually put, you know, make this ASPnet core and make that free as well. That all looks good. So we, you can edit, you can delete, you can list the products. Awesome. All right, well, let's go look at the, the Razor files and see what Visual Studio 2019 can do for us. Uh, let's see. Let's first look at, uh, let's look at find all references. Okay, so I'm looking at the product type. And you can see through code lens that it's telling me all the places where the product type is being used. And you know, if I just look at the type, it shows up in all these C sharp files. These are all the code behind files for the uh, Razor pages. That's the way Final References has always supported that. That's 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 normal and expected. But what's really cool now is that if I looked at look at one of the members for my product type, 
And let's uh, expand that a little bit so we can see it better. Now we can see all the places where that, uh, that member is being used in razor files. Like here's the exact line where that, uh, that property is being used. So find all references now works with, with razor, which is great. Uh, what else? So if let's go into the index page for this application. Uh, let's say we wanted to add a directive, like let's add an inject directive for like injecting a service into this page. I start typing at in. I of course get uh, completions over um, razor directives and all the C sharp stuff. Um, but the nice thing is because we're in Visual Studio 2019. Oh, sorry, let me. Let me start that again. Because we're in Visual Studio 2019, uh, we are using the new modern completions infrastructure. So I can actually filter the completions by just the razor directives. You see that? It says razor directives on that button. And so I get just razor directives when I type that. Okay. Uh, and let's, let's go back to the at, at, in, and filter the razor directives. And then we can complete it. Awesome. And then you could type your type here and so forth. So that's modern completions with Razor. Lastly, um, what if you need some help with your, uh, your ASP.NET Core project and you're working with you know, Razor pages or views and you want help from your buddy? Uh, well, you can do that using Live Share now. So I'm going to go ahead and set up a Live Share ses session uh, for this Visual Studio instance. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, and this should then copy a URL to the clipboard. Yep, there it did that I can now uh, share with my buddy who can help me out. Now, to emulate my, my buddy, I'm just going to open up another Visual Studio 2019 instance. And let's join that live share session. All right, so we're just going to do file, uh, join live share session, uh, paste that URL in there, and join it. OK, while it's joining, I'm just going to put these two Visual Studio instances side by side. All right, so we got nothing yet. Oh, it says that, uh, that I joined the live share, share session remotely from you know, whatever part of the world. OK, I can see some of the solution now showing up. And there's the Razor file. And in fact, it even shows where my cursor is at. And now I can go ahead and start writing just normal Razor code. Like, let me help you out there, Dan. Uh, you wanted to display the current time here, no problem. The current date is at date. And I get uh, C sharp completions in Razor running in Live Share. Dot now, yep, more C sharp completions works awesome. Okay, now, and if I look at what's actually on disk uh, in this guest Visual Studio instance, in this, this that's joined the, the Live Share session, let's open the containing folder. You'll see that you know I've got like nothing here like this. All I've got is this uh, you know pretty much empty project and the files that I have uh, that's, that have been shared with me so far that I've been editing. So I can. Uh, write uh, Razor code, get C-sharp completions for a uh, remote ASP.NET ASP Core project that's using Razor. That's pretty cool. So that's live share. Uh, let's go ahead and leave the session and shut that down. There we go. Okay, so there's some of your new Razor tooling features in Visual Studio 2019. All right, let's look to the future now when we can write client-side web applications using .NET instead of JavaScript. We have been working to make it possible for you to, uh, to write reusable web UI components using C Sharp and Razor that can run directly in the browser. And this is great because it enables you to share .NET code both on the server and on the client. You can have shared common logic. If you still want to call in JavaScript, you can do that too. You can call into existing JavaScript libraries, uh, browser uh, APIs using a JavaScript interop. Uh, and for the initially, we will support two hosting models for these kinds of applications. Uh, we will support hosting these apps on a server where all of the UI interactions with the browser get handled over a SignalR connection. Or we will also support uh, uh, hosting these applications client-side in the browser on top of WebAssembly. Now, what is WebAssembly? Well, WebAssembly is a relatively new open web standard uh, that defines a bytecode for the web. Uh, and what this means is that as long as, if you have some code, as long as you can compile it to WebAssembly, it can now run in any browser at near native speed. This is awesome because it means now when you want to write web, client-side web logic, you can pretty much do it in whatever language or framework you want. And of course, we want .NET to run great on WebAssembly. So we've been working on that for a while with this project that we call Blazor. Now, what is Blazor? Well, Blazor 
you can either run a Blazor app directly in the browser on WebAssembly, writing components, getting rich interactive UI. Or alternatively, you can write a Blazor app, same components, and host it server side in ASP.NET Core and handle all of the UI interactions with the browser over a SignalR connection. Now, initially, we will support the server side hosting model for .NET Core 3.0. Later in the future, as soon as the WebAssembly.NET runtime is ready, uh, we will ship support for client-side Blazor at some future point. Let me show you what it's like to do Blazor development with Visual Studio 2019. Okay, now these are actually you know, brand new bits, hot off the press. I'm actually going to shift over to a, a developer build of Visual Studio with some, some, some updates, and I'm using .NET Core uh, 3.0 on this machine. Now, initially, what I've got here is a server-side Blazor application. Uh, it has a number of components that are implemented using these .razor files. Let's just run the app so we can see what it looks like. All right, so I'll compile and get, this, get, it, get it running. And it actually, this app actually starts up pretty fast, and it has some nice functionality. You can click a counter, and the counter goes up. You have a fetch data page that's retrieving some, uh, some data and then rendering a table. And then we have sort of a blank to-dos page. Um, now, normally, to get this type of behavior where you have interactivity, where I click a button and the UI just updates without a page refresh, normally you'd have to do that uh, using JavaScript. But I didn't write any JavaScript to write this application. It was all implemented in C Sharp and Razor. Here's the counter component. It has a page directive at the top to say that this is a routable component, then some normal HTML markup. We use some Razor syntax to write out the current count. Then we have a button with an on-click handler. Normally, this would be JavaScript, but we're using Razor syntax to say, no, I want to run some C-sharp code here. Here's the method that we're going to call every single time that button is clicked. Let's actually run this in the debugger. Get the app up and running again. And then we'll go ahead and set a breakpoint on the increment count method. All right, counter, we click the button, and boom, we're hitting C sharp code. All right, so that's super cool. Let's go ahead and let this run through. How is this working? Well, if we look at the, uh, the, uh, the browser developer tools, let's refresh this. You can see this app's actually pretty lightweight. It's only got a few hundred kilobytes of downloaded payload, but there is a WebSocket connection that gets set up with the server. Every time I click this button, we hit our breakpoint again. Let's go ahead and uncheck that and, and let it flow through. You can see that bytes are flying along that WebSocket connection, talking to the server, running your components, and then the UI updates get, get sent back. That is the server-side Blazor model. Now, in the future, we also want to support running those same components client-side in the browser on WebAssembly. And let me show you that. So I've got a different project here. This is Blazor on WebAssembly. All right, let's go ahead and get this guy up and running. Now, the code looks exactly the same. We've got a counter component with the same code that you saw before, same component model, but hosted in a different way. All right, so here the behavior looks the same. We have a counter, we have a fetch data page. It's at, in this case, it's actually fetching us some JSON data from the server, deserializing it in the browser and rendering this table. If we look at the uh, network trace for, for this application, uh, it's pulling down a little bit more stuff, but some really cool stuff. If we looked in here, where is it? So, mono, this guy, mono.wasm, that is a full .NET runtime implemented in WebAssembly. And then below, you have normal .NET DLLs being downloaded and executed directly in the browser. To, show, to really prove to you that this is actually .NET code running in the browser, let's do this. I'm going to uh, do some debugging. Let's, now, this debugging is going to happen actually directly in the browser with the browser dev tools. To do that, I need to enable remote debugging with the browser. So let me just copy this command. Oop, not that. Copy that. Good. And then we'll close all the browser tabs real quick. And then we'll restart the browser with remote debugging enabled. And then we'll fire up the debugger again and see if we can debug our C sharp code that's executing client side. Okay, there we go. So here's the browser dev tools. Let me put this side by side with the browser. All right. Now you'll notice I can see the DLLs in the sources for this application. I can expand the client DLL and see my counter component. I can even set a breakpoint on the counter, click the button, and there we just hit a breakpoint in C sharp code running on a WebAssembly based .NET runtime executing directly in the browser. This is something that we expect to ship uh, in the future. All right, so that is Blazor in Visual Studio 2019.
Cool. I hope you enjoyed learning about web development with the latest version of Visual Studio. Uh, please download the bits and try it out. Fantastic. Are we ready for questions? Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. So, by the way, your questions are super important. So, get them in. Use the hashtag VS2019. We'll get them on the board and we'll make sure to ask them. If your question gets asked during the show, you will win an answer to the question. <laughs> hopefully. Well, hopefully. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> we'll do our best. Hopefully. Hopefully. All right. So, here is uh, Aniket. I think I got the answer right. Talk about new CS Proj file. Is there a new CS Proj file or is it the same as old? I mean, well, there, there is a, a, a sort of a newer flavor of CS Proj that we use in, in .NET Core applications that is much, you know, much lighter weight. Like, there's not much going on in, those, in the CS Proj files that uh, are, are, were in the applications that I created. Um, you don't have to list every single file that's, that's in the project. You, uh, you get to use package references directly in the CS Proj. Um, yeah, there's a, uh, we've done a lot of work to try and make CS Proj you know, cleaner, lighter weight, easier to use. Fantastic. From Cal, when do you recommend to use Razor Pages versus MVC? I, I feel like that question, maybe you can help <laughs> They're clarify. both great. They're both awesome technologies. So Razor Pages was introduced later, and it's actually built on top of MVC. It's kind of a, a non-question, because if you're using Razor Pages, you are using MVC. Every Razor Page is actually running on top of the MVC infrastructure. Razor Pages is kind of nice because it's a page-based model. If you, just, if you want a page, you just create a page, and then that, the, the route for that, uh, that page is just the place of that page on the, 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 the directory, on the, on the, the folder structure. Uh, MVC gives you a little bit more, I would say, uh, decoupling uh, in terms of how your project is structured, where your views are over here and your controllers is over, over there. A lot of people really like that, that model. But both are great, both are testable, both can scale to large applications. Uh, I think Razor Pages is probably an easier place to start. If you haven't done any development with MVC before or ASP.NET Core, I would probably start out with Razor Pages. It's basically do whatever makes you happy. That's true. And whatever you would like to maintain. I think you'll be happy with either of them. Yeah, yeah whatever you'd like to maintain. All right, so from Remy, Swagger looks great, but is there a way to automatically create model classes based on Swagger endpoint, just like the old good one, add service reference? Yeah. Just asking because I'm pretty sure it's possible in VS 2019. So there is, um, there is some support for code generation in Visual Studio 2019 for doing uh, client code generation based on an open API spec or a Swagger document. We're actually working on a, a major turn of the crank on that infrastructure for the .NET Core 3.0 wave, where we will have really great support uh, for doing um, you know, MS build-based code generation from your API. So it'll be really easy to, on every build, we'll generate the code, it'll always be up to date. Um, we're actually working with a bunch of really good community projects on that as well. The uh, NSwag has some functionality that we're leveraging for this feature. Um, yeah, there's stuff that's the stuff that's coming. Awesome. Next question: Is Blazor now officially in more than just the nice to have, maybe in a pre-alpha mode? <laughs> I air quoted that for you yeah, as he was yeah. watching, and fully supported in the new VS version. So Blazor um, started out as an experimental project, right? We were trying, playing around with WebAssembly. Could, could we get .NET to work on WebAssembly? Is that even possible? We weren't even sure if people wanted it. We've been doing that experiment now for a little over a year. We're pretty much at the tail end of that experiment where we're pretty sure that A, yes, absolutely, we can do this, and B, a lot of people tell us that they really would like it. Um, it's still technically experimental right now, but I can sort of see the, the end in sight soon for the, for the experimental phase of Blazor. Um, the model of taking the same components and running them server-side, where you manage all the UI interactions over a SignalR connection, we call that server-side Blazor. Um, that is shipping in .NET Core 3.0, absolutely. Like, like when .NET Core 3.0 ships, uh, you can use that in production. That will probably come first. And then as soon as the WebAssembly-based .NET runtime is, is ready, we will then have uh, production-ready support for client-side Blazor running in the browser on WebAssembly. I, I was there at NDC Oslo when Sanderson was like, hey, do you want to see some code I wrote? <laughs> Just a demo, just a little demo I did over the, over the was, weekend. He was P-invoking into JavaScript files because that's what you would do <laughs> with Blazor, right? I mean, I was like, that's, uh, oh, my goodness. Yes, that's what it would be. And I, all I know is it was uh, Fowler and Edwards, we were all just sitting there like this. What did, what is this? <laughs> and so it's pretty cool that it's advanced all the way to where I'm seeing a lot of people uptaking this. Pretty exciting, I think. Yeah, we're, we're excited about it. Having speak, sp speaking of that, having spoken of, my English is terrible today. Ala, what is the expected arrival date for Blazor on the client? Well, we don't have 
officially publicly announced release date. I can tell you that the client Blazor support won't be available with .NET Core 3.0. Like we'll ship .NET Core 3.0 first, and then Blazor client side I expect will come sometime later. Uh, how soon later is what we're actually really actively working on right now. Like it really depends on how fast can we stabilize and mature the WebAssembly story for .NET all up. Um, stay tuned for that. Like, hopefully, we'll have answers to that question that are more concrete uh, in the, the near future. Fantastic. Just two more questions. Will there be interop between WebAssembly and JavaScript to allow for continuous delivery replacement of application functionality? So you can. To, to, uh, there's probably two questions in there. You can, of course, call into JavaScript from WebAssembly. That that works. You can call from .NET code into any JavaScript library, any browser API. In fact, you can even take those libraries written in JavaScript and sort of shrink wrap them in a .NET API wrapper, ship them as a NuGet package, and now anyone can call that library as if it was written in C Sharp and .NET. Um, there seemed to be some hint in that question that they also wanted to be able to sort of like dynamically update parts of the app. Um, that is uh, um, like a, more like a hot module reload kind of yep. semantic. That is something that we have been talking about and, and looking at potential solutions. Uh, nothing really concrete to share on that yet, though. Awesome. Well, we're going to finish with that. Thanks so much, Dan, for spending some time with us. We have over here, Michaela, how are you, my friend? Pretty good, thanks. How are Fantastic. you? Fantastic. We're doing a tour of Visual Studio for Mac for .NET development. Why don't you take mm -hmm. it away? Great. Um, so, hi, my name is Michaela. I am an engineer working on Visual Studio for Mac and the Xamarin platform based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. So today, I'm going to start off by giving you um, a quick introduction to what VS for Mac is. Um, I know a lot of you out there are using it, but some of you aren't, so I'll make sure we're all on the same page there. Um, I'll give you a quick retrospective of, of, of how we got here, um, and then I'll show then I'll show it in action so you can see all of the shiny new features and a little peek at, at, at what's coming up in the future. So Visual Studio for Mac is a .NET IDE for the Mac. It aims to provide a native experience. So if you're a Mac user, you expect your Mac apps to feel like Mac apps, and that's, that's our goal. It enables you to develop apps and games for iOS, for Android, and for web. And it's built on the same foundations as Visual Studio for Windows. So it's built on Roslyn. That's where it gets the IntelliSense and code analyzes and fixes, all the same ones you have access to on Windows. It uses MS Build as the build system, NuGet for package management, um, and various other pieces of the Visual Studio platform, and it's all built on .NET. And on, t on top of that, um, this um, it provides support for mobile via Z Xamarin Android, Xamarin iOS, and Xamarin Forms. Uh, with .NET Core, you can do ASP.NET um, Core for web. Um, you can containerize those with Docker, and you can also do uh, so serverless with Azure Functions. And if you're doing games with Unity, um, it also has integrated support for de debugging those um, and all of the Unity-specific code completion and that kind of thing. But I'm not going to be talking so much about the individual scenarios today. I know you've heard a about a lot of those earlier. If you missed those, those are recorded. You, you can go back and see them. Um, I will be focusing on VS for Mac itself. So we launched it almost, um, almost two years ago in June of 2017. And that initial release had support for all of these core scenarios that I described. Um, including all of the C-sharp Intel IntelliSense and refactoring and debugging that you would expect for those. Um, a couple months later, we added support for .NET Core 2 when that released. Um, in October, we added uh, Docker support so you could con containerize your apps and deploy them to Azure. We then overhauled the iOS signing experience, making that much smoother so you no longer had to manually provision your devices and, um, and so on. Um, in 7.4, uh, 
Uh, we made some upgrades to C Sharp in Telesense, full support for C Sharp 7.1. Um, and we made the iOS deployment and debugging experience it's much easier because you can now do that wirelessly over Wi-Fi. So if you wanted to have um, a headset or, an, or an, an accessory plugged in, um, for example, you could now do that while you were debugging. Um, 7.5 in May of, May of last year was a very big release in that we added ed editor config support. So you could share your settings um, of, about how things should be formatted and so on. Um, across your team and also across Mac and Windows. So your whole team could have consistent style settings. Um, we also ported the Razor and uh, TypeScript and JavaScript and uh, those in Intel, IntelSense experiences from Windows, the exact same um, code. In 7.6, we added support for publishing Azure Functions for, ser for serverless support. In 7.7, we made it much easier to discover the availability of quick fixes and refactorings via the light bulb. And that brings us to 7.8, the, the um, last of the 7 series, which was mostly focused on performance and re re reliability. Though over the whole 7x uh, lifecycle, we have um, we have made uh, major perfor performance and reliability improvements in every release because we've heard that those are, are very important to, to everyone. So that brings us to today. We are releasing version 8.0, which is Visual Studio 2019 for Mac. And so I'm just going to go straight into a demo. So here I have um, the smart hotel sample um, that some of you may have seen from uh, GitHub. And if we go over to, um, so the way this is, tr is structured is that we have a client app which is written in j JavaScript. Um, and then the backend app uh, of the web app is all written in, in .NET Core 2 C Sharp. And uh, if we go into the client app, you can actually um, see uh, down here in the source files, you can see we have uh, JavaScript files, and you have all of the in in IntelliSense that you would expect there. And we have um, some uh, SAS uh, styles here. And again, there's, um, there's full IntelliSense for those two. And if we run this app, it's going to open up the website um, it built. And it's going to open up in, in the, the browser here. So it takes a second to load. And once it's loaded, you can see the website here. Now there's this, this, li this little area here um, is actually pulling these, these t t testimonial tweets from a backend service that's written in C Sharp. So I'm just going to go and take a look at that. And, that, and so I open the, glo the global search with command period. That is the quickest way to get to any file. You just have to type a, a, a part of the class name or a part of the file name. You can use camel case casing. Um, I definitely recommend using that for jumping around between files and classes. So I'm going to open the positive tweet service. And this is where that tweet comes from. So if I place a breakpoint in here and go back to the web browser and refresh it, you will see that it hits, it hits the breakpoint as expected. But this currently just has one single hard-coded um, tweet in there. So what I want to do is make it a little, is to have a little more variety so it's not all, always showing the same thing. But first, I'd actually like to show you the editor config support, because this is super neat. It makes it really easy to, 
to uh, keep your code consistent. So um, as you can see here, um, this is being assigned to a var. Um, but some people don't, don't like var. They think it, it makes the code hard, harder to read. Um, I disagree with them. But if I have someone on that team, and, I, and if, if the person on that team is setting the style, for example, they might go into edge to config. And we can see here that it, is, it has a setting to um, use var for built-in for built types. And when the type is apparent and elsewhere, it's, this is set that var should be used in all those cases. But um, I'm going to change this so that instead it's going to use, it's not going to, it, it, it says that var should not be used. And this is going to be a warning. And when I save this and go back to that file, I just make a slight, just touch the file so it reanalyzes. You can see here that there's now a, a squiggle on this that, tell, that tells you that we should be using an explicit type instead of var. So I'm going to just, um, and you can also see the light bulb here. The light bulb here makes it easy to uh, see when these things are, are available. And I'm going to just. Uh, or you can access that via Alt Enter, which is uh, my favorite, my favorite keyboard shortcut. It makes a lot of things very easy, and just hit Enter, and it changes that to um, the ex explicit type. So there's a whole load of these of uh, of, of these analyzers and fixes, and you can find them very e very easily through this uh, light bulb. Um, I'm just going to go and change that back because I think var is great and. I want people to use it everywhere. So we go back here, um, touch, the file, touch the file again, and you can see that now it's suggesting that the name can be simplified, and we have the reverse transformation there. Um, and as you could see in the, uh, in the edge to config file, there's a huge number of settings that control all of the analyzers, and these are supported across both Windows and, and and Mac. But yeah, so I'm going to go and uh, ran randomize our tweets a, li a little more. So um, here's a snippet I created earlier. And I'm also going um, to add some sample tweets here. Um, because it's not a real uh, hotel, I asked our PM team to give us to give to give to give me some tweets, and so these are their real Twitter handles. Uh, you can follow their, them all and tell them how much you like VS for Mac or or things you don't like, things you'd like us to add. Um, so check out check out their 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 Twitters. So here we have our tweets, and so we're just going to get random, and we're going to return testimonials of get random. OK. Um, and also, this is a local function here. Um, oh, one second. OK, so var testimonial. And then I'm going to use the uh, quick fix to deconstruct that. And you can see that um, because these aren't actually being used yet, they're, they're grayed out. But I'll be using them in just a second. So now I'm going to just return a new customer testimonial, where the customer name is handle and text. Text is the tweet. There we go. And I use a, a local function here, but you you can you can actually see um, one one of the new Ro Roslyn three fixes to convert that to a method, um, and we could also say convert that to a block body if you prefer that. Okay, so we have this here. Um, Going to go and build that with Command K and run it. 
There we go. And it's running. And here we can see we actually don't have any tweets at all. So um, something must have got wrong, gone wrong. It's um, trying to asynchronously load that. We have a little animation there. So let's let's go back and see what happened. So um, I'm going to set a breakpoint in there and run this again. Here we go. And when I step over doesn't go anywhere. So let me just add a quick exception catch point that'll break on every exception and repeat that. There we go. It's an argument out of range exception on get item. So I didn't actually limit the range of my random numbers. So let's go in here. And I'm going to just stop this. And get random. Next is actually going to limit that to to the um, length of the list. Oh, but that was static. So let's just make this. Let's make this not static. So it can access that now. And you can see also here we get, we get, we're getting some hints that we could make this read-only. Make sure we don't accidentally re remove it or something. I'm going to run this. Just remove the breakpoint so we don't hit that again. Reload this. Oh, one second. Oh, I had my catch point still in place, so let's just delete that and continue. And it's loading. Just takes a second while it starts up the server. Um, there we go. And so now we have a, ran a random tweet here. And if we refresh it, we'll get a different one, hopefully, unless the random number gen ge generated decides to return the same value. Yep, so now we've uh, got something a little more believable. It's not just the same, the same tweet over and over again. So that's an example of, e of editing and debugging a .NET Core app with a JavaScript and TypeScript, uh, a J JavaScript and CSS front end. But there's, um, and so this is, this is largely stuff that you've been able to do for a while, with the exception of the Roslyn 3.0 fixes. Um, um, as I said, we've been focused a lot on performance and reliability. But there is one um, very exciting new feature that I want to, to show you. Um, actually, there's a, few, there's a few of them. So one of them here is you can right click on the app and do new instance. And this is something that we've heard people have been asking for quite a while because they they want to open uh, multiple solutions at once. So that is new in 2019. And now you can see our new welcome window. Um, so this makes it much easier to get straight to your code. You have your, re your recent solutions, your um, open and new. And this is very, sim very similar to the experience on, on a Windows now. I'm going to just open up this clients app, which is part of this whole smart hotel um, thing. So this is the iOS and Android front ends um, for the for the smart hotel um, sample. And you can see here we have the Android and iOS um, pr pr projects here, and these are all um, these have all of the pieces you'd expect the um, pl platform specific renderers. Um, but I'm not going to go into details of those things now. Uh, the thing that I would like to show you is our new c -sharp editing experience, which I'm really excited about. This is currently in preview. 
So if you want to use it, um, you're going to have to go into the preferences, and you can find it here in preferences, text editor, general. And you can go and turn on support for opening C sharp files in the new editor. And you can see here one of the new features we have word we have word wrap now. I'm going to just go and open a file so I can show you a few things. Let's just open this file here. So here we have a file, and you can see here it is the new editor preview. So just a reminder there that you're using the preview, and you can always go and turn it back off if it causes issues. So it looks very similar, but uh, let me show you a few things that, that are new in this. So if I uh, open in Telsense, you can see that, that it looks a bit different. Um, and this is, it looks different because this is now fully native using the native macOS APIs. So it behaves more, more natively. So here it's actually using um, the pink color that I have set as my highlight color in macOS. So it's more, a more consistent part of the, of the platform. You can see the tooltips here um, have that, li th that little um, soft, semi-transparent, blurred background you see on Mac a lot. And this also means that uh, performance is much improved because we're not going through abstraction layers. Um, so this in enables us to take advantage of some of the G GPU accelerated hardware compositing and so on. Another one of my uh, fa favorite features uh, here is that we now have um, integrated support for the all of the macOS in input methods. So I can do um, control command period to open up the macOS emoji. And then I can search for an emoji. And I can enter that. So full support for emojis. Um, I know a lot of people will be excited by this. Um, I certainly am. We also now have, uh, we now have support for um, right to left text and uh, full bidirectional. So you can combine um, te uh, text with different directions. Um, I, I'm not personally. Uh, familiar with the input methods for inputting these. So I'm just going to copy um, the name of a poet here. So you can see this now as it, this, this behaves as right, to, as right to left text would behave. So this new editor is built on the same core as the Windows Visual Studio editor. So this means that a lot of the little nuances of b behavior will now be the same as Windows rather than slightly different. Um, this will also en enable us to bring more features from Windows to Mac um, more quickly. Like you can see here, the um, I always forget this shortcut, but there is, um, yes. Um, so we have support for the multiple carrots. That is control, option, click. And you can see that you can type into a bunch of places at the same time, which is really useful in a lot of scenarios. Um, you can also see here our um, wrapping. So as I bring this in, you'll see these lines begin to wrap around. And this, lit, this little hint here that it wrapped. So this is just a taste of the things that you'll see with the new editor. Um, it's not complete yet. Um, so we would love to hear your feedback, but you can always revert to the old editor um, if you want the more polished um, experience right now. Um, this also. Um, the new editor is also going to be much more accessible. Uh, accessibility is very important 
to us. So if I open search here, for example, this is now all native widgets. So um, you get all of the built-in macOS ac accessibility support. So to summarize, Visual Studio for Mac is, is, is a very capable tool for, for your web and mobile uh, .NET development. You have IntelliSense for C Sharp, F Sharp, TypeScript, Razor, CSS, Less, SAS, HTML5. Um, you have full analyzers and refactorings and code fixes for C Sharp um, to help you uh, write code faster and to help find problems. Uh, a rich debugger across all those scenarios. Um, I didn't cover it, but we also have XUnit um, and MS test and NUnit support. We also have a Git, Git source control built in. And in 2019, we've also added um, a new backend for that, so it'll be more reliable. So new in 2019, we have the streamlined start window that you saw that helps you get to your code much, much more quickly. We have more analyzers and fixes from Roslyn. Uh, performance, lots of performance and reliability improvements. Um, that new Git backend. And we also have integrated authentication for Azure DevOps Git repositories now. Uh, major accessibility improve, improvements since, um, since 7.8 and that new editor preview that you saw. Um, I'd just like to take a, a moment aside to talk about performance and reliability a, li a little more. This is something that we've heard a lot, and it's been an ongoing focus for the team ever since our, our, our initial 7.0 release. And there have been a lot of um, impro improvements across all our releases, and it'll continue to be a focus going forwards. Um, as part of that, we've built infrastructure to help us track and identify releases uh, automatically. Um, we've also made major accessibility improve improvements across the uh, life cycle of, 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 of 7x and into, into 80 And we aim to be compliant with the Microsoft accessibility sta standards by the end of year. And we've also integrated support for reporting issues through developer community. And I'd like to thank all of you who've reported issues um, to tell us what is most important to you and what you'd like us to fix or add first, because your feedback really does help us to, to identify which things are most important to work on first. And this is available to download right now. Um, you can update via the updater if you have uh, VS for Mac installed already. So I just open up the updater um, and hit install. If you don't have it yet, uh, you can install it from aka.ms forward slash VS Mac. And we would definitely like to hear your feedback on the new editor. Just be aware it's in. It's in preview, and you can always switch back to the old one. Um, but we did it. We definitely look forward to hearing your feedback um, through developer community. And that brings us to the end of my talk. So um, it's time for questions. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, there's four questions, and we're going to go through them rapid okay. fire because you covered all of your time, which is awesome. <laughs> Will Visual Studio for Mac support live share? We do not have a time frame for that right now. It's definitely feedback we've heard a lot. Um, if you could go and upvote that on, dev on developer community, that would help us to, um, to prioritize that. Fantastic. Next question, where can I get the code samples from the event? So there's some code samples that you likely had. Where are you putting them? <laughs> So this, so the code samples I used are the uh, Smart Hotel 360 okay. uh, samples um, that you can get from the Microsoft org on GitHub. Fantastic. From Elizabeth, does VS for Mac 2019 support have support for dark mode? Yes, it does. Fantastic. Everyone loves the dark. Are you a dark mode coder? Um, it depends on the time of day. I use dark mode at night and light mode during the day. See, that's actually smart. I was sitting here thinking I need to make a choice. Um, apparently, I did not. From Jamie, what is 
your favorite new feature of the SR Mac 2019? Um, it's definitely the new editor. Um, it brings so many, so many uh, things to the table. Um, emoji support in particular. Um, I know it's still in preview, um, but I'm really looking forward to that. Um, um, I, I've been using it a lot um, myself, and I'm looking forward to that uh, being the, the default in, in, in upcoming releases. Fantastic. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Now we are going to Mr. Fritz. Are you there, my friend? Hey there. I am, Seth. Oh my gosh, it's great to see you again. It feels like it's been a couple hours. A couple of hours, and I understand you have some amazing people to talk about some of the stuff that they're doing. In oh Visual my Studios, gosh, right? yes. So I've invited a couple of Microsoft MVPs to join us so that we can talk about all the cool features that are coming in Visual Studio and how they help uh, help out their day-to-day -day processes and some of the cool new things that are coming in the preview channels as well. Awesome. Well, we're going to turn the time over to you, my friend. You know what? My, my audio cut out there on you, Seth. Oh, that's okay. I was just saying we're going to turn it over to you so that we can see all these cool things. Ah, uh, uh, now I can hear you. There we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to bring on, uh, I'm going to bring on Oren and Ginny. There they are. How's it going? Great to see you. Uh, Great to see you too. Uh, it Thanks feels for like inviting it, us. Not a problem. It feels like it was just a week or two ago. We were all together here in Redmond for MVP Summit. Uh, why don't you give folks a, a quick intro of, of who you are? Uh, I'll start with Ginny. Hey, um... I'm Jenny Cahey. I build garbage software. Yes, I really do. Uh, I'm president of Carolina Software, and we do software for the solid waste industry. So, Fair. lots and lots of it. And, and Oren? I'm a chief architect of DevOps and modern software at Insight, building modern software applications, helping companies transform digitally to the web and to modernize their apps. And uh, Oren, you have another title now, don't you? Uh, I'm a regional director at Microsoft as well. Certainly, I don't work for Microsoft, but um, certainly provide lots of feedback. And one more title that you just... Come on. Uh, I feel like I'm dry, grasping at straws here. For, with the uh, .NET Foundation. You do a little bit with uh, them. <laughs> well, it's not really for Microsoft. So, yes, uh, honored to be a part of the .NET Foundation board uh, after the recent set of elections here. Uh, congratulations. Thank you for your support. Yeah. So um, we wanted to bring in, we wanted to talk to a couple of folks that aren't Microsoft people, but we wanted to talk to you about what are the cool new things that you've seen in Visual Studio 2019. Now, uh, we've talked, and I know you're both using what's called the preview channel, that, that preview release, some of the cool things that are happening before it hits production. Um, let's start with Ginny. What have you seen in the preview channel? What are the cool things that you like that have come out as part of Visual Studio 2019? Well, the very coolest thing about Visual Studio 2019 is uh, if I changed my mind and I didn't want to use a preview, I wouldn't have to buy a new computer and throw away the old one because it uninstalls cleanly. It can run side by side with my production version of Visual Studio. And on this particular computer, which is a Surface Book, I've got uh, three instances of Visual Studio all installed. Uh, I have Visual Studio 2019 release, which I just installed today, mm -hmm. uh, preview. For 2019 and 2017, so I've got all three. They they coexist beautifully. So that's my very favorite thing. Now it, I always found that that it was consultants and contractors were the folks that had like multiple and multiple versions of Visual Studio going back to 2012, 2010. But now it's it's nice to be able to have them side by side, so that you don't, like you said, have to throw away the machine because there's so much you have to uninstall and manage. Well, it's, it's really true. In fact, I keep uh, 2015 on a totally separate PC <laughs> pretty much for that reason. Oh, my Needs gosh. Work some really old stuff. Very, very rarely, thank goodness. Yeah. Because Visual Studio 2019 is so much easier to work with the large amount of code that I have to maintain and I have been maintaining for many, many years. Uh, would you like to see what one of my solutions looks like? Oh, oh my gosh, please. See what I'm dealing with? Uh, I think I'm sharing my screen. I don't know if you can yeah, see it. Let's take a look. There's your screen. Are. So this is a production solution. Okay. And it's got rather a lot of projects in there. And, and we and purposely zoomed out. We're not looking at specific names. We no, want to no, see no. the volume Which, of them. Right. There's just, there's just lots and lots of projects. And they all 
share code because they're all related to the solid waste industry and there's some things that are similar and lots of things that are different. Well, in Visual Studio 2019, one of the things I particularly like is I can unload some of the projects that I'm not currently working with and if I want to, I can easily hide them and now I'm down to a more reasonable list of projects that I'm working on on a day-to-day -day basis. If I change my mind, again, right-click from the solution um, tab and you can see I could I could load them all. I could show the ones that are currently unloaded. But for right now, I think I like the clean, simple look of not having quite so many of them to look at. Sure. Uh, the, uh, the XAML that I'm showing here is actually part of a WPF uh, form that does hairy configuration for a real live ISV sort of oriented configuration form. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Oh my and gosh, writing, yeah. writing the code for this, it goes on and on and on and on and on too. But a lot of it gets really, really repetitive, as you might imagine. The code gets repetitive. <laughs> and I've, I've always liked IntelliSense as soon as C Sharp supported it, then when XAML supported it. But now with IntelliCode too, some of this crazy code to type it was not nearly as tedious as you might think because it was just, you know, tab, enter, tab, enter, tab, enter, next row. I mean, almost it, it could figure out what I wanted to do next. It's not that this code is brilliant. It's just that, you know, there's quite a bit of it. So I just love the way IntelliSense and, and, and now IntelliCode makes my life so much easier with this just boring repetitive stuff that you just you just have to have in a in an enterprise application of any size. Mm. So that's that's one of my top favorite things. Another one of my top favorite things is that I can work in code and see what I'm working with. You can see I like lightning. Some people hate yeah. lightning. It's fine. We can all do what we want to do. And I am using high contrast here because I need that to be able to see. Uh, maybe young people don't have that problem, but I really like it that Visual Studio is becoming more and more accessible to those of us who have special needs, which fortunately, not not too major, but, you know, it makes a difference. Certainly. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that's just, just one of the things that I'm doing. Let's see what else I got that's pretty cool here that I wanted to uh, highlight. Um well, I've, I've got this little little product, production uh, wind forms application. Okay. And uh, it's got a fair amount of code in it. None of it's very interesting to look at. I mean, it's just plain old simple wind forms application. I wouldn't want to have to rewrite it, but I want to make it future proof. And in particular, I would like to be able to take advantage of .NET Core 3 so I can bundle the ver. Uh oh, what happened? Ready to the visual designers. I just sort of just sort of closed the code, but to move it to .NET Core three, it's really pretty easy because there is a new wizard that if you do a uh, add new add new project. Yeah. One of the new project types is a .NET Core. Th Three WPF or WinForms application that's now available from the new project dialog. So I just added this Wizard Core as a sister project to my Wizard production project, and then with this little bit of magic here in CS Proj, I can reference all of the WinForms based code that I had already created in the production application. I can still use the same WinForms designer in the production application and keep these in sync because obviously I'm not going to release this code for production using .NET Core 3 until .NET Core 3 is released sometime later this year. Terrific. So that's just some of my very favorite things about Visual Studio 2019. But I'll tell you something. I'm not really sure what's new and what's not in Visual Studio 2019 because I have been working with the preview primarily for so much yes. that I, you know, I'm just not. Sh I can't. I'm. I'm used to it. This is the the new standard for me now. It has it's, been wow. Well. That preview channel is such an easy thing to get into, and having it side by side with the RTM and as those ver those bits come out, 
makes it easy to bounce back and forth if something doesn't quite work right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I, I have had to do that on on occasion. Sure. Now, uh, Oren, I know yep. you've been you've been doing a lot of stuff here around packaging and and some of the things that are going on around Windows and building applications. What what do you see in Visual Studio 2019 that really helps you out? So I really like some of the new packaging stuff because it lets me get my application to my end users because I can build anything I want, but I still have to get it distributed. Uh, can I share my screen? Absolutely. All right, let me uh, press the share button. I know when that's coming through. And there it is. All right, go ahead. Okay. So there I want to share So one thing here because .NET Core 3 works on all versions of Windows. So I can do things like take advantage of Windows 10 scenarios. Like if it's, um, I click, click it here, I have a NuGet package referencing a toast. This is just a something I will work on WPF. There's nothing Windows 10 about that. If I come back now, and I'm going to go use the add project dialog in Visual Studio, new okay. project. And first of all, I'm going to come in. There. I'm going to notice that application packaging project is right here, so I don't have to come and dig for it because it's remembering the recent project templates. You know, I love this. So the things you use frequently, uh, it remembers just right here for you. They bubble up to the top. They bubble up. And if I didn't remember, I could search for package, and there it is. There's everything to do with packages and packaging and extensions really just come here. So I'm going to select Packaging Project. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go with the default name here. It's OK. All right. And let's just say I want it to work on uh, recent versions of Windows. Uh, there's no particular reason here just to move along. But you can target what you want. And what this does here is it creates a project. Think about it like a click once project. This is new. This one, this project has been enhanced in 2019. So I can come and add a reference to my application. And this is a .NET Core 3 application, although it could be on .NET Framework. And now set it as the startup project and uh, demo gods uh, notwithstanding. This come will on. build. And what it's going to do it's going to take all of my .NET Core 3 things and put it into a self-contained package, which then can be distributed to your end users on a network share or submitted to the store if you so choose. And, um, and, and .NET Core 3 is still in preview. It's in preview. But if it's something you want to try, all these features are there to support .NET Core 3. And it, it's great to see that you're taking advantage of them. And, and yeah, you're providing value to your customers. Well, one of the things that I love, though, is that it might be in preview, but it that goes to the other feature of .NET Core 3. It's side-by-side -side and self-contained. So I'm a little sneaky person. I didn't want to wait. I have a package in the store that many folks here are probably using. Maybe NuGet Package Explorer is something you've used. Of course. Um, it's already running on .NET Core 3 because as the developer, it met my quality bar it's self-contained using these techniques here, and it's, it becomes an implementation detail. I don't have to tell anyone to install anything. It's just part of my application. Oh, that's perfect. Do, do you have Do you have the uh, uh, package explorer there? Can you show us? Sure. Show us it running yeah. on your machine. I just want to, if I click here, just yeah. to, to conclude this demo. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I get the Windows 10 notification style, and it shows up in the tray. Uh, so you can do scenarios where this is the same binary, and you can take advantage of Windows 10 features. Another, another thing that 2019 makes it easier to do. So, oh, and so it's so important to take advantage of all the features of the latest versions of Windows as they happen, and be able to also support the older versions as well. Right, so the search working. There we go. You get, I see a package. What's it doing? <laughs> Thank you, Windows. <laughs> it's it's if you're seeing what I'm seeing here. Oh, <laughs> let's do it this way. Let's find the N. Uh, there we go. 
So it's and in the store and it's self-contained .NET Core 3. Anybody can install it right now. Correct. And it's open source. So if you want to see how I've put this together with a full CI and CD pipeline that's using Azure DevOps, Azure DevOps pipelines, uh, it's all there for uh, for you to check out and borrow from. Please, that was that's part of the things I enjoy about open source uh, is learning from others. So coming back to, to the three of us, Oren, I'm assuming that all those, all those uh, uh, capabilities are read only for the public, but for your team, read write, of course. Right, the, so, the public can come through and take a look at your DevOps pipeline. Oh yes, absolutely, like, right. Yeah, so, learn from uh, it. It's, it's read only for the public. Uh, my team gets to push the approve button uh, and that's how we get on. We just put this back in. So cool. So. Um, you're both working a little bit in the preview channel right now. We've got about 15 minutes left. What what are you seeing coming in the preview channel? I know there's a couple things that, that are they they've already started in the next version, the next minor release of Visual Studio. What are you seeing in there that that's interesting that that we might want to talk about? So I can tell you my number one feature that I've been asking for for so so long, and I'm thrilled that. You, and you can see this in the Roslyn repository. It's tagged as 16.1, and fingers crossed that uh, it doesn't slip. But they're adding enhanced IntelliSense support for types that are not yet in scope. Enhanced IntelliSense support so for what types that, that aren't means, in scope. OK, I think I know what you're talking about. Go ahead. So what that means is, as I'm typing, and as we saw many of the presenters do earlier, I can put a type in there, and if I paste in something, uh, you can hit uh, control dot or you know shift dot, and it will uh, complete the using statements for you. Nice. However, okay, I'm lazy, and I don't remember all of the types I want. I want to just get that completion as I start typing. So, or whether it's camel case or uh, however the the filtering already works. I want it to give me the option for stuff that I don't have a using for, so because I don't remember the exact name. Okay. Yeah. When I tab complete that, it will put the using statement in me. So it's just bringing a dip, bringing more stuff into IntelliSense. Very cool. Yeah. It, it there's something to be said for for making us more productive and and not having to think about all those little things that the yak shaving that you need to do to get your code working. Mm -hmm. Ginny, is there anything coming up that, that you're looking forward to? Well, the main thing I'm looking forward to is the uh, Windows Forms and WPF design time experience in Visual Studio 2019 for .NET Core 3. Oh, which yeah. Is not quite there yet in the release version. So that's coming down, and uh, it'll make everything a whole lot easier for me because my plan is to move everything to .NET Core 3. Yeah, and I'll say that has been a challenge today where I am maintaining NuGet Package Explorer as .NET Core 3, but I did have to give up the XAML editor experience uh, without going through other workarounds that you know have been touched on. So I'm yeah, very much looking forward to the designers. Yeah, we've, we've seen that little bit of you can share the, a project back and forth that is .NET Framework and, and pull out some of the files so that you can make it, so you can use those designer capabilities against the .NET Framework versions of Windows Forms and WPF, and then export that content over to .NET Core 3 and continue working. That That is a workaround, but yeah, we want that final premium experience that's coming with, it's coming with Visual Studio as .NET Core 3 is ready. And it, I, I, I agree with you, Ginny. It's gonna be a tremendous, uh, tremendous update for folks that are ready to go and ready to make that step into .NET Core 3. So, when you're when you're looking at the stuff that you're working on with .NET Core three, and, and you're both working towards uh, that framework right now, is is there other than than the designers? Is there something that's significantly holding you back? I mean, Oren, gosh, you're you're already in with the NuGet Package Explorer. Jenny, is it is it just the designers holding you back, or are you already starting to step into .NET Core three with Visual Studio 2019? Well, I found a few little bugs that I've reported that are current issues. Um, one other thing I should probably mention that has been great about working with preview versions of Visual Studio, not only in 2019, but was also true in 2017, is that I get 
just almost immediate response from issues that I that I do submit through the feedback tool. So um, I've submitted some things, provided some word pros of problems that I've found. Uh, fortunately, I can fall back to say 2017 uh, to do some little things that were issues for me. So these are these are these are fit and finished things that they're coming. They're coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got rid of 2017 a couple of yeah. weeks ago as some of the release candidates were coming out. I said, you know, I have a go live license now. I don't need 2017 anymore. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. But and but I think uh, Ginny, you point out a really good point there. That the, that report a problem flag that you have at the top of Visual Studio, it doesn't just go into a bucket somewhere and nobody actually sees it. If you've got a good issue that you're reporting and you're descriptive with it, you may get contacted by the team. Well, even if you're not, uh, you get an immediate response from a bot that says, yeah, we got your feedback. Then I'll get a response. Typically, I don't understand what you're describing. Can you give us more details? Mm. So. They're very proactive about seeking for feedback, yep. uh, bug reports, I have to say that, that tool has been very helpful. I, way better than user voice. So I'm I'm one of the user voice um, not fans. But when they move the system over to this, you know, for upvoting and for tracking, it's been much better in terms of uh, responses. And if I can share a little secret here. Even amongst the MVPs, when we complain about something and they're saying, look, this isn't working, the thing that they always want us to do as well is report the problem. Mm -hmm. So it's the same channel everybody has. It's not just that, you know, hey, uh, we have a, 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 you know, we can poke the, the PM. It's we need to report the problem and it all gets triaged and managed and gets that you know, really good response. Well, they also get some additional information by using the report a problem tool. Oh, yeah. Then, then they can, can find out that, yes, I am running on skip ahead versions of Windows. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> I really do. Okay. Uh, maybe that's a scenario that isn't as widely tested as uh, production. So they have that information in their metrics. Oh, yeah. There is there is a little bit of information about your machine that comes back. It's anonymized. But we're able to see those critical things that Visual Studio depends on and how they interact with Visual Studio. It, it's, it's important that, that we get the entire picture when we triage. So, and a couple of folks here in the chat room are saying that the report button is very useful. Absolutely. Um, and uh, folks are also commenting, gosh, it's late in some of the other parts of the world that they're talking about in the chat room. That's tremendous. Thank you so much for sticking with us. So, uh, as we wrap up here, do you have any final words to folks that maybe haven't installed Visual Studio 2019 yet and are, are trying to make that decision whether they should roll it out to their business, to some of their developers? Does it, does it make sense? Is this something that they should wait on? Should they move forward with? Or can they just put it down side by side and figure out when it makes the most sense? Oh, just, just do, do it. it. Absolutely just, just do it. it. Um, we didn't steal that from a sneaker company. That's yeah, Jimmy's yeah, um, just do it. Well, you can run it. You can run it side by side, and if you have a policy in your company or other reasons that you need to use a specific version of Visual Studio for a production build, the projects and solutions are compatible. So you can work in 2019 preview channel, release channel, go back to 2017 if that's what your organization policy says at the current time. It's yeah, just a really low risk. That as well. Because Visual Studio has gotten a lot better over the past several releases about not changing your project file. So you don't have to always do a whole team upgrade all at once. Like, I just want a better code editor. Sure. And I can do that and, and take advantage of some of the preview features while the rest of my team is still, you know, either on the stable channel or on a previous real version. Right. I, if I commit that code back into GitHub, if I send it out to an Azure DevOps repository, I can share it with folks who are using 2017 and 2019 equally without any penalty. Mm -hmm. It's it's nice. It's it's uh, good compatibility like that. I think. So very cool stuff. Um, and uh, I'm I'm seeing some folks come to the door here as we we're getting right to the end of the event here and I'm, I'm hoping that my, my director chimes in here so that <laughs> I'm waiting, I'm, I'm looking at the time and seeing if we're ready to transition out here. Um, okay, 
So as you're, yeah, now I'm getting, now I'm getting the cues. There we go. <laughs> so um, you're both installing and using it. Have you started using the preview channels or are you, or are you holding back on those? Or are, you, are you still continuing to use those? Or do you have both versions installed, uh, both channels side by side? I don't have the release channel installed at all on any of my machines. <laughs> really? Living on the okay. edge. Oh, that's amazing though. That well, really I says something. Well, I do because I need the release channel for uh, previously for the Go Live license, mm. and and uh, now just sort of as a sanity check, if I encounter an issue in the in the uh, preview channel, I'll go back to the release channel and see do I have the same issue or is it something that's new and report it in that one. In fairness, Azure Pipelines has you know my release build, so I'm all my builds are being built on sanctioned blessed versions, so. Problem solved. There you go. <laughs> Problem solved. Well, thanks so much. And uh, the Sinclair Nader here in the Twitch chat room is saying, Oren, you daredevil. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's living on the bleeding edge. Oh, my gosh. But it, and it, that does. It creates a lot of product feedback that, that actually helps everybody. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, if I can find those bumps and report them back and, you know, help them get polished so that others can use the stable channel without seeing some of the, the rough bits, then I, I, I've done my job. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much to both of you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Oren, very much for joining us as part of the Visual Studio launch. We're, uh, we're gonna get ready to throw back over to Seth. Uh, so it, it was great having you here and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for having Thank us. All righty, take care. And uh, that was great. I am so glad that they were able to join us and, and talk through you know, some of those things that are going on for Visual Studio, for folks that are just testing, that are coming in and seeing the preview releases and you know, the things that are important to them. Um, I, think my, I think my buddy Seth is out there, out in the other room. I am here. Can you hear me, my friend? There he is. Hey, Seth. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Hasn't it's, this been amazing? This has been an amazing day. We've gone, we, we saw some folks from Mumbai. We saw some folks from a couple different locations in the States. You were all the way in the other room. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a little frog in my throat. You were all the way in the other room. This I, way. This way. The other room. That's pretty amazing. I, I was, yeah, just around the corner, 10 paces away. I think we ran into each other at the potato chips. I tried to avoid you, if I'm being honest. <clears throat> yeah, so there is that. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm okay. Oh, oh I'm my good. goodness. Maybe I'm not okay. All right. Oh, okay. All right. Well, this has been super fun. Let's just show some of the cool stuff that people have been doing. We have lined up a lot of things. Like, for example, this is the way, this is the way we should have been watching it, I feel like, right? The actual uh, Visual Studio Live, thanks for that, my friend. We have here, uh, just to clarify, we do, they do let us have free sodas. It's not me, but I have seen some employees bring in their buffet purse uh, for, uh, you know, for the sodas. I'm not going to say who. Golnaz, <coughs> our producer. <coughs> Here we have another one. We did this one before, but look how fancy they are in Germany. Like, I feel like we could have had a chandelier up in here, you know, but we didn't. Uh, let's go to a couple more here. Um, tech Systems gave some good food to the stpete.net meetup. Thank you. I don't know why they didn't send any here. All right, and now let's see over here. Look at this, taking DevOps to the next level with GitHub and Azure DevOps. I just love seeing people enjoying it because like I said, I started with Visual Studio a long time ago with VB6. It has been part of my career for a long time, almost 20 years. And I'm pretty young, I'm 15 years old. And so even before I was born, I was using VB6. A couple of things to take away. If you want to go to launch.visualstudio.com, all of the sessions will be up there so that you can view them and review them to learn some of the stuff that's in there. Also, uh, if you go to the Visual Studio YouTube right now, you're actually going to see some of those sessions up there right now. If you want to download it, you should go to visualstudio.com, uh, I'm sorry, visualstudio.com front slash download and get the bits today. I actually already installed them. When I did my demo, I had the RC and then you saw at the top of my demo, it had, you can download it right now and I did. I did. And so to finish up, we have coming up and this we're going to turn, this is going to be turned all over to Twitch. If you go to twitch.tv, front slash visual studio, you'll be able to be there for the after party. I might pop in there 
after I wash my face or something, because uh, Jeff doesn't like me. Jeff, are you there, my friend? We're going to be starting in just a second. Okay. Stay here on the Visual Studio channel, and uh, we'll see you in a minute. Okay. So, to finish up, thank you so much for watching the Visual Studio 2019 launch. Go to visualstudio.com front slash download and get it now. There's a lot of features in the Community Edition. If you don't have any, you can download it right now. I didn't have that. I had to pay for it a long time ago. And that's why I'm taking extra sodas to finish up. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care.